the setting Pennsylvania Pocono Mountain. The track, a unique two and a half mile triangle. The action, stock car racing. The Dominator, Dale Earnhardt, lived up to his nickname in the early season. He won three races plus the Winston. He took two poles. He built a big point lead. He seemed destined to claim another championship. Then a dramatic downturn in Dominator fortune. A crash at Charlotte. Mechanical problems at Dover and Sears Point. Drop kicked him to fourth in the standing. Rejuvenated Rusty Wallace, Winston Cup champion. Blew up a wreck three straight weeks and fell to 11th in the point. But he has come back with a vengeance. He won at Charlotte. He won again at Sears. Two wins in three races. Rusty is eager for battle today. I tell you, I feel great about this. I led both races last year, and I qualified bad, but my car's handling perfect. And whenever I got a good handling car, I always run good in the race. Methodical Morgan Shepard clicked off 11 straight top 10 finishes and led the Winston Cup points. Then he blew up last week to break that string, but Morgan looks like a championship contender, even though he hasn't won a race. For us to win, we've already been capable of winning, but uh, we've got to have our race and luck. Uh, here at Pocono, we you know, can't have the flat tires, uh, we can't have an air ring spark, uh, but our team is ready to win, whatever. Mark Martin, whose late season momentum of 89 carried right into 1990. He won at Richmond. He's been top three six times. He leads the standings, and he is confident. No question, I drive for the best sponsor, the best team on the circuit. I know we can win this race. At 180 miles an hour, the helmeted heroes of stock car racing roar into battle at Pocono. And it's only on Showtime Event Television. Live from Pocono International Raceway, Showtime Event Television presents the Miller Genuine Draft. 500. It is a perfect afternoon for stock car racing. Warm and humid here in the Pocono Mountains, and the largest stock car crowd in the history of this track is filing in, indeed jamming into this place, and scrambling to find their seats because the action is about to begin. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Despain. Welcome to a unique opportunity in stock car racing. Unique among the 29 telecasts that you'll see each year. Today, Showtime brings you the only commercial-free broadcast all 200 laps, all 500 miles, all three and a half hours of action here, commercial free. But that's not the only thing different about our telecast today. We'll have an 800 number that you can call and pose your questions about stock car racing. We'll ask our panel of experts. We'll ask the folks along pit road. If yellow flags permit, we'll even ask the drivers. We're going to do a bit of eavesdropping today. Last year, crew chief Gary Nelson was our expert analyst. Today, he's back at work along pit road with Kyle Petty. But we'll be listening in on a lot of team conversations that you've not had the opportunity to hear before. We'll also uh, snoop a little bit with our radios on NASCAR race control and find out what's going on there. And we'll have three in-car cameras each in the cars of Kyle Petty and Rusty Wallace. In all the elements to give you a spectacular show today, to help us describe that action, let's bring in the eight-year Winston Cup stock car veteran, winner of the 1988 Winston 500 at Talladega, Phil Parsons, ladies and gentlemen. And Phil, this shapes up as a great battle in the middle of a pivotal point race. Well, it really does, Dave. You have uh, different emotions going on here. You have Dale Earnhardt, who started off real fast and had incredible bad luck the last three weeks, went from leading the points back down to third. And you have Rusty Wallace, who's on the rise. He went from way back. Now he's up He's up in the in the point battle. And you have Mark Martin leading the point battle. Morgan Shepard, incredible consistency among those two drivers. And you also have Jeff Bodine, only 20 points behind Earnhardt. So it should be a real good race. And speaking of mixed emotions, let's put this guy on the spot. Ernie Irvin is on the pole in the car from which this man was released after... You must have mixed emotions about that. Well, I do, Dave, but see, if I was in that car on the pole, then I wouldn't be able to be up here with you for three and a half, four hours. <laughs> what a sacrifice. <laughs> Let's meet a couple more members of our broadcast team, and in fact, here from Ernie Irvin. We'll go to our pit reporters now, beginning with the pole-sitting driver, Pat Patterson of On Pit Road, is there with Ernie Irvin. Well, thanks very much, Dave, and good afternoon, everybody. Ernie Irvin is no stranger to the front row. Just a few weeks ago in Charlotte, North Carolina, a special consolation type of event, the Winston Open, he was on the pole there. Last week, in Sonoma, California. He sat on the outside pole, Bristol, Tennessee. He was on the pole. Today he's on the pole for this one at Pocono. 
you keep starting up here. We just got to finish one up front. I tell you, you know, that's what we're working towards. Uh, we're getting our qualifying program down real good. Um, our race program's getting awful good, too. Tony Glover, the crew chief, is, uh, you know, trying to coach me into winning a race. Um, we got the car capable. We got the crew capable. Now he's working on getting the driver capable. All right, he'll try to get capable this afternoon. Now, working alongside me on the pit road for this one today is the editor of Stock Car Racing Magazine and my partner, Dick Berger. Pat, the man starting on the outside front row today is 48-year-old Dick Trickle. He's won hundreds, maybe thousands of stock car races, never at Pocono, never in a Winston Cup car. Were he to win today, it would be the biggest victory of his career. Dick, is today the day? Well, our first win is probably going to come at the most unlikely spot, you know, in Pocono because of its indifference would be an unlikely spot. And the team started the car real good. The old Phil Six Six Shop Arctic Motor Oil Pontiac running great. And... We had a good late practice yesterday, and I believe we should be able to run with them today. It's going to be a hot afternoon. It's very steamy down here. How are the drivers going to make out with all this heat? It's a long race, almost four hours. Well, if your car is handling well so you don't have to physically and mentally work too hard, that's a big factor, how, how hard your car is driving and how well it's handling. And I don't see any problem from my end, you know, but uh, now some of the drivers may have problems with the heat today, but I think we'll be all right. This is a team sport. You will rely on your crew for pit stops. Are they as good as the others? Well, I'm going to tell you, the Kevin I and his team, uh, we're, we're a team to be reckoned with, and our pit stop has gotten better every race. You know, and, you know, I'm looking for the future, and I think the team is too. Well, he's got an extremely good shot here this afternoon. He's got a good, good car this afternoon. He's never won here. Pat Patterson right now is with another driver who's never won here, Rusty Wallace. Pat? Well, you know, Dick, he may have never won here, but I can tell you the guy knows how to get to victory lane. He's third in the Winston Cup points, as we already said. And, uh, Rusty, I know you're looking for a good run this afternoon. Well, I really am. You know, I mean, uh, this car is running great. I handled, I, I qualified bad. Uh, I really messed up, and I blame it all on myself again. But, uh, I just, I just want to get to the front and be careful doing it because I'm a long way back. And, but I think maybe if this goes like it did last year, last year I qualified 18th here, and I think 40 laps in the race I was leading it. So we'll see what happens. You always like sliding the car around a little bit, and this place, even though it's a super speedway, certainly gives you an opportunity to do so, but you have to be careful. It's three tough turns. Well, believe me, I mean, that's not what I like, but when that happens, you can't quit driving. you got to keep going, and so when it starts sliding, you just got to keep running. I like to have both all four tires stuck perfect. I think that'd be every racer's dream. All right, that's Rusty Wallace. He is the defending Winston Cup champion, and he's looking for a good run this afternoon. Now back upstairs to Dave Despain. All right, thank you, guys. Let's get a uh, close-up look at this racetrack now from the fifth member of our team. Lynn St. James made broadcast history a year ago when she became the first woman to serve as a Winston Cup expert analyst. Yesterday, well, proving that expertise is well-earned. Lynn was driving her race car for a living. Very confident for the Detroit Trans Am. We were all set to introduce her with video from Victory Circle. Instead, she crashed. She brought it home in a basket. Ms. St. James, I hope you have something to say for yourself. Okay, Dave. That's a great plan, and that was my plan. I'd love to come here after a victory. But I'll tell you, it's really tough out there. I'm glad all you've got to do to, for a living is talk. It's also tough right here, and I'm standing on the front straightaway at Pocono International Raceway. It's very wide. In fact, we've seen five or six cars abreast coming down this straightaway. A lot of action. Pocono is one of the toughest tracks on the entire circuit in the country. In fact, Indy cars don't come here anymore. But the NASCAR cars race here, and they can handle the bumps. They can handle these tight turns. But I've talked to a lot of drivers. It's nobody's favorite racetrack. One of the reasons why it is so distinct is that even though it's called a two-and-a-half-mile tri-oval, it's really three long, wide straightaways with three very distinct, difficult turns. In fact, let's take a lap around the track with Daryl Waltrip, three-time Winston Cup champion. Well, this, this track has uh, got such long straightaways that you really, it's like running into a tunnel. You see these turns coming, and buddy, let me tell you, they're narrow. And you're coming down that straightaway, I'm going to guess 180 miles an hour. Track's pretty rough, car's doing a lot of flopping up and down. And you get down there to that corner, and you got to go in hard, because if you, if you don't, you don't make very good time. So you run down in that corner way over your head, standing up on the brakes, brake left-footed here, because it's critical to get down in the corner hard. So in order to do that and not lose a lot of time, you got to use your left foot. Run down in there and aim for the grass. Sometimes you even hit what you're aiming for, but most of the time you don't. Hang that left wheel right on that yellow line right there with the dust and dirt and grass flying up in the air through that corner, car hunching up and down. You got her turn, you're coming off, and whoa, you just about nail that wall coming out of turn one over there. As you start down another long back straightaway, while by now that 
straight away so long, you can kind of, you know, get yourself all straightened up, look in the mirror and see how things look. Got plenty of time, no problem, 180 mile an hour into it. Golly, what I think is the most dangerous curve, curve, most dangerous turn that we have in racing. Turn two here at Pocono, over the tunnel, any kind of trouble there and you're gonna get hurt. So you really have to respect that corner. You hang your left wheel, they got it all painted up over. You can't tell if it's speed bumps, pain, or what it is, but hang that left wheel right down there as low as you can get it. Let the car really kind of bounce through there. Slide it right out next to the wall. Sometimes you even clip the wall. I already have a couple of times, just barely. So you can get a nice strong run across that short chute. A lot of jostling along the short chute there for position, because if you get through the tunnel turn good and the other guy gets out of the gas a little side by side into turn three, Somebody's got to give, folks. You can go on the outside later on in the race, but it's a long way around, and it ain't going to win you no race. Hook it low again. Left wheel in the grass. Dirt flying. Rocks flying. Throw it all over Rusty. Throw it all over Dale. Get off my tail. Down to the start finish line. track makes it very slick. I can tell you from driving street courses, you don't want to drive on that paint, but you have to here because that's the line. That's Pocono International Raceway. Back to you, Dave. All right. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Daryl. We who talk for a living are certainly jealous of those of you who drive these things for a living. Let's get this thing underway. Waiting at the head of the grid is Bill Giles of Ogden, Utah. Start your engine. What a thrill for that guy. That's a NASCAR fan from Ogden, Utah. Bill Giles won the right to utter those famous words in a contest, and now the motors come to life here at Pocono. Rusty Wallace firing up. Here's Sterling Marlin's machine. There's old Daryl back there, ready to throw dirt all over everybody. About time for us to start and look at that starting lineup of how they'll get underway here today. The engines have fired along pit road. Engines warming, and very soon they'll roll out on that initial warm-up lap that will get the festivities underway here today. Let's take a look at the starting lineup on the pole. Ernie Irvan, the youngster with the rags to riches story from Modesto, California, alongside the 48-year-old winner of a 1,000 features, Dick Trickle. In row two, good story there. Well, let's show you a little bit of that pole run first, though. Ernie Irvin turned in a 56-9 lap, 158 miles an hour. Started this season without a ride, basically, and has come back to sit on the pole. Bill Elliott, fast, right out of the truck, qualifies third. Jeff Bodine, outside row two, led more laps here during the 80s than any other driver. We find Greg Sachs on the inside of the third row. The Hollywood guy, we'll find out more about his activities. And the ailing Dale Earnhardt outside row three. He's a story. Sterling Marlin and Kenny Schrader occupy the fourth row. Schrader hungry for his first win of what has been an up-and-down season. And then in row five, the always loquacious Waltrip and the suffering in 1990, Alan Kulwicki. In row six, we have Mark Martin, the point leader. Not an outstanding qualifying day here today. Davey Allison, who should run well on this racetrack lines up 12. In row seven, we have Dale Jarrett subbing for Neil Bonnet for the rest of the 1990 season, and Kyle Petty, whose exploits will follow in this Father's Day. Ricky Rudd with a strong run last week at Sears Point. Great road racer starts alongside Harry Gant in the eighth row as Gant comes from 16th starting spot. Now the field has rumbled off toward turn number one as we check the rest of the grid for you. The two-time winner this year, Derek Cope, shares row nine with Rick Wilson in row 10. We'll have Michael Waltrip, who crashed in practice, starts a backup car, and we'll go to the back of the field here on the pace lap. Brett Bodine, a one-time winner, a first-time winner this year, shares row 10 with Mike Waltrip. In row 11, Hut Strickland driving for his uncle, Bobby Allison, and the veteran Richard Petty, who qualified well back of his son here today on Father's Day. In row 12, something of a local hero, Jimmy Spencer, Mr. Excitement, has done a lot of racing in this part of the country. Rusty Wallace, way back in row 12. On to row 13, Bobby Hill and the Midwest short track veteran Butch Miller. Terry Labonte, the defending champion in row 14, along with Randy LaJoy. He's the Coors Tour veteran. Row 15 has Morgan Shepard, also in the point race, the rookie Robbie Moroso. In row 16, veteran Dave Marcus, area driver Jimmy Horton. The 18th row will have Jack Pennington and Jim Sauter, 19, Chad Little and Tommy Riggins. And rounding out the starting lineup here for today will be Jerry O'Neill and Jimmy Means in the 19th row, Troy Beebe and the veteran J.D. McDuffie 
round out this 40 car field. A lot of the top drivers in the point standings are well back in the field. Let's take a look from our in-car cameras here. We have two in the race today. We'll be seeing the view of Kyle Petty here as he comes from 14th starting spot. Let's see if we can hear from Kyle Petty. Kyle Petty, Dave Desain up in the broadcast booth. Long way to get to the front today. You ready to make the charge? Yeah, I guess we're as ready as we're going to be now. We're as close as we can be, I guess. So uh, I can wish everybody a happy Father's Day that's watching today. Good luck to you, Kyle. Good luck, too, to Father Richard. What a way to celebrate side-by-side -side racing okay, at Pocono. Phil Parsons, you want to see if you can raise Mark Martin on the racer radio? Mark Martin, Phil Parsons, can you hear me? Phil Parsons talking to you on the radio, or TV. Mark, can you hear me? You with a TV link on your radio. Oh, yeah. I guess I heard you. All right, Mark. How does it look? You're starting back a little bit. Can you can you get to the front? Yeah, we can get to the front. Uh, we don't need to be in any hurry to do it, so uh, we've got plenty of time. All right, Mark. Good luck. Let's Thank find you, out. Phil. All right. Good luck to Mark Martin. Let's check in with Rusty Wallace. Rusty Donovan Wallace. Donovan. Is Dave Despain in the television control. We're talking about guys who got a long way to go to the front today. You're starting 24th. It only took you 40 laps to get to the front last year. Are you going to try to do it that quickly here in 1990? Yeah, I guess I am. I want to get the job done as quick as I can so I get a good, clear racetrack. I just hope it handles well. I think it will. We'll see what happens. You qualified, yeah. You qualified badly in practice well yesterday. Are you confident in that car as you take the green here? Ran pretty good yesterday, so I feel pretty good about it, yeah. Have a good one, Rusty. Rusty Wallace, you're inside his car as they complete the uh, pace laps here. We will go green this time by. We're just about a half lap from the start. Lynn St. James has hustled from the racetrack up to the broadcast booth to describe the feelings, the emotions, the anticipation as you head for that green flag. Believe it or not, you're calm at this point. I mean, your, your adrenaline's going, but you have to be calm. Like Mark said, you know, they got a long time here. They've got 500 miles um, to, to, to do what they've got to do, so you can't be over-anxious here. Phil Parsons, as they look for that green flag, your anticipation of what will happen in that front row, the youngster, Urban, the veteran, Trickle, are they both going to try to win the race on the first lap? Well, I, I think it's important for both of those guys to try to lead a lap, uh, so the, obviously they want to lead the first one, get it out of the way. That way they get their five points uh, for the Winston Cup point battle and get it done with. But I tell you, uh, Ernie Irvin is the boss on the pace, on the uh, start, so he should have the advantage. If his car slips a little bit in any of the turns, then Dick the Trickle probably be right there. It is the Miller Genuine Draft 500 at Pocono, and we are underway. Looks like Dick Trickle had trouble on the start. Looks yeah. like he almost missed a gear. There's the patented Pocono picture, six and seven wide down that massive front straight. It is a heel off into turn number one, field streaming through. Indeed, Irvin got the start, trickle bobbled a little bit, and it looks like Bill Elliott has charged up into a contending spot there as he runs down the back stretch in second position, and he'll be immediately challenged by Greg Sack, who was considered by most to be the fastest car here yesterday in the final practice. Sack's running a limited schedule in 1990, and a new team put together involving Paul Newman, along with the uh, ubiquitous car owner all over this uh, series, Rick Hendrick out of Charlotte, North Carolina. That is a good car. Irvin with a great start. He Bill. sure did, but it, it really was more dramatic than it was because Dick Trickle had so much trouble. He held up the, old, the whole field. And here's Rusty Wallace with a view from inside his car, and you see a constant Pocono problem. The dirt and dust being thrown up by the other cars, and oftentimes rocks being thrown up onto the racetrack. Irvin has led the first of 200 laps here as we ride with Rusty Wallace trying to get to the front. The view out the back sees Dave Marcus right to wedged up there behind trying to take advantage of that draft. Moving down to the inside, Wallace is trying to do the difficult here at Pocono, and that's pass on the outside. It's extremely difficult because right now the track is green and the, and the adhesion is real good in the inside. You see Dave Marcus now on the, on the inside of Rusty. Morgan Shepard was on the inside and got by Rusty, so Rusty needs to get to the inside. He may be trapped out there, too. There's just no hole to get down in line. And when you're Rusty Wallace, the Winston Cup champ with a million dollars in your pocket, nobody's anxious to give you a lot of running room. Sachs is coming out to the leader very, very hard. A couple of the young stars of stock car racing having a heyday at Pocono. It's way down to the bottom. Ernie Irvin hugs that inside. But he has been gathered up here by Sachs. Who wants to lead some of the great 
Bill Elliott third with a gap of a couple of three car lengths back to him. Make it to five or six car lengths as they cross start finish and put the second lap in a row. And here is the challenge from Sachs, who got the bottom of the racetrack away from Burnham as they go into lap three. A lot of aggression there, Lynn. There's a guy who doesn't want to fool around, wants to get to the front, lead his laps early. That's true, but look at the gap that's there between one and two, which really was set up by that problem that Dick Trickle had at the start. It's, it's going to be a real charge for Elliott and the, to try to pull back up to the leaders because the leaders could really pull away here. Elliott, very strong right out of the truck here. They uh, they came off with the right setup. They qualified third. They're very excited about their prospects here today in what has been a tough season for them. They just haven't been able to get things together, have not yet won a race this year. And uh, I know they're more than ready to do that. We're coming to a couple of tracks that they like a whole lot. As we watch Sack lead and Irvan in pursuit in the early running, a two-car show there, a glimpse of Elliott. And he has been reeled in by Jeff Bodine, who now sits in fourth, a guy that I think has a real shot of winning this race today. Now we're inside the Kyle Petty car, and he's got a pretty good partner to run with. That is Kenny Schrader just ahead of him, trying to come from 14th starting spot today. And so Kyle immediately hooked on to a, a pretty good car there. He's caught Schrader. Actually, I think Schrader has backed up a little bit to get to Kyle as uh, Kenny started from 8th spot. There's the look at the outside of the car, and here's Kyle doing his day's work on a racetrack that is uh, it's really kind of a matter of... straighter with the front straighter, the long straighter on the circuit. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna look, take a look at the start of the race again to see exactly what happened to Dick Turtle. It, it may be hard to see from this angle, but here the car's getting ready to go. Ernie Irvin has already punched the throttle. They're getting ready to throw the green flag, and you can you can almost detect that Dick Turtle is not taking off like Ernie Irvin is. You, you can see the separation now. You can see all the drivers behind him scrambling. Jeff Wood I went to the inside, Dale Earnhardt to the outside, and it really caused a lot of problems, especially for the outside line. But things have settled down now and they can overcome and they have another 195 laps to, to get to the front. Frustration for Trickle, 48 years old, sitting at the head of the class there. You never like to have a bobble like that. Would you speculate maybe a missed gear? It's hard to tell from up here, but would that be a good guess? I, I would think so. Uh, for some reason, uh, the car didn't go. Maybe the carburetor floated a little bit because on, on the pace laps, a lot of times the carburetor can load up because you're not you're not running a lot of uh, you're running a lot of fuel in it, but not going very fast to burn it up. So uh, the carburetor might have bobbled, or he might have just missed a gear slightly for a minute. Sachs beginning to open up the advantage early over Irvan here as we get underway with this 500 miler at Pocono. It'll be a grind today. Let's go down to uh, Dick Bergman and see if we can come up with more on this Dick Trickle story. Well, I'm with Dick Trickle's crew chief, Doug Williams. Doug, what's wrong with the car? Dick says right now the car just feels like it's under power. We had a switch ignition box and it's starting to come back, so we must have had a bad ignition box on the car. So you're back up to full song? It's back up to full song now, Dick. Okay, well, he likes passing cars anyway, so Trickle's probably having fun out there, even though he's not right up front. Trickle's got a bunch up in the pass. He is the leader of about the fifth group here on the racetrack. He is well back in the field as they mark their progress down into turn number one. And again, the bottle off the start was the problem. He's got Ricky Rudd in tow as they come clear down inside the white line and race the apron. And Trickle leaves an opening there if Rudd can drive through it. You want to hug the bottom on all three corners here on this racetrack. Dick got a little wide. Rudd could not seize the moment. And for the moment, they will maintain their running order. Trickle starting from the outside of row one, but apparently it was a balky ignition off the start that got him in trouble. They have shifted the switch to the backup ignition, if you will, and now seem to be in good shape. So it's a heyday for the yellow cars up front as the number 18 of Greg Sachs maintains his lead over Ernie Irvan. Irvan, a man who at the moment appears to be at the top of his game. We go from the yellow cars to the red cars then, running in the third and fourth, Bill Elliott and Jeff Bodine. If you have questions about stock car racing, give us a call today. We have an 800 number, so you can dial us toll free. 800 race is our viewer hotline. 522 race. The call costs you nothing. Give us a ring with your questions, and we'll do our best to get the answers from Phil Parsons, Lynn St. James, along Pit Road, Dick Bergman and Pat Patterson from Crew Chiefs of Drivers, wherever we've got to go to get your answer, we'll do our best to get it for you. So give us a call. 522 race on the 800 line. That's our number to call with questions here today. Five laps into this race, the lead belonging to the number 18 car. Let's pick up that third place battle as Greg Sachs leads over number four, Ernie Irvin. Here is third and fourth, and that is Bill Elliott about to be challenged, it appears, by Jeff Bodine. Bodine looking down to the inside. First came to this racetrack way back in 1969. He has run a ton of miles at Pocono. Never perhaps in a better car. Right now, he drives the Junior Johnson Budweiser number 11 into 
fourth spot pursued there by Sterling Marlin. He's you know, now fifth. That's the car that won the race last year. It's the car Jeff Wadine drove this year. Won the race with Terry Labonte last year. Labonte, meanwhile, started way back in 27th spot today. So from victory lane, uh, it was a long way into the back of the field in qualifying. They simply did not time trial well. A lot of drivers had problems in qualifying. It was a short practice session prior to time trial, and a lot of guys just didn't get him up to speed, including several of the front runners. We've not said a lot about Dale Earnhardt today. He is badly under the weather with the effects of a virus that is also plaguing his team. Race for third, Elliott slipped. Bodine said, I got you, dove underneath, and we've got a new third-place man. Bill Elliott left the door wide open. Jeff Bodine said, I'll take it. Thank you very much. I've been watching these cars, and the lead pack particularly, and they really seem to pull away. The, Ernie and the, the first two cars seem to pull away coming out of turn, going into turn one and then down the, the, the chute. But then when they got to the tunnel turn, they were pulling up on them. And so that by the time they got to start finish, it was a pretty close race. So you've got two sort of maybe two setups here where the cars are running well at one part of the track and, uh, and not so well on the other part. Note the progress of Sterling Marlin. He's up to fifth. He's in the middle of that battle and ready to challenge. Phil? Sterling runs well at this racetrack. And as Lynn was saying, this track has three distinctly different turns. And so a lot of times, a car will be perfect in one end of the racetrack, but maybe not so good in, in, in one or two of the other corners. So, uh, you know, you, a lot of times, like Lindsay, you'll see a car really get through turn one good, but then lose ground in the tunnel turn or possibly even turn three. I want to hear more about that. We're watching third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And on the right-hand side of your screen in black is Dale Earnhardt, the dominator, plagued by uh, this virus that we talked about that's left him with an upset stomach coughing, sneezing. There's a lot of it around this area. His crew chief also played with it. The uh, the general consensus in the garage area seems to be if anybody can whip that bug and win this race, it would be the tough guy, Dale Earnhardt. But he's got a challenger right now as they come up the front straight away. He's got that a bug on the inside Schrader. of him right now, Dave. He's got yeah. Ken, by the name of Ken Schrader. But I said earlier in the show that Earnhardt was in third points, but he actually dropped all the way to fourth. Rusty passed him with his winning series points. So I'd just like to correct that. Got good point and that is after leading the series early Bodine is your fifth ranked driver he has come into contention in the last couple of races and right now Dick Bergeron uh, check that Pat Patterson I believe is standing by with the crew chief on that car well Dave I walked down the pit road with Tim Brewer a little earlier before the race started Tim said you know this is the car that won last year I got Jeff Bodine and he's good at Pocono and Tim's reached over to talk in just a minute you know this dog can hunt today don't you <laughs> well, uh, Pat, that's kind of a strange way of putting it, but uh, I think everybody in the garage area yesterday afternoon in the last practice session seen how strong the Budweiser Ford was, and, uh, you know, Jeff, he's pretty pleased with the thing, so we're just going to sit here. Talking guys, because a lot of times they're the fast racing guys, and that's certainly the case with the Junior Johnson outfit. Not uh, outstanding on the super speedways this year, ninth and 24th in two previous runs, but Bodine really likes Pocono. Bodine, you'll recall a year ago, knocked Spence down here and uh, put us in a delay pattern. He has no plans to do that today. You're back with the leader now, and uh, basically the man who has dominated this race early on. That is the number 18 machine being piloted here by Greg Sachs of Manitowoc, New York. Young man who's had a real up and down kind of a Winston Cup career. Won his first race down at Daytona. Here is Kyle Petty as we check his progress here. He's uh, really on the march. He's come all the way to eighth. He hooked up with uh, Schrader and managed to get to the front or get towards the front from a 14th starting spot. This is the view from his car. He's actually moved up to sixth position now. He got by both Ken Schrader and Dale Earnhardt to Kyle's all the way up to sixth. He's having a great run today. You know, we, we appreciate that, Kyle. We put that in-car camera in there because we wanted to see what it's like to go through traffic, and he's given us some good uh, views of that here today. Hard-working uh, young driver, of course, the son of a racer, grandson of a racer, and here on Father's Day, he carries the family tradition, checks the mirror for the seventh-place man. Most of the looking he's doing today is toward the front of this field. You see the left foot breaking there. That uh, is something we'll get a lot of uh, a lot of perspective on during the course of this afternoon. It's a technique that's unusual to this form of the game. Dave, next time we talk to Kyle, let's remind him to put the visor down on his helmet so he doesn't get anything in his eyes. I was thinking about that, but it's hot in those inside cars. I know in, in our, in my Mustang and the Trans Am series, I wear the visor up because it's doggone hot when you wear it down. 
It really is. I ran a race with a full face helmet at Daytona this year. The ball of my race, 125 miles, and I absolutely couldn't breathe, so I went back to the open face helmet. Kyle is one of the few drivers in this division who prefers that uh, that uh, full face uh, helmet. And now we understand there is perhaps a problem with number 17. Darrell Waltrip says, when I qualify in the top 10, I get feeling pretty racy on Sunday morning. He was in the top 10 to qualify here today, but now we understand there may be a problem with the car that at last report was running 19th on the field. He's fallen into the clutches of Terry Labonte directly in front of him is Dave Marcus. And it appears that Waltrip is struggling a little bit, not only today, but my how he has struggled all season. Keep in mind that at this juncture of the 1989 season, Waltrip had won four races, including the Daytona 500, went on to win six. Everybody felt that this team would be a contender for the 1990 championship. In fact, they have not won a race. Here we look at the battle now for second place as Bodine has moved into the second spot. Ernie Irvin doing a slow fade here. Started from the pole, but a couple of guys have caught him. And you can bet that Bodine got tired of waiting there and decided, i got to get up there and uh, mix it up a little bit with Greg Sachs. You know, Greg Sachs is running out there in clean air all by himself. He's got no help. Nobody's, you know, drafting him and moving him along. He's far enough ahead. He's running clean, and yet he's running faster than everybody a good race car, huh, Phil? He really is. I'll tell you, Jeff O'Dine's doing a heck of a job. He, he may be just as fast as Greg Sachs right now because he ran Ernie Irvin down and passed him, but, but it's a long race, as we've talked about a number of times, and they'll be able to make a pit stop on a caution bog or even a green, pack, green flag pit stop, change the tire stagger a little bit, adjust on the car, and, and Ernie Irvin should be back towards the front. This is a bias ply race, so that tire stagger business that you hear so much about in this uh, in this series, the difference in the size of the tires and how they're used to affect the handling of a car is very much an issue here today. They could do more to adjust stagger with bias tires than with radio. Is that right? Well, Jim? they really can, David, because you can get virtually any size on, uh, on, a, on a bias ply tire. On a radio, they come out of the mold. I'm sorry, but that was some bump drafting going on there. Excuse <laughs> me, give me some help. Ernie yeah. Irvin comes up to Jeff Bodine and said, Pass me with one thing. I may just pass you back here. And Irvin was not, uh, was not uh, an easy mark. And uh, he but came if, right back up and gave Bodine a pretty good shot. He wants back by him, Phil. Well, that's what I thought. Maybe, I'm sorry, they work together. If they work together, they'd have a better chance of running down Greg, wouldn't they? Not, not a whole lot of patience going on right now. You're exactly <laughs> right, Lynn. Uh, if they could hook up in a draft. Uh, right now, racing side by side, they're going to allow Bill Elliott and the cars behind them to catch him. How much is that true on this track compared to, say, Daytona or Talladega? Now, we know on the big tracks where you can really run flat-footed all the way around the place, that draft is real critical. But here, with all the braking and then re-accelerating that you have to do, is that as big a factor? It's not quite as big because at Daytona or Talladega, it's, it's a necessity. It's an absolute necessity. But here, it, it helps, but it's not, you know, as Greg Sachs drove out to the lead, it's not, it's not absolutely... Uh, Compulsory, but uh, but it does help, and I think if, if Jeff Lyon and Ernie Irvin hook up, they'll have a better chance of running down Greg's head. Also worth noting that this is not a restrictor plate race because the speeds here, though they reach 180 on the front straightaway, are not the, the 200 potential or 200 plus that we see at Daytona and Talladega. So they run without the restrictors. We digressed a little from the three-cornered racetrack point that I wanted to get back by, uh, back to, and as we watch these guys hammer down now toward the tunnel turn, which Darrell Walter called the most difficult and perhaps most dangerous in all of racing. Let's have both of you expound a little bit, if you can, on why it's such a problem to have three different shapes and, indeed, three different uh, degrees of banking in the corners. Why is that so difficult to set up for? Well, well because our, our car, you have four springs, four shocks, one sway bar. And when you go to a normal oval track with, with two concentric turns on each end of the racetrack, even though they call it a four-turn track, it, uh, it doesn't... Uh, the car doesn't change from one corner to the other, from one end of the racetrack to the other. But here, the three corners are so different that you can have an ideal setup, as we said earlier, in one turn and be off in the other turns. And I think that's what we're seeing now with Ernie Irvin and Jeff O'Dine. There are places on the racetrack that it looks like Ernie Irvin is better than Jeff O'Dine, but basically all the way around the racetrack for the total lap, Jeff O'Dine's better. He's, he's stretched out a little bit uh, of his lead on Ernie Irvin, and it looks like Jeff, uh, Bill Elliott and Sterling Marlin are beginning to catch him. And yeah, they've got a pretty good little race going on right there for fourth and fifth as Marlon, who's basically been fifth from the get-go, comes up and drafts on Bill Elliott. That is your battle for fourth position. 
Elliott, perhaps the sleeper here today. Nobody said too much about old Bill. The family team from North Georgia, like Darrell Waltrip, struggling a little bit this year. Marlon looks inside, wants to make a move down the long pond straightaway, and does, and with authority. As they dove to the tunnel turn, Elliott says, I believe I'm going to let him go right on by. And so we have a new fourth place man in Sterling Marlon. The rundown after 15 finds Sachs the leader. Second is Bodine. Third is Irvine. Elliott was fourth, gives up that spot to the fifth place man as uh, they swap positions and Sterling Marlin moves up. A runaway pace being established here by the leader, Greg Sack. Let's go down to Pitt Road and hear from his crew chief. Well, I'm with Gary DeHart. He is the crew chief for the leader, Greg Sack. He's talking to him now as soon as he finishes. We're going to ask him, are you going to let Bodine run your car down? Are you going to try to run away from him, Gary? Well, right now, we're just taking it easy. Really. We don't want to hurt the car or anything, so uh, we're just letting the car do what right now it's running good i hope we can run like that all day long where is your car's strongest gary uh really all the way around it's good all the way around well that's what you want but greg Sachs does indeed need to finish this is the same car he ran so well with at darlington but the crankshaft broke while he was in contention to win today they're determined to finish the race they're not going to punish this thing even though they are leading I got to believe that when you're talking on the radio to your driver and he's saying, hey, this thing's great, I'm just cruising, and then you turn to the TV reporter and report, hey, yeah, we got no problem, we're just running her easy, and you're pulling away from a field this good, that means you're pretty strong, Phil. He really is, and as you mentioned earlier, they, everyone said yesterday in the last practice before the race that he was the fastest car. Richard Petty, number 43, legendary in stock car rank, is running in 20th position on the racetrack. Richard Petty, with the completion of that lap, ran his 10,000 Winston Cup mile here at Pocono. Just think about that. The man is a living bit of stock car racing history. 10,000 miles here at Pocono. That is just Winston Cup miles, by the way. He also won a 500-mile USAC race here. Richard says that he likes Pocono a whole lot. This is one of his favorite places to race. He still enjoys his Sunday afternoon. Well, I tell you, this is great. Uh, I, that might be part of the big reason I keep coming back. I don't know. But uh, the people here in, in this particular racetrack and stuff, it just seems like it, uh, you know, we've always had a lot of good following up here. And, you know, it just... Uh, you do good or you do bad they cheer you and that i think that a lot of times when you don't do good then that gets you to the next race and uh, you know other than that sometimes it'll be kind of tough you know even when he does do good he do, does good as far as i'm concerned i tell you that man has done so much for this sport and they and they truly love him not only here at Pocono, but everywhere he goes are you surprised in any way that the, that the luster hasn't begun to fade from the petty star not at all dave because i tell you richard petty Every, all of us that drive a race car or in, in quasi public eye can learn from Richard Petty. Good, bad, no matter what happens, he always has a smile. He always has time for the fans to sign autographs. He's just a terrific human being, and he has done so much for this sport. It would not be where it is today if it wasn't for Richard Petty. A lot of people have speculated that uh, perhaps it's time for Richard to hang it up. Perhaps he should retire. I, for one, have said from the start, I think he ought to be allowed to go out there and race that car every Sunday afternoon as long as he's enjoying it. Unless he starts getting in people's way, and Richard is a sharp enough race car driver that when that happens, he'll park there. We're talking about uh, Morgan Shepard at the top of the show, and that was Richard right behind Morgan Shepard. So obviously he's doing a pretty good job. <laughs> still race the good guys. Here's the good guy today. Greg Sachs has been good from the get-go. He ran down pole sitter Ernie Irvine within the first two five laps, made the pass, took the lead, and has showed his heels to the field ever since. He was a smiling and bubbly guy yesterday after qualifying, because, or after uh, the final practice session, we should say, because uh, basically that race car was as good yesterday as it is today. Now, for Greg, who comes from Manitouk, Long Island, this is really like a hometown racetrack. Would it be in a special race for you to win here today? Oh, it'd be great. You know, I didn't even know I was coming to this track till about a week ago, and I couldn't be more excited than to be here in Pocono because I've got a lot of friends, fans from all the New England area, Long Island, New York, you know, my friends out of Mattituck, my hometown. Uh, it'd be absolutely great, especially to bounce back after last year's incident. And, you know, I've even run modifieds here on the two-and-a-half-mile track. You know, I've won here in the race of champions, and I'd like to get back to Ricky Circle. Man had a big crash here last year, has come back today to lead the race. Nothing like making amends for last year's miscue and doing it with a lot of style in front of so many of the hometown fans. Here's your leaderboard. Sachs is leading. Bodine, former winner here, is second. Sterling Marlin has marched past Ernie Irvine to take over third spot. Good run for Sterling today. 
still looking for that first Winston Cup win. Irvin, the pole sitter, is fourth. Bill Elliott says Happy Father's Day star with a fifth place run so far. Kyle Petty has come from 14th to 6th. Schrader is 7th. Alan Kowicki in 8th uh, position now. Kowicki, a struggling driver who owns the track record here. Dale Earnhardt ill today, hanging on in ninth. And Derek Cope, the Daytona 500 winner, number 10, is 10th after 21 of 200 laps. Long race here at Pocono because of the lap time. It takes almost a minute to run a lap here with the tight corners that you have. And so we're looking at a three-hour and 20-minute race in the Grand Green all the way. You're inside Rusty Wallace's car here as he hauls that number 27 along. Not uh, making spectacular progress, certainly not like a year ago, but consistently moving toward the front. He is now 17th in the running order. And uh, this is a picture we saw yesterday during the rehearsals. He really works that car. Look at the expression on that man's face. That is total concentration. Now he's out onto the straightaway. Gets a little chance to sit back and relax and rest and think about what's coming next. Perhaps check the mirror. See how far it is down to that next corner. But the problem is finding your way into that turn and then hunker down over that steering wheel. Let your tongue hang out a little bit. Break with that left foot. That's a nice picture of just the amount of work that you have to do here. Stretching out his arms, shaking him loose. Bill, that's kind of representative of what we see on this racetrack. I think. It really is. And you notice yellow flag is out. Caution flag is out. I think it's Jerry O'Neill. Yeah, Jerry O'Neill has pulled off the racetrack at turn one, and obviously a mechanical problem. No uh, word of a spin or crash. O'Neill has parked it down on the apron, and at that juncture, it does represent a safety problem. Actually, he's not quite to turn one, and the car may well have stalled coming off pit road. He's sitting uh, right down on the edge of the grass, and they'll need the tow truck to get him out of there. So, with 23 laps showing on the board, the pits will close. They'll make one full lap of the racetrack. The pace car will pick up the front-running automobile, and after the completion of that lap, they will then be allowed to come in for service. And 23 laps in, I would presume we'll see most everybody. Yeah, I think everybody will come in. It's, uh, it's really over halfway on a scheduled pit stop, so everyone will come in. Uh, there may be some people that, to try to get track position, will only take on two tires, but I think all the leaders will take on four tires and a full tank of fuel and, and be set to go another 40 or so laps. It is the first caution of the day here. The, uh, the record for fewest cautions in this event is one. This race went, ran on one occasion, the fastest race ever, with only one caution. And uh, I believe it was on that occasion that they ran 176 green flag laps from start to the first yellow. So now the pits are open, and Zach leads the charge down onto pit road. He will be passed by Bodine, whose pit is all the way down toward the end. And the wholesale scramble is on. Fortunately, pit road here is almost as wide as the racetrack itself. It's a, it's a safe area in which to conduct your business. Let's go to Dick Bergman. Well, not only does Greg Zach not get a lot of opportunity to drive, he doesn't get a lot of opportunity to do pit stops either. Zach's team hastily assembled, doing a good job here this afternoon. Meanwhile, Pat Patterson up pit road with a bunch of other fast cars. Pat, while you're watching a very, very efficient pit crew, this is Gary Nelson's team, Kyle Petty, you've been riding inside the car with him. They changed right side tires, left side tires, and this is a pit stop for Kyle Petty. from Kyle viewpoint of the drag race back out onto the racetrack. You watch that mirror a lot when you're coming out of the fifth because you know there's somebody from behind you who's had about a quarter mile run to get up to speed. You sure don't want to pull out in front of it. Kyle's on the march today. A lot of different strategies there. A number of cars took on four tires. A number of the front runners also took on two tires. So real different strategies there going on two buys you some track position. If you only change two tires, you get back out onto the racetrack and back into line further up the field, Phil, and if you took on four, what do you pay for that advantage? What's the cost? Well, I say at this point in the race, it's so early that I think a lot of them are trying and say, hey, can I run as fast on two fresh tires as I can on four fresh tires? If I can, when it comes down to the last caution flag or the last pit stop with, with 20 laps to go, maybe maybe I'll only get two tires. If my speed is not hurt that much, so I think that's what a lot of them are doing right now. They're going to monitor the stopwatch, see how fast they run now compared to how fast they ran at the start of the race with four fresh tires, and, and also the other cars that took on four tires and then play their strategy from there. Lynn? I would think also that they wanted to, you know, they weren't happy with the way the cars run and they wanted to change the stagger of the whole thing just to get a better race car under them, so this was the shot to do it. Let's go to Pat Patterson who's with Gary Nelson. Okay, Gary, a pretty good pit stop for you guys. Looked like, looked like it was a good stop for you. Yeah, we well, had to make a couple adjustments. The car was just a little bit on the loose side over the tunnel turn and uh, 
we made a wedge adjustment. We'll see how it goes from there. But yeah, we're overall we're pretty happy. I noticed the tires look pretty clean, so that's that's good for the very start of this race. One thing about it, you gotta have clean tires. <laughs> what he's talking about is getting those tires chewed up out there, and it appears, appears like it was a good stop for everybody, uh, especially at this juncture, so that they can come in, take a look at what kind of tire temperatures they've got and how the tires are wearing. Back upstairs. Pat, if you get a chance, tell Gary that it's just as cool and comfortable up here in the broadcast booth as it was last year when he did such an excellent job, and uh, we hope that he sweats, uh, sweats terribly down there all day today now that he's just chose to go back to work. All right, here is the car about which we speak. It is the Pete car number 42 that Kyle Petty has driven very effectively here today. And uh, let's listen in and see what uh, what they're saying now, what they're saying on the radio. Yeah, he must have beat us on the pit stop. Okay, you're hearing cross talk. That sounds like Rusty Wallace and Barry Dotson talking right there. Yeah, I think it was, and they were talking about the fact that they're going to need to tighten that car up a little bit more. It's still loose. Keep in mind that we are monitoring a wide variety of uh, radio transmissions here today, and in that case, I believe that was Wallace. Petty maintained his position on the racetrack. He went in in sixth spot into the pits. He came out in sixth spot, so no change there as uh, Petty, who started 14th, turning in a good run here today. See if we hear any more of the radio talk. Dave, right, that's the pace car right there. The pace car will pull off the racetrack right now, right after the tunnel turn. And then the leader of the race will be the boss when they get back around. That's because it takes so long to get around. They just drop the pace car off, and now, and now the leader has them until they come back around and take the green flag. And so I understand the start actually is at the Winston Cup uh, building rather than at the start-finish line. I don't know if we can see that on our Kyle will have a, a mirror full of Dale Earnhardt when we restart this race, and uh, all indications are we will be doing that this time by. So the field forms up uh, behind the leader as they prepare to come off turn four. It will be Jeff Bodine who leads the race, and we'll see a green flag. Oh, there is the green flag. J.D. McGuffey pulled on the pit just ahead of the cars as Bodine leads the rush down for turn one with Bill Elliott in tow. There comes the swoop by Earnhardt. The Dominator swings out of line and picks off the 26 car of Brett Bodine. So while Jeff is up front, Brett falls victim to a pass there by Dale Earnhardt, who has marched up to seventh spot. Elliott will get a chance to take a shot here at number 11, Bodine. Sachs came out of the pit third, went into the pits as the leader. So suddenly we have a three-car race and an opportunity to see what Bodine and Elliott can do up front. And what they do is pull away just a little bit. Bodine, obviously, real good under braking. Let's go to uh, Dick Bergman on pit road. Well, Dave, the guys who are pitting far up pit road, way up at the other end, have something of an advantage on these pit stops. They get to accelerate all the way down pit road real fast. Then they get to take off, and nobody can pass them after they get out of there. Now, this here is Greg Sachs' pit. He's about in the middle of pit road. Sterling Marlin is right next to us. They have a tougher time, and, and pitting, they may often lose a spot or two. We were also listening to radio transmissions before this round of pit stops. Many of the competitors were complaining about cars pushing. They were understeering. That's because the weather has changed. It's become a little bit overcast. That will promote a pit uh, pushing condition. Terry Labonte is coming in. He has a loose wheel. Terry Labonte coming in with what is reported to be a loose wheel. Lots of stuff going on down here, Dave Despain. Stay on top of it, Dr. Dick. Thank you very much. That is last year's winner of the race with a new ride for 1990 and a big problem early in the race. As, uh, he has a loose wheel and will have to stop for repair. I say, Dave, that's one advantage to this racetrack being so big. They can come in, tighten that wheel up, top it off with fuel. If they don't have any major trouble, which it looks like it's taking a lot longer time, but see, the leaders are still over just past the tunnel turn, so he can get back out, get up to speed. If he can catch a caution, he can stay in the same lap. He'll need that caution to do that. He will be basically the length of the front straightaway behind, but on the on the lead lap, and that is the key. And uh, it would be a surprise to see another one caution race like we saw here a few years ago. And Bodine leads uh, down the front straightaway. Labonte will try to play catch up from the back of the pack. The 27 lap Bodine is leading this race with Bill Elliott running in the number two spot. Let's sort it out for you after the pit stop and give you the new leaderboard here, the running order following that round of pit stops brought on when Jerry O'Neill parked his car down at the entrance to turn number one. 28 laps complete, Bodine and Elliott battling with Sachs on their tail. 
Sterling Marlin with a good, consistent run here today, and Kenny Schrader himself, a proud papa, running in that fifth spot. He's been pretty consistently in that spot for most of the afternoon, uh, at or near that position. He's been fifth, sixth, seventh. Actually, I think that's as high as he's been. Earnhardt is sixth. Bodine, Rudd, Kulwicki, and Irvine round out the top ten. Ernie Irvine was your pole sitter. Big battle going on right now as Sterling Marlin does that battle with number three, Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt has the bottom of the racetrack. Marlin has the determination. Side by side behind them comes Sachs and Schrader. And this is Pocono at its best. That's why they built that straightaway 80 feet wide, so they could do this kind of stuff. Boy, Ernie Irvin, who was so hot at the beginning, is just uh, not running quite as good right now. And also Greg Sachs, who was really hot at the very beginning. So it's really changed the whole complexion of who's hot right now. Sure. It's amazing what changing a tire stagger and putting a couple rounds of wedge in, taking them out, will do to a race car. Sack's retreat is the more dramatic of the two. Uh, Irvin has kind of steadily worked his way back to about 10th or 11th spot on the racetrack, but Sack's really looked like he had the strongest car out there by a pretty healthy margin, and now uh, he's, he's no better than uh, Sterling Marlin, certainly, and I wouldn't think a whole lot better than Kenny Schrader from the look of what we're seeing here. Here comes Kowicki on the outside trying to do the most difficult uh, thing there is to do here, and that's make a pass on the outside of the racetrack, especially on the likes of Kenny Schrader, but he may get it done as uh, he comes powering out of turn number three here, and I guarantee you we'll call that turn four before this day is over, <laughs> but there are only three here as he comes out on the outside to Kowicki at least holding his own and perhaps will be able to pull off that pass. The retaliation on the inside by the yellow car of Greg Sachs retakes the position from the 94. That is the race for third and fourth between Sachs and Sterling Marlin. Good racing here for position. The story up front, not a lot of lead swaps here by uh, Pocono standard. One of the things we always think of when we come to Pocono is the potential for rain. We've seen a fair bit of it here. This track for many years held the record for lead changes among Winston Cup stock cars, and people speculate that part of the reason for that was that about mid-race, there'd be a big black cloud over turn three, and everybody was trying to get to the front and lead it at the halfway point. Today, the weather is magnificent, and the leader is Jeff Bodine, who led more laps here during the 80s than any other driver. Here is Terry Labonte, again, tail end of the lead lap for Labonte after an unscheduled pit stop. For more on that, let's go to Pat Patterson. Here is an unscheduled pit stop for well, Bill Elliott. Let's go to Dick Bergman. Unscheduled pit stop, which is definitely not planned. They think they've got a tire problem. Ernie kicking the right front tire. They've changed the right side tires on the car. That's all they're going to change. Hopefully that will resolve the problem. Dan Elliott, did you get it? Have you got the tire? That was the problem. Don't know. Don't know. They're not sure. Elliott's team very concerned. That was Dan Elliott, his brother. That team has the most unbelievable luck with flat tires in 1990. I, I don't know what you do. I don't know how oh, you could yeah. be more oh, frustrated yeah. than those guys because, if I'm not mistaken, that is their eighth flat tire in three races. I mean, this is a team that considers itself a front runner all the time and could be a front runner this year. Still with the air keeps getting on the outside. What's going on there? I don't know what you can do about that, Dave. I went through a deal last year where I had I had three flat tires in one race at Bristol. I, I don't know what you do about it. But right now, Bill Elliott's in the exact same position as Terry Labonte in the fact that he's about two-thirds of the lap down, but Elliott's running well enough that I think he don't have any trouble staying in the lead lap, and I think Terry Labonte's in the same way. So if they can get a caution within 30 laps, yeah, that right there, there's the there's the whole circle dog on Elliott's tire. That was the culprit. That's why he had to make his unscheduled pit stop. So he should be in good shape now. Pretty common problem with Pocono over the years. Not as bad since they changed the tunnel and put the Tiger's teeth in there, but you still see a lot of cuts. You really do, because turn one and turn three are just like they used to be. You run through the dirt, you put, you put your left side right against the zero set in the sports description, right against the grass. So it throws up a lot of rocks. The tunnel used to be the worst part, but they fixed that with the ripple strips and stuff. So and now it's just turn one and three, but you turn the tires. This ought to be a great break for Labonte because he's got a fast car to draft with back there. But Lynn, I don't think he's, uh, he's going to be able to hook onto him. Doesn't look like it's happening right now. It was, it was like great. We want to go. We want to go back to pit road. Pat Patterson. Well, Dave, just a quick update on Terry Labonte. He came in because he thought he had a uh, equalized tire, and in fact, he did. When he came in the first time, <laughs> he thought he had a tire that was just loose. Went out, came back around, came back in. Oh, it is higher problem.
problems that have plagued the defending champion and the winner of the July race here a year ago. The last two men to win races at Pocono have both followed victim to tire problems here in this spring of 1990 running. Hey, let me explain what an equalized tire is. We run inner liners inside the tire. It's a safety shield that is inside the outer tire. And what happens is the inside tire is a tube tire, and the outside is tubeless. When, the, when you get a hole in that inner tube, it equalizes the pressure between the outside tire and the inside tire, and it, and it, and it bounces and bounces. The inside bounces against the outside and causes a severe vib vibration, and that's what an equalized tire is. That was the problem for number one, Terry Labonte. Here's the bumper cam from Kyle Petty's car. And he proceeds around this racetrack having run as high in the field as six. And now falling out to that pit stop back to 11th in the shuffling of positions that took place here. Harry Gant, the man he has to deal with as, uh, as the bandit puts the bumper up underneath Kyle Petty's car and keeps the pressure on him. Harry is one of only 10 drivers who raced at this race 10 years ago. We're going to look back at the decade of the 80s a little later today. Right now you see that battle from a different perspective. Kenny Schrader, the man directly ahead of them, as Kyle tries to hold off Harry. They hammer around this triangular racetrack in Pocono. We are working the 35th lap of competition. Scheduled 200 lapper. That is 500 miles on this two and a half mile racetrack. Almost a minute per lap. It's a long afternoon here. Is it a physically demanding racetrack, though? You've really got a lot of time to rest, it would appear. Uh, yeah, it really isn't a physically demanding racetrack, but Dick Trickle said early on, if your car is really ill handling, then that will make it worse. But the straighter moves along, you know, from the in-car camera shot, we notice when they go down a straighter, they'll flex their hands and move around a little bit, so they're not sitting in the same position. You run a track like Bristol, which is a high bank half mile, you never change positions for 500 laps. But here, the straighter moves are so long, you can move around, you can let one hand off the steering wheel, and, and you know, if your hand's numb or something like that, so it's really not that, that hard physically. The hotter it is, naturally, the, the harder it's going to be. Got another look there at uh, at Kyle flexing that uh, left leg as he stomps on the brake pedal with the left foot going down into the corner and then peeling it off to the left, trying to do something with Schrader and likewise pursuing the Brett Bodine there. Here is uh, the number 18, the man who was so strong early on, Greg Sachs, finally gathering things back together and looking like he's ready to perhaps make a run here as he uh, closes in on the leader of Bodine, and Bodine gets a little bit squirrely in turn number three. Checking that running order after 35, this is your first and second place stock. Dale Earnhardt has moved up to third. Now to fourth. There's a look at Kowicki. Sterling Marlin being shown fifth at the end of 35, and a challenge for the lead on the inside, and Sachs has refound his speed, I should say. I was wondering if maybe when he was running with the pack uh, in the air that's not quite as clean, that it just that the car didn't work so well. But boy, when he runs by himself, he just takes right off. That's very possible. A lot of these cars, a lot of times, when you get somebody behind you, it takes the air off the spoiler, and the car will get a lot looser. But Greg was able to work his way by the traffic and get, get back in clean air. And, uh, and pass Jeff O'Dyne. We'll see if he can drive away like he has earlier. Plus, I've talked to, to Jack Roush and some of the other teams that they run differently when they're around different cars. Two cars hook up. It's even that way in the IROC cars, I know. If you get two cars hooked up, um, that the car will handle one way. You get three cars hooked up, it'll handle differently. And depending on what car you're running with, it That's might, you know, two Fords might run well together or maybe a Ford Lumen. I mean, it just goes crazy. But it's really a different race car depending on who you're around but Greg obviously has got a good car when he's running by himself but he's in clean air he's quick we can see right now that Alan Kowicki has got by Dale Earnhardt also Derek Koch so Earnhardt is back to fifth right now so we watch the battle for the lead here as Sachs retakes that spot from Bodine Bodine driving for Junior Johnson in this 1990 season, few people were kind of skeptical about that marriage but uh, they've done pretty well right out of the box eh Jeff no, not at all. I mean, my goodness, I knew this team was, was good. Junior Johnson, Tim Brewer, uh, and I, I knew the Ford car was a good car. I watched Bill Elliott, Mark Martin drive them. Uh, they're, they're good cars. I knew all that was in place. I didn't really think it was going to take any time to get adjusted to the team or them to me. I thought uh, we could just jump in there and go. They're, underneath that sheet metal, the car is the same as what I've been using for the last six years. So. Uh, it's turned out that way for us. Really no time to adjust to each other. Uh, we've missed a couple races with setups, but we feel like we're back on track now, and uh, we're going to run good the rest of the year and uh, hopefully gain some more points. We're fifth right now, so we want to move up to that top spot. 
right, Jeff, got a couple of viewer questions that have come in so far. Now, you folks have got to pay attention out here. Don't call us with questions we've already answered. This racetrack is two and a half miles long, Dave Lorimar, in uh, Cablevision, uh, at Cablevision, Kalamazoo, Michigan. We're teasing, Dave. We're glad you tuned in today. It is a two and a half mile racetrack. It'll run 200 laps for 500 miles. As we watch the number three car here, up into third spot, Earnhardt paced himself early, perhaps checking on his physical condition as much as the car's condition. He's under the weather today, but he looks strong now, Phil. He is, but he has lost a couple spots, as, as I mentioned earlier. Alan Kowicki and Derek Coker have got by, so, you know, they talked about Earnhardt being sick and having a stomach virus, but uh, if there's anybody in the world that can overcome it, it's Dale Earnhardt, but he doesn't look as strong today as he normally does. Uh, he has not really made a, a foray to the front like he, like he would have. Uh, you would expect Earnhardt to be qualified a uh, caution flag's out. I don't know what's on the racetrack, but the uh, caution flag's out. But Dale Earnhardt, he'll, he'll get that car figured out. He'll be a force to be reckoned with before the day's over. I think the best measure of the fact that Earnhardt is a sick puppy today is the fact that he has not charged to the front. He did go as high as third, slips back a couple of spots to fifth. Now on lap 39, the caution flag will fly. I would suspect that in very uncharacteristic fashion today, Dale Earnhardt will have to play a waiting game and save his resources for the late laps of this race. The leader, Sachs, again, under uh, under yellow. He was leading when the caution flew the first time around. Bill? I tell you, that was a real break for Bill Elliott and Terry Labonte. Both of those cars remain in the lead lap, so now they can get in and get, get fresh tires, get back up with the pack, and then they'll be in good shape for the rest of the day. Sachs working his way around the pits will remain closed, of course, until they get back to uh, the entrance to pit road and the uh, pace car has picked up the leader. And at that point, uh, perhaps we'll be able to check in with Terry Labonte and find out if he appreciated that good break. Still not exactly certain what that caution was for, but it appears to be a, a racetrack condition problem. I think there's debris out there somewhere that they're cleaning up. It's the same situation, Dave. The cars really don't have to make a full lap because the pace car is still over there by the tunnel. When they come by the start finish line the first time, then the pace car picks them up. So we don't have to wait that full lap for them to pit. So the pace car picks them up, and here they come. Once again, the wholesale dash onto pit road, and it looks like number eight, but uh, 98 Butch Miller will stay on the racetrack to lead a lap. Everybody else on pit road, Zach's diving in for fast service. He'll certainly get right. Let's go to Dick Berger. Check it out. Greg Sachs is being handled by Dennis Potter. If you were a fan of Tim Richmond, if you watched Kenny Schrader's strong runs, you saw Dennis Potter work with that team. He left Hendrick for a while, went to work on the movie. He stacked, he helped a lot working up here on the Greg Sachs car. Pat Patterson up the other end of the road. Pat Levin of Jeff Bodon, the Budweiser crew, brought their machine in. seconds for, and that's a very good pit stop for Junior Johnson's team. It was not, however, good enough to get him back out onto the racetrack in the lead as, uh, I don't believe, we'll double check that, but uh, Butch Miller who stayed out will have the lead just temporarily. He will still come in for a uh, for a pit stop. I would suspect that he will come around and stop this time. And Phil, I believe we got some further word on what the uh, delay is for here. There's a billboard on the outside of the racetrack right between turn one and turn two on the long pond straightaway, and it appears as though something happened to the signboard. It, uh, it fell down, or a piece of it fell down, and then there's an emergency crew over there right now working. There it is right there on the screen. Uh, emergency crew working on it and uh, trying to get the sign uh, off the racetrack. The guy who paid the bill for that billboard will uh, want a refund on half his money today. Perhaps we can get uh, something from NASCAR Control on this. Let's eavesdrop a little bit. <laughs> We're astounded. We heard this. The wind. The Bill's automobile is going by. I think that was Kyle Petty and Gary Nelson talking, not NASCAR Control. They're obviously taking this very, very seriously. It was the wind of those high-speed automobiles that blew that sign loop on the back. Obviously, it was a safety consideration. They're joking about it now because they've solved the problem. they got a crew out there that's taking care of it. It would have been a much more serious matter a lap ago. We've got a couple of serious questions from uh, from viewers who have phoned in. Jerry Washer 
at uh, in Houghton, Louisiana, wants to know the status of Lake Speed. Uh, looking for a sponsor. Could you add anything to that, Phil? But Dave Lakes has got a, uh, a deal with Preston Antifreeze to run about seven races this year. He ran Charlotte, and I think he's going to be at, at Michigan next week. So that's what Lakes doing right now. He's got about a seven race deal with Preston again with his own car. Christian Brule of Cable Vision, Massachusetts, wants to know if the in-car camera adds any weight to the car. Well, it certainly adds the weight of responsibility, knowing that all you folks are uh, home watching. In terms of the physical weight, it is very, very minimal and not a factor. Let's listen in on one of the men carrying a camera today, Kyle Petty and Gary Nelson, his crew chief. Kyle Petty, Dave Despain in, uh, in the broadcast booth. Can you hear me? 10-4, I hear you, man. Giving us some great pictures today, and you're headed for the front. Are you comfortable with that? Uh, <laughs> are you comfortable with that race car? Yeah, the car's working pretty good right now. We just uh, I was asleep on that last restart and lost about five or six positions, so I'm gonna have to wake up a little bit, I guess. We were wondering what happened to you there. You had the richest payday of the year when you won back at Rockingham. It's only $38,000 to win from the pole today. But I would suspect even coming from 14th, you'd be happy to win Pocono, wouldn't you? Uh, I didn't quite hear you. Broke up a little bit there towards the end. We're gonna let we're gonna let you get back to racing. I think I know the answer to that question. Good luck today. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Kyle Petty, and uh, we're working with Kyle and his crew chief, Gary Nelson. Gary was our analyst in the booth last year. He has gone back to work on the car that went out into the third race of this season, won nearly a quarter million dollar bonus from the uh, folks at Unical for winning that race from the pole. The other in-car camera today being carried by Rusty Wallace, perhaps uh, Phil Parsons. Do you have a question for Rusty? Rusty, this is Phil Parsons. How do you read me? Another car. That was better than the first time. The same gear we had in yesterday, right? Ten four. He's talking yeah. right now to his crew chief. We're eavesdropping on uh, Rusty and his crew chief now. Can you hear me on the Rusty, this is Bill Parsons. Can you read me? Hello. Rusty, this is Bill Parsons. Can you read me? Now I got you. Go ahead. How's the car doing, Rusty? The car's handling good. I'm just uh, trying to work my way up to the front right now. We're ten four. Have a good day. Okay. We've heard talk from the Wallace crew of uh, trying to tighten up that car that it's been a little loose, that they don't have the handling quite as good as they thought they did. Now they qualified badly because they had uh, a Charlotte motor, basically a leftover motor from the big week at Charlotte that uh, wasn't all that torquey and didn't work very well off the tight corners here, but they figured no problem because it was handling very well. Well, the handle seems to have gone away a little bit here in the early laps today. When he was talking... When he was talking to his crew, he was talking about did they have the same gear in it that they had last time. So I think that's you know that's where they get that torque and where they get that is uh, is making sure they've got the right gear. Here are the drivers who have led a lap uh, thus far as we watch the proceedings continue. Urban has not been able to get back to the front since starting there. And a question from Kevin Connolly in Columbus, Ohio: Do all the cars have backup ignition in them? That perhaps prompted by the Dick Trickle problem, where the car uh, misfired off the start and they did have to change ignition. That's pretty standard. Isn't it? So I think so. Dave. Most every car here will have two ignitions. It's just an, uh, an insurance uh, program, and to, and to switch it, it doesn't even involve a pit stop or a no. Just just flip a switch is all it takes. Forty-one of two hundred laps are complete. We appreciate your question. We'll answer as many of them as possible today as we take a look at the leaderboard here. Alan Kowicki, 21st in the point standings, but the track record holder here is currently 6th on the racetrack and having a good day for a change. Derek Cope tickled to death to be at 7th. We're just about ready for the restart as they come off turn 3. After, as Pat Patterson alluded to earlier, Terry Labonte must have made two pit stops on, under the green because he's on the inside line, so that means he's one lap down. Butch Miller, who we thought was leading the race, also was a lap down. He's starting in front of Kyle Petty because he's technically on the tail end of the lead, on the lead lap. Here's the green flag, and they're back to racing. And the lap cars will get the jump on Kyle, who will emerge from this pit stop at the head of the class. Kyle Petty, the leader, as the new Winston Cup flagman, Day, uh, Doyle Ford, shows the green to the field. Harold Kinder healing up nicely. A long-time veteran flagman of NASCAR had knee surgery. He's already out of the plaster cast and into the lightweight cast, and Harold, we're confident you'll be doing the jitterbug in no time at all. Petty with two lap cars to deal with. Heads down the long pond straightaway and into the tunnel turn here at Pocono. As uh, 
he looks to the inside here. That's where he would like to make the pass. Doubtful that either of these guys will make way for him and give him that opportunity. Indeed, Labonte is trying to work his way around Miller. You're looking from the inside of the lead car being driven today by Kyle Petty. We mentioned the weight of responsibility that the in-car camera places. Obviously, Kyle is bearing up well under that weight today. He has come from 14th starting spot to lead the race just as we asked him to so that we could have some truck running pictures here today. Obviously, it's not that easy. Nobody moves over for the in-car camera or anybody else. And right now, Terry Labonte and Butch Miller are not about to give way, are they? There's no, there's no issue of sportsmanship involved here. They're out there racing for their position on the lead lap. Well, absolutely. They, they desperately want to stay in front of Kyle Petty and get a caution flag to get back in the lead lap because from one lap down, obviously, you can't even can't really hear it. Pocono have that good a finishing position. So they desperately need to stay in front of Kyle Petty or whoever may, the leader may be and try to stay get back in that lead lap. But he's obviously quicker than they are, and so it's really frustrating for him because it'll hold him up and the rest of the field will have a chance to come and run him down. So it's really important for Kyle, I think, to try to get by him and, and get out there. Well, that makes the point that it's a tough track to pass on, too. And he's trying, believe me, he's trying to get by him. But there, there he makes a move to the inside of Terry Labonte, so he should be able to get by Terry. There's a good battle back there. There's a camera from inside Kyle's car. There's Terry Labonte that he just passed in the Skull Classic Oldsmobile. That is the uh, bumper cam from Kyle Petty now showing the car, which he just worked his way around. The car driven by Terry Labonte, the defending race champion, though he did not win the race in that car. He won it a year ago. And Junior Johnson Thunderbird set out to form his own team, was not successful. I should say not completely successful in doing that. I think the decision was more a timetable decision than an abandoning of that plan. And uh, is now driving the Jackson Brothers Oldsmobile, which is a lap down here due to tire problems. So Petty, the leader, in fact, is able to put some distance between himself and the second place man. Ernie Irvin, who started this race from the pole, is back into second spot. And this is a commentary on the young drivers who are doing so well in Winston Cup racing in the, in the generation of the 90s. Already this year, six wins to drivers who did not have a victory at this point in the 1989 season, but they picked one up early in 1990. So you see the emergence of the likes of Kyle Petty and Brett Bodine and some of the other young men who I think are destined to be the stars. Dale Earnhardt on his bumper, and that, of course, is reminiscent of their classic battle in the Daytona 500 when Earnhardt fell victim to difficulty on the last lap, cut the tire in turn three, and saw what must be the greatest heartbreak in racing to lose the Daytona 500 less than a half lap from the finish line. Right now, Kyle Petty looking at what could be a great opportunity for him to win on national television, to carry that in car camera into victory lane, but I think in light of what we've seen here today, real early to feel very confident. Well, it really is, Dave. Kyle, I think Kyle's coming. He only got uh, gas on that last pit stop, so that's why he got the lead. But he, he's doing real well. Uh, the, the, he's got about four or five car lengths on the second place car, but I tell you, Butch Miller in the banquet car is running real well. But I, I really don't think he's holding Kyle Petty up that much because if he would have been, then the, then the second place car would have ran Kyle down and been, been all over him. But uh, as of yet, it hasn't happened. Butch is a little loose there, but Kyle didn't, uh, wasn't able to get the nose underneath him seize the opportunity here, but you're right, there's no traffic jam on Petty's bumper. Butch is doing real good. Let's follow this battle around for a way. Just after the yellow, they're going to have to pit again. 
Schrader going to the right side for tires and certainly an unscheduled affair. Richard Broom, the uh, team manager for that team, back in the fifth today after surgery on his back, and uh, they don't like this. He's got quite a bit of damage to the right rear of his car. He either got into another car or got up against the wall because uh, you can notice the quarter panel where they're trying to beat the fender out to give the tire clearance. But Schrader got either into another car or into the wall. So he, they need to hurry because the uh, field's rapidly approaching turn three right now. There you can see it, and uh, it'd be pretty difficult right here from our point to uh, speculate, but perhaps the guys in the truck could give us a look at, at what happened here, and perhaps we can go back and reconstruct the incident. Here is Kenny Schrader coming out of the corner, and there is the bump, and I'll bet that's going to push it right up against the wall, and boom, it does. Davey Allison is involved, and also Mark Martin, who has not gotten a call here today. Martin has been back in the back, unable to march forward, but the difficulty in passing on the outside is exemplified right there. There was simply no, not room for him to do what he tried to do, which is go three wide. There really wasn't. Davey Allison, who he was going around the outside of, went to go around the outside of another car. I think Dave Marcus, and then that left no room for Ken Schrader. Let's go down to Pat Patterson and a report on Darrell Waltrip. Well, Dave, the problem earlier was the push on the car. Jeff Hammond is right here, the crew chief. Jeff, uh, you had a little push there before the first caution flag. Have you got it fixed? Well, it's not fixed. It's just getting it better. We had the rear tire closed up about a half inch and really had us kind of messed up. And we made a minor chassis adjustment. It didn't really help us there. But, you know, we got a long ways to go. We're just trying to be patient and not get too far behind. Thank goodness it's a big racetrack. We'll just keep working on it. We've worked on the stagger now. We'll make another chassis adjustment here next time in, and hopefully we'll get back to the hunt. Okay, that's Jeff Hammond, and we thank him for the interview. We thank all of the race fans for their calls for free. Darrell Walton's problems here this afternoon, and one of the great things about a pay-per-view broadcast is if you can ask the questions, we'll get to the answer. Very much frustrated this year. Waltrip is uh, was a frustrated driver. He's not been able to do the things that he expected to be able to do in the 1990 season. He's currently 18th here on this racetrack today. And we talked to him about the possibilities that he might be able to turn that around here today at Pocono, where he's run well in the past. We think so. We're, we're pumped. Uh, we've been kicked around, like I said, for uh, quite a few weeks now. And uh, this is the best car I've had since Charlotte. That was a great car headed Charlotte. Didn't get to show it. Uh, we're ready to go here to Sunday. We need a win. I, I tell you, I can still win the championship. I've been this far behind a number of times and, and fought back and won. I feel like I got the team and the car, and I know I'm the driver that can win every race that we go to from here on out. And if I could just win a couple and then get back to the short tracks, I got a chance. Well, he won't get back to the short tracks for a while. This series will stay on these big race tracks, the two mile or more race tracks from now all the way into August, so we won't be back in Darrell Waltrip's stomping grounds for a while. Waltrip has run well this season. They've been plagued by a lot of problems. They crashed at Talladega, had a fuel pressure problem at Dover, which is kind of a weird thing that they didn't actually find the solution to until they got here at uh, Pocono, and a rear end gear broke at, uh, at Sears Point. Now, to get the latest on the problems of a companion car in that stable, Kenny Schrader's machine in a team plagued by bad luck. Well, Phil Parsons, what do you think? To me, this looks like brake rotor. It came out of Kenny Schrader's car. For sure, he's got problems with the front end of that car. They say the front end has been knocked out of alignment. They're not going to come in again until there's a yellow flag. Boy, they sure didn't need this. The car was running very well, but they've really got their problems right now. I'll tell you, that did look like brake rotors. It really did. Uh, but I'll tell you, Kenny's, there's no way you can run faster around this racetrack without, without good brakes. So. Well, uh, only time will tell. We'll see how fast the leaders are catching him. He's right now. He's about the a half the length of the long pond straightaway ahead of the leaders, and we'll see how quick they catch him. If uh, if he if he has a brake problem, they're going to catch him fairly quick. That is a beat up race car. It has damage on the right rear from the wall. It has damage all down the left side from contact with Davy Allison. This is the story up front, and now we see the traffic jam beginning to form. Butch Miller, a lap down, is still ahead of Kyle Petty and perhaps indeed now slowing Kyle's pace a little because Ernie Irvin, who started this race on the pole, comes knocking at the door and figures that he want to get, wants to get back to the head of the class. The leader is Petty, and he has led 11 of 52 laps in this spring right here at an average speed of 132 and a half miles an hour. That is nowhere near the race record if we did run one race here at uh, something in the range of 150 miles an hour with only one yellow 
yellow flag. So here we've had two cautions, a total of six laps, no major incidents. We hear that Morgan Shepard will be coming on pit road. There have been six leaders, six lead changes, 32 cars on the lead lap, only one dropout thus far. And indeed, there is Morgan Shepard, who, as of two weeks ago, was the series point leader. Here today, overshoots his pit for a moment. They quickly move up into position. They're going to have to back the car up. No, they'll just change pits in their neighbor, uh, change tires in their neighbor's pit and go to left side rubber that will put them out of sync here, Phil. It looks like Morgan has a little damage to the right rear of the car, although that's not the problem. They're changing the left side tires. While we were talking about Kyle Petty leading the race, he is now back in the third position. Ernie Irvin and Jeff O'Dine got by him, so Kyle is back to third. A slip for Petty during that race summary and subsequent pit stop for Morgan Shepard. Shepard, who slipped the second in the standings after his engine blew at Sears Point last week and ended a string of 11 consecutive, actually it was 12 consecutive top 10 finishes for Morgan, one last year in another car and 11 in a row this year in Bud Moore's car. Now you're back up front where Ernie Irvan has indeed retaken the lead just behind the tail end of the lead lap car driven by number 98, Butch Miller. The second place car is the number 11, the Junior Johnson Thunderbird, driven here by the former winner and Pocono veteran Jeff Bodine, the first trek to this racetrack back in 1969. Not all that far a hop from Chemung, New York, where he cut his racing teeth. He's driven modifieds here. He's raced USAC stock cars here many years ago. And now he's here in a Winston Cup car to try, try to claim his second track victory in uh, this division. And occasional glimpses of Kyle Petty, who has indeed slipped from first to third. There's a good view of how they actually stick the tires down in the grass. And how did Daryl say it? Uh, throw rocks on Rusty, throw rocks on Dale, you know, get off my tail. Well, that's what you want to try to do coming out of that corner, and it's tough, as I'll, you can see. I'll tell you, when we talk about Rusty Wallace and really hasn't done much, of there he is right there in that lead pack, so Rusty's got his act together right now. And Ernie Irving goes down to try to put Butch Miller a lot down. Here's the battle now, tight competition, Miller in the middle of it. Looked like they might have touched a moment as Bodine stuck the nose under the lap car of Miller. Irvan says, here's my opportunity. He makes the break. Miller grabs hold of him and says, I don't want to give up that lap. Bodine comes pressuring back under braking as they hammer down into the tunnel turn. Good racing at Pocono, and the scramble behind them finds Kyle Petty under pressure from the number seven. Alan Kowicki will move up a spot. Derek Cope's going to try to go with him, slicing inside Rusty Wallace, scrambling for positions at Pocono. Good stuff here. Some of the best racing of the day as we look from the inside of Kyle Petty's automobile at the challenge he's getting from Alan Kowicki. Kowicki was not able to complete the pass, even though he had the inside of the racetrack. They will take him all the way back down to turn number one. So Wicky certainly has position, but apparently not to drive off the corner field. But, but he still had a position when they got to turn one, so he was in, he was able to get by Kyle because he had that optimal line the inside. And he also took Derek Hope and Rusty Wallace with him. And look what happens to Kyle. He was third, and now he is sixth as they uh, all go streaming by on the inside. The look from uh, the Wallace automobile shows the tail of Derek Cope off the head. I think Cope's for real. We all found that out of Dover, didn't we? Everybody said after Daytona, well, that might have been a fluke. You know, that was Dale's race to win. I think Derek Cope proved himself a Winston Cup uh, driver in every sense of the word at Dover, which is a tough place to win. Well, he definitely did, Dave, but I didn't think Daytona was a fluke. I mean, yeah, Earnhardt was probably going to win the race if he didn't have a flat tire, but Derek ran well all day long. He was second right on Earnhardt's bumper, so I don't think it was a fluke. It certainly would not have been a fluke for him to finish second. There's no doubt about that. He drove his heart out in that race, and Buddy Perrin the crew did a great job. Now you're inside Kyle Petty's car, and a view that he has seen regularly throughout the day as Greg Sack continues to truck along just ahead of Kyle Petty. Kyle's got himself in the middle of a dogfight, and what did look like a pretty good run has suddenly become problematic, and I wonder, Phil, if they're not paying a penalty here for what they gained earlier. Don't I recall that they uh, didn't take on any tires before when they stopped? Might that be the, the price of that now? I think so, but I, I overheard Gary Nelson and Kyle talking, and they wanted to get out and lead a little bit, and that's what they did. You know, That's what it's all about, to get the exposure for their sponsor, Peak. They led some, and they're still not in bad shape, and uh, they'll have another caution flag or another pit stop to get the tires on. And again, as we talked earlier, they may have been wanting to see what no tires would do to the speed of the car. There's time for experimentation early in a three-and-a-half-hour race. Let's go down to Pat Patterson and find out about the Morgan Shepard problem. Greg Moore, Morgan was just in a second ago. He had a problem. We noticed, uh, Dave, and, and the guys upstairs noticed there was a little bit of damage to the right side. What exactly happened? They could have gotten together with a car over there, but the basic problem was that the left rear 
cut down and started tearing up, and, and that done some damage on the left side. But, you know, Pocono's a big racetrack, and uh, it's hard to get a lap down just some of these changes, too, so I think we'll be all right. Okay, that's Greg Moore. He is the engine builder and son of Bud Moore, and that's Morgan Shepard's story. I don't think you'll ever find a pessimist uh, 58 laps into a 200-lap race. Everybody still thinks they've got a shot at winning the race, even if the wheels are falling off the race car and the fenders are all bashed in. And, Lynn, I think that's really a fundamental part of the race driver mentality. If you ever think you're beat, you're beat. Boy, that is the truth. I mean, even when you're driving a car that's not, you know, it's broken, a car that's just been crashed, you still think you get it back to the pits. With, you know, you, the adrenaline, the, the ego, the drive, the commitment for what you're doing is so intense that you never want to give up. Because it's, I remember the first time I ever crashed, I sat in the car, which was totally demolished, and yet I wanted to get back that. I tried to crank it again, restart it, get it back to the pits. So it's very, very intense. Watching the battle for the lead here as Ernie Irvan drags Jeff Bodine around this place. Just a minute, Phil. I got one more question. I think she tried to dodge the issue here. She's talking about the first time she crashed. I want to know about the last time she crashed. What'd you do yesterday, anyway? Well, I got uh, in with Dick Danielson uh, about nine laps left, and uh, we didn't both make it through the corner. We both could have made it through the corner, but we didn't. So uh, just going for it is all I was doing. This was the Trans Am race in Detroit. You had a shot at a good finish. What if is, a, is an old, old story, but uh, you had a shot at doing real well. Well, right? I was running the top ten, and knowing that it saved my tires, it was really my race at that point that I had exactly planned, and that's the way everybody did, but uh, at the very end, they had to red flag the race, so we ended up about five of the top uh, ten contenders went out with crashes, and so it was a lot of melee. I could have finished well. Who won? Um, Scott Sharp won. So first win for Scott Sharp. There's a good race for third position right now between Alan Kowicki in the seventh car and Rusty Wallace in the 27th. You've got Derek Cope and Greg Sachs also thrown in there, so Kowicki could lose three spots in this little exchange. We talk about the inside line. The inside line is critical through the corners. The fast way around all three corners is right down hugging the bottom of the racetrack. You won't see anybody up on that Richard Petty rail riding around the wall at Pocono. But, boy, when they get to the front straightaway, they can stack them up five, six, seven, eight wide. I tell you, we have uh, some video from Rusty Wallace's car when Alan Kowicki and Kyle Petty were racing. Let's take a look at that. Right now, you see Alan Kowicki on the inside and Kyle Petty on the outside. And Alan Kowicki slides up a little bit right next to Kyle and then moves away to try to try to break away from him so he can get some clean air. And that was a textbook move by, by Alan Kowicki. And now he's, he'll probably, when he got to the corner, he was going to make his way back out towards Kyle so he can have a good angle into the turn. That's what's tough is that if you're on the inside, which is where you want to be, but if there's a row on the outside and working together, This is the race for the lead. We have viewer questions coming in from all over America. We invite your calls on our 800 number, 1-800-522-RACE is the number to call. 1-800-522-RACE, R-A-C-E. As we watch the youngster Ernie Irvan and the veteran Jeff Bodine do battle, the question, how many laps can they go on one tank of fuel? I'll throw some of these technical things at Phil Parsons. Phil, what's your range here? About 40 laps, Dave, about 100 miles. Uh, some, you know, within two, three, four laps of that, uh, is usually what they can run. Here's the battle for third that continues to be a good one as uh, we see Alan Kowicki marking progress there and doing battle with Rusty Wallace, who's now opened up a little bit of a, cell of, uh, second, hmm, a separation. Wallace is your third-place car, and Kowicki is fourth. And right behind him comes Derek Cope, who's now running fifth. We're going to be taking a look at that complete leaderboard. Sixth-place man now is Greg Sachs. Here is the running order. As the poles that are getting back to the front been an up and down roller coaster kind of a Father's Day for Ernie Irvine. He's got Jeff Bodine to contend with and has had all afternoon long. Wallace has finally found his strength, found his legs in that car, which started well downfield today. He was 24th on the grid. Alan Colwicki now fourth and Derek Cope fifth. We'll take a little further back in the rundown while I ask uh, Phil Parsons how many tires on average, the leading cars might use in a race. Dave Burgess wonders about that. It really depends on how many caution flags. You know, every time the caution flag comes out, most of the drivers come in and take uh, take on tires. But uh, as many as 40 or 50, really, if there's a lot of caution flags in this track, that's real critical on tires. A couple of uh, brake questions here. Why don't the Winston Cup stock cars use brake lights? Well, I don't think they need them. Road racing, you'll see brake lights, though, Lynn. Yes, it's, the... it's mandatory. In fact, we have to. But they'll actually black flag you bring in if you don't have brake lights. Let me toss it out to both of you. What's the difference? Why do you need uh, brake lights on a road racing car and not on an oval track car, Phil? 
Well, I, I, they've never done it. It's the biggest reason they've never had brake line. <laughs> Here's Ken Schrader back in the pit, so uh, we'll see if he can get his car stopped. If, if he lost his rear, if he has a broken brake rotor on the rear, he still has front brakes, so it's not like he doesn't have any brakes at all. But but I was just noticing while we were giving the leaderboard that he got passed by the leader, so he got a lap down, and I guess they felt like they better come in and change things and try to get the car fixed. He came in very cautiously. He wasn't aggressive on the pit road, which would indicate the brake problem. Or here you see a flat tire. This has not been Kenny Schrader's day. This has not been Rick Hendrick's year. Rick Hendrick owns three cars out here. This is one of them. They have yet to win a race. They are 0 for 36 if you count the official team cars. That, of course, would be uh, Ricky Rudd, Kenny Schrader here, and Darrell Walter. None of them have won a race this year. And they've also fielded the part-time car of number 18, Greg Saxon. He, too, has yet to win a race. Saxon's in the middle of this pack, and it's a good one. As Kyle Petty tucks in behind him, they've got Derek Cope down on the inside. And that is a wholesale scramble for fifth, sixth, and seventh positions as they peel off towards turn number one. Good racing for position here. Not a lot of lead changes in this race by Pocono standards or by Winston Cup standards, but great races for position. There's Dale Earnhardt showing his nose to Derek Cope. Cope becoming familiar with that view here. As he's raced with Earnhardt as much as anybody this season. You're seeing it from Kyle Petty's bumper camp as Kyle leads that battle down the backstretch, currently running in the uh, fifth spot. I tell you, Kyle's still doing a heck of a job knowing the fact that he didn't get tires on that last caution flag. So, uh, I think Gary Nelson and Kyle Petty learned something from that, and uh, it may really come in handy late in the race. I got a question here that I'm going to throw out to everybody and uh, maybe give you all a minute to think about it because I'm sure everybody's got an opinion, and I know every fan in the country's got an opinion. Berger and Patterson, we don't want to get you in on this. Why does the NASCAR circuit seem to be so General Motors oriented? Rule changes seem to favor the GM car over the Ford, and Carl Madison and Joplin, Missouri wants to know why that is. And anytime anybody's got an opinion, feel free to pipe right in on what may be the oldest question in American motorsports. Here is the leader. We'll reset it for you as Ernie Irvine leads Bodine down the backstretch interval, perhaps a car length there as uh, Bodine seems for the moment content to just follow Ernie Irvine and check him out and think about what may be coming well down into the race. We are 65 laps into a 200 lapper here, so there's still a long way to go. Let's get more on the Kenny Schrader story from Dick Berger. Dick? finished second. He's not doing so well today. You're seeing a picture of a brake rotor. They're going to have to change the right front brake rotor on Schrader's car just to make sure they got the right one. Right now they got six brake rotors out here. Now this car's only got four wheels, four brake rotors, but they got six of them. At some point, sure enough, Schrader's going to come in and they're going to have to take an extended pit stop. I'm going off of the one on. He's having a terrible day. Much more fun last night. Talked to Kenny Schrader yesterday as we go inside Rusty Wallace's car about the trip back from uh, from Sears Point. He took the red eye. He said, uh, no, nah, I want to get back. And uh, I had three races to run this week. That's, of course, the Schrader style. And I don't like hanging around on the West Coast and getting on the plane Monday morning because then you lose the whole day. I'd rather get on that red eye and head for home. He is a racing fool, I'll tell you. Rusty Wallace, here is his march through the field. On lap 15, he was 17th from 20. Fourth starting spot by the 40th lap. He'd only moved up three more positions, but then the big surge in that last uh, green flag run. He came all the way to sixth. That has been better than that momentarily. Has been as high as third in the race. And there's that concentration we talked about as he hunkers down under the field, uh, under the wheel. The battle up front as Bodine comes up and perhaps uh, feels it's time to test Ernie Irvine a little. I'll tell you, Dave, I'm going to let that answer Carl's question. That's a GM car leading a Ford car. And they look pretty equal right now. So I'm going I'm to let that be my answer on that question. Well, being a Ford driver, I'm not going to let that one go. But I think that uh, not only in NASCAR, but all of the um, I've raced at SCCA, I've raced at IMSA, it's a struggle because the sanctioning bodies have pressure from all the manufacturers, and GM has been around forever. They've been there. They've under the table, over the table. They've always been a supporter of racing, and I think Ford, because they or will always be punished because they pulled out and were out of it for 10 years, and so they, they're having to pay some dues or pay some penalties because of it. Um, but I think the sanctioning bodies truly try to make it fair, but there's always that price that I think Ford is going to have to pay for not being there in the, in the downturn. Did I hear the word punished come from the lips of this woman who doesn't have to face the NASCAR officials next Sunday afternoon? <laughs> you think that indeed GM does get 
favorable treatment then, perhaps. I think when push comes to shove sometimes, it, it, it happens. I mean, I, I don't think it's an intentional, we're just going to, you know, keep favoring GM, keep favoring GM. I, I said they try to be fair, they try to make it, because what they all the sanctioning bodies want is competitive racing. They want to have a show out there. So I think that's the prime thing. Here is Davey Allison coming on pit road. Uh, one final footnote on that. I think that uh, when you have a favorite brand of car, as everybody who sits in the Winston Cup grandstand certainly does, your conclusion is always that your guy's not getting a fair shake and the other guy's getting a better deal. Let's go down to pit road. It is a busy place right now. Davey Allison has just made an unscheduled pit stop for a flat right front tire. The pit immediately in front of him is Mark Martin's pit, and Mark Martin's crew is ready as well with tires. These are not scheduled pit stops too early for that. Martin's guys ready, sort of. Don't know if he's coming in or not. They're sort of ready for him. We'll have to see. Not a good day for Mark Martin at all. Mark Martin really wanted to assert himself today. He felt very confident. He thought that this was a team that would win this race today. But now, as Irvin and Bo Dine pull away and put half a straightaway on the third-place man, Wallace, the fourth-place man, Petty, and the fifth-place man, Cope, Mark Martin has not appeared in the top ten very consistently all day long. And one final comment on that rule situation. I'm recalling 1985. Here's Martin, indeed, on pit road. Perhaps Dick Bergman can update that. Let's go back to Dick. Yeah, Mark Martin really overshot his pit. Steve Neal, the crew chief, fell down. He was not struck by the car, but he did fall down. Martin is a full pit away from where he's supposed to be right now. Changing tires on the car. They're going to do all four. Apparently, he thought, too, he had them. Oh, and there's a yellow flag. Worst possible thing that could happen. If he could have held out one more lap, he could have done this without penalty. And everybody's going by him. I'll tell you, Dick, it's really the best thing that happened to Mark Martin. He got four tires and a full tank of fuel. So when everyone else comes in the pit, he won't have to. So he will most likely be the leader of the race when they reach time. Now we'll see if that works out that way. And indeed, it appears that it should, because as he retakes his position out on the racetrack, the leaders will be coming by. They have now taken the caution and will pit the next time by. See the two and one signs there in your picture? You got just a glimpse of those. We had a question from uh, Tim Top, who's watching on Dimension Cable. I'm going to get to that in a moment. Let's eavesdrop on Kyle. Play. Okay, we got a good tire. Uh, four tires this time. Back, so he'll be coming in and pulling in front of us, so leave some room to get out. Those are the pace lap instructions. Important, important. And that is Kyle acknowledging that he got that message, which uh, not only included the information on what they would be doing on the stop, but also the potential problem that Nelson recognized, which was the car that will be pitting in front of him. Okay, the pace sure car's got him picked up now making sure that Kyle had room to get out. The Come in fast, Kyle. The reason for the yellow, yesterday's winner here, Jimmy Horton, has stopped on the racetrack, undefeated in ARCA, Automobile Racing Club of America, Super Speedway races. This is not Jimmy Horton's day in Winston Cup, a young man who is destined, I think, to make hey, it more. coming at you. Listening to Kyle and his crew, one-time leader and now fourth-place man in this race, makes his way to pit road. We'll keep listening. So if you hear the camera on Gary Nelson's helmet, actually, watching the pit stop of Kyle Petty. We'll listen and see if we hear the instruction for him to leave the pit. Keep listening. Here's Nelson going to the, pick up the tire, retrieves the tire, gets it back over the pit wall. Go, go, go. Go, go, go. And that is the instruction. And there is Kyle Pitt. Check in the mirror. Nelson looking on. He got that 26, Kyle. Uh, he made me to the line at the end of the road, Gary. Okay. What they're talking about right now, Dave, is there's a line at the end of pit road, and how you come, come go across that line is where you will line up on the restart. Gary thought that Brett Bodine in the Quaker State car beat uh, that Kyle beat him on the line, but Kyle said, no, he beat me, so he will line up behind Brett Bodine. By the way, when he sticks his hand out the window, that's just to be able to grab some air to help cool down. You know, he gets hot in there. In fact, you can see he's working on his uh, balaclava in there, but it's just to get that air to come in. I've also watched him put his, yeah, he puts his right hand. Dave, who was that stop on the and, back, uh, Get some cool air through the, uh, the tunnel there. The 80 car. It was the 80 car. Let's go to Pat Patterson with Gary Nelson. 
who beat who out of the pitch. We heard you on the race for radios talking about who beat who down there. It looked like a pretty good stop, you guys. We had a real close call with the 26 car. They're having some really good stops. Um, I think they got us, though, right at the line. There's a line right at the end of Pitt Road, and uh, there's a man standing there. We were doing probably 50 miles an hour and the 26 was doing probably 80 so it's close for that guy to call it but i think the 26 got it i know that when that car comes down off the jacks and hum someone hollers go 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 i know the one thing that you're looking for more than anything else is that kyle hugs that line and doesn't get a little bit further out in that pit road where you've got some cars that were coming behind you that were coming awfully quick oh you're right you know it's it's tough in these situations with the field sprung out like they are because some people are still coming into the pits when we're trying to go out and it's it's really the drivers i don't see how they do it i know how hard it is for me to get on the freeway every morning so <laughs> i can imagine what this is like how about uh, how about the track uh, position right now for you guys you feel good about where you're at as far as the tires go and and electing to do the two tire change everything feels good uh you know for us to be able to just get gas only on the last stop and still stay out there and lead 10 laps under green uh when the other guys had four new tires that tells us we're going to be a force for this whole race you know when we have equal tires with the other cars we're really going to do good okay gentlemen one lap to go we'll be back at it here at pocono back up to dave Gee, I'm glad we hired Phil Parsons today. Wasn't that exactly what you said, that they were checking their situation to make sure that they could be, to see if they could be fast on old tires? Sure, right? and, they, and, they, and they really were. So I think I agree with Gary totally. When, when they're on equal tires, they're going to be very strong. And I think you also predicted that Mark Martin would lead this race when we went back to green, and that's exactly where he is. Let's go to Dick Bergman with a report on Dale Earnhardt. Well, Dale Earnhardt's pit stop big one, David. They adjusted the car in two ways. The thing has been a little loose in some parts of the racetrack and a little tight in other parts, so they tried to fix the whole thing. Most importantly, everybody's wondering how Earnhardt's feeling. Richard Childress told me he's not feeling any worse. He's not feeling any better either. He looks all right in the car, didn't even take a drink. He just looked right straight ahead. As soon as the car dropped off, he went. Typical Earnhardt. Tough, tough guy. Well, tough indeed. This bug that uh, has bitten Earnhardt and indeed several members of his crew today is uh, is pretty nasty and a couple of members of our uh, of our television crew have come down with it as well it's a it's a stomach problem and an upper respiratory problem all at once and i can't imagine what it must be like to drive a race car feeling like that i'll tell you when, when dale Earnhardt gets a sniff of the lead he'll feel a lot better today <laughs> believe me it'll be, be a great cure martin just outside the number one of last year's winner terry labonte emerges as the leader a fortuitous yellow flag while Martin was in the pit indeed let him get out with fresh tires and a full tank of fuel. Everyone else pitted behind him and Mark cruised around and said, I'll show those TV guys who haven't given me a call all day. I'm going to put this Jack Roush Ford right up at the front of this field. I'm going to be interested to see whether he can keep it there because that has not appeared to me to be a real strong car all day. You heard a go, go, go command in the background. That's a sponsor, or I should say a spotter, telling the drivers, green is out, get on the gas. We're racing again at Pocono. It's another good opportunity for Terry Labonte to try to get his lap back, but Mark Martin beat him down in turn one. But Mark has Jeff O'Donnell in his rear bumper, who has been strong all day, so like we'll see how good Mark Martin is. This will be a good test right here for Martin and the team. They have not been a top ten car. We're inside Kyle Petty's car as we look back and uh, see, I believe that is uh, Ernie Irvin. That's Irvin, yeah, the pole sitter with the Kodak car familiar ride for Phil Parsons who started the season in that machine and a good opportunity for me to ask when we'll see Phil Parsons back out on the racetrack. Uh, next week in the Gary Bechtel Pontiac at uh, Michigan. We're really looking forward to it. Uh, really, really glad to be involved with him and hopefully we can run some races this year and, and go on. Bodine has been strong on the brakes all day. That time Mark Martin outbraked him into turn three here, the final corner on the racetrack. Road racing maneuver, Lynn. Wait for late braking. He really did uh, push Mark high, though. Mark was a lot higher there than I think he wanted to be, and where it's hurting him is right now at the end of the straightaway. He made it through the corner okay, but because he rode high, he was not able to carry as much speed, and, and I think it's going to hurt him at the end of the straight. We'll go inside the third-place car of Rusty Wallace, who finds himself in a traffic jam. The man directly in front of him is last year's winner of the race in the Junior Johnson Thunderbird, Terry Labonte, picked up his 10th career victory here at Pocono. I should say his ninth career victory here at Pocono a year ago today, Father's Day. And now for today, he has been struggling. Two early pit stops for a tire problem got him all out of whack, and he is a lap down running behind the second place car and directly in front of Rusty Wallace, who will try to pass now as he goes outside, makes the move, and gets by easily. You know, he just moved over and let him go by because, again, the leader, Rusty's running third right now, so that would have hurt him real bad if he'd gotten behind him. 
see if we can eavesdrop a little, see if Rusty Wallace is talking with his crew at all. Take a lap around Pocono with Rusty Wallace. All he needs to think about right there was the Bodine car directly in front of him. And I would say Barry Dodson is probably pretty happy to just let Jeff do his work here. You saw Jeff Bodine look to the inside of Mark Martin, and Mark uh, saw that in his mirror, and he moved over to make sure Jeff didn't have any room. Good view of some classic mirror driving as Wallace watches all this and says, I'm going to stay two lengths back and just wait and see how this unfolds. The fact that Rusty and Barry are not talking, I think, means that Rusty's car is pretty good and he feels good about it. These are the top three cars. Wallace looking pretty good as he closes in on Bodine. Martin, the leader for the first time today. Brett Bodine, fourth. They'd like to make it a family finish inside the top five. Kyle Petty has been everywhere from 14th to 1st today and is now somewhere in between. He is the 5th place car as we approach the midway point in this race. 75 of 200 laps complete with this rundown and this the Miller Genuine Draft 500 at Pocono. Beautiful day, no threat of rain here today. Hazy, overcast, and hot. It's well up into the 80s now and uh, high humidity. The weather, at least, is very much like these guys are used to down in the southeast. Dive to the inside. Bodine takes Martin with comparative ease going right into the tunnel turn. Scary place to pass, Phil? Well, it really is, and, and I think Mark Martin backed off to let Jeff Bodine go. He, he knew he had position on him, so there's no sense racing through there side by side because you virtually cannot make it through there. So Mark saw that Jeff had position, had momentum. He just let him go. No sense. It's definitely not the place that you want to contest uh, the position when you've got that much race still to go. Dick Bergman, let's let you in on this uh, Mark Martin discussion. Well, I want to tell you a little bit, David, about what their future plans are. A lot of people are watching Mark Martin. In fact, so much so that Steve Meal told me yesterday that four, count them, four sponsors want him to run a second car next year. Not automotive sponsors, diapers, paper towels, aspirin, things like that. They probably will run a second car in a few weeks, giving Robbie Gordon the drive. If they can find a good racer for next year, maybe, just maybe, they will run a second team. They've got the cars, they've certainly got the motor program, they've got the truck. I think job applications are being accepted at the Jack Roush Racing Team for team number two for 1991. It's a maybe, very much a maybe at if, this point. If Robbie Gordon's name is already in the hat, I don't know that I'd bother sending in my resume, Lynn. I'll send my resume in for sure, I've, uh, <laughs> and I can tell you that it's not a maybe. I mean, I know that Jack really wants to expand the program. I mentioned about teamwork earlier and how some hooking up and run stronger, and it really does happen. If you can run with a teammate, and sometimes it's, uh, somebody else on the racetrack isn't around the same team, but when you hook up together, you can run better, and Jack feels that he can have a much stronger program if he has more than one car running. Jerry Washer uh, called in, not with a question, but with a comment to Lynn St. James. I'd like to see more of her uh, in Winston Cup racing. So go ahead and send in that resume to your former boss, Jack, and uh, perhaps get done. the job. Consider it done. <laughs> this is the battle for seventh position as we mark uh, the progress of Dale Earnhardt fighting the bug and Kyle Petty carrying one of our in-car cameras today. It is the battle for seventh, and Alan Kulwicki comes up to join that battle, and the caution flag is going to fly as Robbie Moroso skates down off the racetrack onto the apron, didn't hit anything, gets it back up and underway. Moroso, the rookie, will bring out the, is that the fourth or fifth caution of the day? We'll double check that as Bodine brings the field back around as the leaders race back to the caution flag. Don't believe there'll be any challenge for position there, and now the leaders are under caution. Mark Martin second, and Rusty Wallace is third, and let's uh, give a listen now and see what kind of conversations Wallace will have under the yellow. Five green laps, Rusty. Let's see what they do. That's all. What, what Barry was talking about, he said, listen, do what they do. That means if the leaders come in, they're going to come in. If the leaders stay out, they're going to stay out. Point is, they just had a caution. They don't need a pit stop. They've only run five green flag laps, as we heard Bust, uh, Barry Dawson say. So I think uh, what, what Jeff O'Dine and Mark Martin do, that's what we're going to do. We're going to be pretty quick. Tim, Paul, Rob, Barroso, spun down there. He just went by. That's going to be a couple laps to win, There's water and shit all over the track down in turn one and two. Update on the track conditions from Rusty Wallace as he lets Bud know the approximate time of the stop, the duration of the yellow, 
is the issue there because, again, Dawson may want to rethink strategy. If he knows he's got a couple laps and needs a chassis change or something, they might elect to give up track position to do some work here. But I don't think a couple of laps will make that much difference to them, and uh, we'll see. If they change strategy, perhaps we'll be able to overhear it. Meanwhile, Wallace trying to shake himself loose there and get ready to go back to green. Let's go to uh, Pat Patterson and find out what happened to Rob Moroso. Well, Dave, exactly what the uh, crew chief said. Now, Jake Elder is the crew chief on this car, and Jake is uh, waiting on his driver to get the car back in, Rob Moroso, the Crown Igloo Oldsmobile. And uh, apparently what the story is is he got a little bumped. He got bumped. Uh, you don't get a little bumped, out of, get, do you, Phil Parsons? You get a lot bumped. And uh, that's what he said. He said he got bumped out there, and he spun the car around, and uh, they're waiting on him right now. NASCAR should have opened up the pits as most of the leaders should be headed back towards uh, the entrance to pit road right now. So we'll kind of... Stay with it for a second, give you guys a chance to rest for a second and watch uh, this pit stop for Rob Moroso. Now, Rob Moroso is running for the 1990 Rookie of the Year crown. And uh, since there's not been a lot of competition, Moroso is pretty much a shoe-in with it right now. However, he's got to learn how to make some good pit stops, and uh, Jake Elder is certainly the guy that can do that. Now, you can see by the uh, left side of the car that uh, there's some black tire marks on the car. The team is working on the right side. Also got crunched a little bit around on the uh, right side of the car. They'll change both the uh, right side tires. Now the crew is around and waiting for the jack to get the car up so they can get the old tires off, get the new tires on, and uh, two more Goodyear Eagles go on the left side of the car. So the car sounds like a little bit. It did not sound that uh, that well, but Rob Moroso nevertheless is down and gone. Let's we'll take a look at those rookie standings. Moroso is indeed the leader and expected to be the runaway winner of the uh, Rookie of the Year honors. That is the strongest program in that group that includes Jack Pennington, Jerry O'Neill, who brought out the first caution flag here today by parking down inside turn one, and Jeff Purvis, who uh, moved into fourth on the strength of a single run in a Winston Cup car this year. Moroso, certainly one of the bright young lights in the stock car racing horizon. Uh, very famous family name. His dad, a maker of speed parts for these cars for many years. Phil, what's it like racing with the rookies? There's always talk that, uh, you know, an eager young kid who wants to make his mark is somebody you kind of got to be careful with. Not specifically maybe about Moroso, but rookies in general. Do you find they're the kind of guys you'll mix it up with, or do you give them a little bit of a berth out there? You give them a little bit of room. Uh, once you get to know them, but see, I, most of the Winston Cup drivers also run Bush Grand National Series that Robbie was the champion of last year, so they got to run with him a lot in that series, so, so he was not an unknown. Uh, when he came into Winston Cup racing. So I think more, more people were comfortable with him because of the fact that he ran uh, the Bush Series and, and did so well. But some of the other people, like Jack Pennington, uh, the Winston Cup drivers don't know anything about him, so consequently they probably will give him a little extra room till they learn something about him and, and realize that, yeah, they can race with him, he does a good job, and then, then he'll be just, just like one of the guys. Here is Mark Martin's second place as we prepare to come back to green. They've got the signal, one lap to go. Let's see if we can check in with Mark. Mark Martin, this is Dave Despain in the television tower. Can you hear us? Yeah, Dave. Quick check, Mark. Took you a long time to get to the front. The caution flag helps you a lot. Is that a car? Are you driving a car that can win this race? We'll be real lucky to win this thing, uh, Dave. We're not, uh, not touched out right now, but we're hanging on real good. We're fighting tooth and nail. Uh, we'll see what we can do. I see you got a busted windshield there. We've got a good view of that from our turn one camera. What's the problem with the car, and is it something you can fix? Nothing we can fix, Dave. We just uh, keep digging here. Uh, keep our chins up, keep running hard, and uh, fight to the nail. We'll see if we can take the Folgers, Valvoline, Thunderbird to victory lane. It's never over till it's over. All right, we'll let you go back to work, buddy. That's Mark Martin, and I think that is probably the epitome of Mark Martin right there. The man, the man has been known to uh, to toss a cliche in the direction of the media before, but more than that, Mark Martin will absolutely not quit fighting. Back to what we talked about earlier in terms of attitude, this guy and this team will come at you with everything they've got as long as they've got it. His car's now working. He's not going to tell us why, but he says they're not going to quit. They have black flag. Mike Waltrip's car, apparently a uh, violation when they changed the carburetor down there. I'm not sure what that's all about. Perhaps we'll get an update from one of our pit reporters. Anyway, the car that started dead last today because of a crash and a move to a backup car is on pit road for what will be an extended stop. Martin will restart in second spot. Here you'll have a view of the rear of his car from uh, number 27, Rusty Wallace's viewpoint as we come back to green flag. 
Martin got to the top of the championship standings by doing just what he talked about, and that's digging and fighting and scratching and never giving up. The penalty for Michael Waltrip has been imposed, and he'll return to the track and probably can catch up with the field or very nearly catch up with the field before the yellow flies. Bill, you had a comment. Well, I think Michael Walter, the port we got was that he changed the carburetors and he forgot his air cleaner. What happened was they changed the carburetor, didn't have enough time to put the air cleaner on. So he went back out and came back in to put the air cleaner on. And right now he's in the lead lap. He's about probably two-thirds of a lap down, but at least he is still in the lead lap. He was not able to catch up the field as we go back to green. Bodine is your leader. Lap 83 is underway. Let's see who makes the move. They go five, six wide in typical Pocono restart style. And Bodine will lead them back into turn number one. You begin to think of Jeff Bodine as perhaps the most consistent guy here today. He's been a front runner all afternoon. Terry LaFonte, for being a lap down with his tire problem, has certainly managed to keep his sponsor happy with television performance today. He goes inside Mark Martin and takes him three wide. And Rusty Wallace says, I can do it too. And that is exciting stuff as Wallace dives to the inside, follows Levante through, brings Martin with him, and we've got a crash at the top of the tunnel turn, and that's going to stack up the field right behind them. A Ricky tangle Rudd. at the back of the tunnel turn drops Ricky Rudd to the inside of the racetrack, and that very nearly took out a whole bunch of front-running cars. I'll tell you, I'm not sure that that move we saw by Rusty uh, might not have indirectly caused that caution flag. Terry Labonte beat Rusty Wallace back to the line, so he is now back in the lead lap. That's an excellent bit of strategy for Labonte, and you could very well be right. When they tried to stack them three wide down the backstretch and into that tunnel turn, it took away a lot of racing room for the people behind them, and while we didn't see any contact among that trio, it was directly behind that incident that it all took place. Now, Labonte rushing back around to perhaps get service, perhaps not. They've just pitted. He probably doesn't need anything. He'll run right back around, get on the tail end of the field. He'll be ready to go racing with what is obviously a pretty good car here today, Phil. He's run with the leaders all day. That's right. He really has run pretty well. They have an equalized tire, and we had to make two pit stops to find it on the on the green flag, and I got him a lap down. But uh, right now, he's back in the hunt, and anything can happen. If this guy is able to, uh, to get back through the field and rejoin those leaders on the same lap, Here's the replay. See if you can see what happens. So that's just going to be the tail end of it, isn't it? Yeah. Can't really see it. It looked like uh, the, the way Ricky Rudd's front end looks, it looks like somebody, because of the three wide situation through the tunnel turn, which you can't hardly put two cars in there, looked like somebody must have seized up. It looked like Ricky drove just drove underneath. Him. That car's pretty well splattered, too. Where would all that oil have come from? Any speculation on that? He, he either, when he drove on him, he either broke his oil cooler. Or, or broke something else of somebody else's car that, that got looks like oil all over the hood. So uh, uh, the way he, it looks like he stopped, so it, it must be his own oil cooler because when it broke the oil cooler, he lost oil pressure and he probably shut the engine off. That's why he stalled right there. Yeah, I was going to say, if that's from somebody else's car, we'll know it real quick because there'll be a second car coming on pit road. So apparently that is Rudd's own oil that we're seeing on the front of the number five machine. Third place finisher a week ago thought he could win the race at Sears Point but had a tire misfortune late. The leaders have pitted. Wallace is on pit road, as is Mark Martin. Derek Cope has come in. Ernie Irvin has stopped in the caution brought out by number five. Let's go to Dick Bergman with Mark Martin. Well, Jack Crouch is, oh, Jack Crouch is calling the stop today, making the decision as to whether to stop or not. And at first when that thing happened, he said no. But then up down that road, everything came in into and everybody I can see here has taken four tires and a load of fuel. All right, we're under the fourth caution period of the day here for Mark Martin uh, as Mark Martin makes his service. The caution brought out by the incident involving Ricky Rudd. Field will reform as number 11 of Jeff Bodine continues to be perhaps the strongest car here today. Davey Allison has come on pit road. Sterling Marlin, who was an early front runner. Mike Waltrip is back on pit road, as is Richard Petty. And the rest of the field, as everybody gets synced up with their service, let's go to Pat Patterson. Well, sometimes you're good, and sometimes you're lucky. And I guess, Richard Jackson, being good or lucky, you got the lap back. Yes, we, we got the lap back, and uh, we had a lucky break. What did Terry said about the car after you had that earlier problem? The tires seem like everything's okay right now? Everything's fine. We equalized the tire earlier and lost the lap. And, of course, we got a chance now to get it back. I think we're in the race now. Well, you know, he won this race last year, was a winner here at, at Pocono, so you got a driver that can do it. Question is, can that car get it done? Well, it's, we really can't say right now, but being a lap down and out of sync, uh, 
we hope we got the car that can win. He did win last year. He certainly can win again this year. All right, well, Richard Jackson's been around this thing for a long, long time, so I'm sure that uh, he'll get the job done in the pits, and hopefully Bonnie can get it done on the track. We're going to live up, give a listen uh, right now to Kyle Petty's radio. Well, we got uh, 116 laps to go. Confirmation to Kyle on the laps remaining, 116 still to race. It's a long day here at Pocono. See where Petty rejoins the uh, field after the restart. He should be somewhere around fifth or sixth as they form back up and uh, bring them back down with. We we'll just treat every caution as if it's the last one, and uh, from here out, and I think it'll be up to the end of the race before we decide on. Uh, Two tires or gas only, if it if it looks like it'll help us. stayed out on, on uh, and got gas only on one pit stop and then you notice that Gary's talking right now they're going to treat every caution like it's the last one in other words they'll take four tires those guys right ahead of us must have got four 27 10 and six and the 18 I know got I think got two because he left way before us so it's two tires ahead of the 18 and uh, four tires behind the 27 10 four, 10 four. Okay, there's no halfway money, so we're in best shape. If this was the last caution, we're going to have the best tires later on. Gary Nelson, it's Dave the Spain calling. You feel like you've jockeyed yourself into position to win this race? Yeah, we're working at it. You know, uh, we stopped early and didn't take tires just to see what the car would work like and was able to lead a little bit and then come back. And now some of the guys in front of us are doing the same thing. So we feel like we've changed four tires now and if the race goes green or with just a couple of cautious the rest of the way, we'll be able to, to take advantage of the situation. One more quick one. Who's the strongest car out there? Do what now? I say one more quick question. Who is the strongest car out there? I tell you, right now that 11 car is strong. He's been strong all day long. His, his old car is, is pretty much works wherever he wants to put it. He can run on the bottom. He can pass on the outside. He's making really good time over the tunnel. The guys that are making the best time over the tunnel are the ones making the best time around the racetrack right now. Thanks, Kyle. Good luck to you. Let's go down to pit road now and uh, check in uh, on the situation with the crash, Ricky Rudd. Well, Ricky Rudd's car is really a mess. He's behind the wall here. The oil, Dave Despain, was from some severed oil lines up front. Ricky, what happened? What put you in the problem? Well, it exploded a left front tire. That's what started everything. When the tire exploded, it knocked the oil line off and scattered oil. And uh, pretty bad deal there for a while. Couldn't see where I was going and uh, trying to stay out of the oil. It was a mess there for a minute. Is this thing so bad that you can't fix it? It looks like they're going to try. Well, it's, it's, it looks a lot worse than what it is. The worst thing about it, it knocked the oil line off, and the motor probably ran for 10 seconds with no oil pressure. That's the worst thing. Yeah, it sure is. Ricky Rudd's best finish here at Pocono was second. That was in 1986. He's not going to do any better than that today. They have really got their work cut out for them. I will remind you that last year, Rusty Wallace had precisely this problem at Pocono. A shredded left front tire. When the tire shredded, it cut the oil lines. Rusty came back, and he finished. He was not in the top 10, but he did finish the event. Ricky Rudd hopes to do the same today. Well, I'm glad that Phil Parsons didn't have a perfect record today. It was the result of that three-wide move that, uh, that Ricky Rudd got involved, although it could very well have been. What can you see when you go in there? We've had the in-car shot a couple of times at that tunnel turn. Looks to me like you go in there real fast with a corner that breaks real hard, and all you can see is the wall. That's it's true. It's such a sharp turn that you cannot see around the turn. So uh, you're really just about driving over the edge of the hood when you get to that turn. So if something like that would have happened, then and uh, there could have very easily been a situation where, where somebody saw the three wide, seized up a little bit to give them room, and, and Ricky got under him. But obviously not the case. But it's amazing how much damage that a blown tire can do to a car. It looked like he drove up underneath somebody and had serious serious damage. But it uh, but it wasn't. It was just a tire that exploded and, and uh, tore up the fender and the hood and and, the, and also the oil line. Brett Bodine leads the race at lap 86, having come from 20th starting spot. And it's been a steady march, as you can see in our serial score here. He was 16th on the 15th lap. He was up to 7th by lap 25. And now, with the caution, has moved all the way to the front. And perhaps we'll see a brother battle for the lead here. As you heard Kyle Petty say that he thinks that brother Jeff 
Aquodyne may be the strongest cat out there. Uh, Jeff and Brett have had the opportunity to uh, both to become winners in Winston Cup racing. Brett, the newest winner on the tour, and uh, and I think a guy who's destined to win some more, Phil. I think so. I've been watching Brett today, and he's really run well. He hasn't been up front where we, we really have seen a lot of him, but he's run well. He's moved steadily up, and uh, and now we'll see how we can do now that he, that he has the front. Here is your leaderboard. Bodine climbs to the top of it for the first time. Brett Bodine for the first time today. We'll go green, I believe. No, we won't. The uh, caution flag will remain out. A lot of oil over there from the Rudd incident. Earnhardt with his best position of the day. Likewise, Dale Jarrett, who has stayed on the, on the lead lap. Now, you see that the yellow has shuffled some of the guys from back in the field up into positions of challenger for the moment. Chad Little is fourth, the uh, law student from the West Coast, trying to make his way in Winston Cup, and the rookie Jack Pennington, who could make a real run at Robbie Moroso in those rookie points today if he can hang on to that fifth. I don't think that car is probably strong enough to do that. Mr. Excitement, Jimmy Spencer's first appearance in the top ten today as he comes to sixth starting spot. We'll get at least one more lap under yellow. The lights on the caution car have gone out, and so it's time to get back to business. Kim Perry wants to know from Jacksonville, Florida, who has won this race the most. Bill Elliott has won it four times. He won everything in 1985, including both Pocono races. He won this race in 88, and he won again here last July. He's a four-time winner. The late Tim Richmond won three in a row in 86 and 87. Bobby Allison, his career ended at this racetrack, won three in a row in 82 and 83. Pat Patterson has another viewer question. Viewer question, and I'm going to try to give you the best answer I possibly can. The question is, is there a method to retain fuel uh, once it's being spilled on a pit stop? Well, this is a catch can, and uh, the catch can goes right behind the left rear quarter panel of the car, and uh, that, that is what catches the gas through the overflow valve once the gas is being put in on the left side of the rear of the car. And this question comes from Jim White. He's from Cox Cable in San Diego, California. And uh, hopefully, Jim, that uh, gets that a little clearer for you. All right, thank you very much, Pat. Lynn, you've got one about the brake markers down at turn one. I started to answer that before and didn't get to it. Can you clear that up for us? Well, Tim Top called in, and he actually has the right answer to his question. When approaching turn one, markers on the outside wall read 321. Does that mean 300, 200, and 100 yards from the turn? That's exactly what it means. It's the yard markers leading to the turn. So uh, they don't always have those at uh, super speedways, but they have them here. Here you, you got to look at them. From that camera perspective, they don't look that far, but that is, in fact, 100 yards, and it takes uh, just about a second for a Winston Cup car to traverse that distance under full racing speed. Here's the view from the other direction, and their purpose here at Pocono is very critical. You've got to it's know where to It's for that left race. foot braking that we're talking about, yeah. So uh, it's something that you don't always see at speedways, but you see them at our road courses all the time. This is the only racetrack, the only oval that we race on that has the turn markers. At Watkins Glen, naturally, in Sears Point, we do. The number to call is 1-800-522-RACE, R-A-C-E. If you have a question for any of our booth experts or anybody else, if we can uh, try to get you an answer from here at the racetrack today, we'll answer the question, who will lead this race at halfway, perhaps, with this round of green flag. A couple of lap cars at the head of the field on lap 89 of 200. As we go back to green, the green car of Brett Bodine is the race leader. And now dominator comes back to life as Dale Earnhardt squirts up into that second spot. There are the lap cars in, ahead of the 26 of Brett Bodine working their way down the long pond straight away. And now suddenly Earnhardt slowing dramatically. Problems for Dale Earnhardt. Unbelievable how this team's luck has turned. We'll get an update as soon as we know what's wrong. It sounds like the tire problems of Daytona have reoccurred. Apparently, Earnhardt has cut a tire. Look what happened here in his last four outings. He won the race uh, four races ago, then came back to run 30th, 31st, and 34th. The result of a crash, a broken camshaft, and a blown transmission when a belt came off the transmission pump. And now, apparently, a cut tire, which should not drop him back perhaps to 30th for a final finish position, but conceivably could cost him a lap here as he's had a long, long coast. That's the bad news about a long racetrack. Let's go down to Dr. Dick Berggren. 
We're using bias ply tires today. That's a rather old-fashioned tire. You can hardly buy them for a street car. They are much more susceptible to punctures than the new radials. They do not have a radial for Pocono. And as a result, we're seeing more punctures than we're accustomed to seeing. Bernhardt, just now, a victim of exactly that. It was an 11.2-second pit stop. It's a pretty good pit stop for only one tire, but they've been a lot happier if they didn't have to make it. I'll guarantee you that. Well, it didn't take long to change the tire fill, but it took a long time to get there, huh? Well, it really did, but it's the same situation as we've had earlier. The track is so big, uh, Dale will have no trouble staying in the lead lap unless he has another tire problem, or unless they only change two tires, unless it was the wrong side that they changed. As we come back around, Rudd will be leading behind the lap number 98 of Bush Miller and the, I believe, at least twice lap number 25 of Kenny Schrader. Here is your summary of the caution flags that have flown thus far. There have been a total of five in the race and uh, also the lap, the uh, duration of those cautions and the reason. The longest was the five lapper there for Ricky Rudd as they had a, a fair amount of cleanup to do. Preco Dines in the lead. Uh... Did I misidentify calling Ricky Rudd? That yeah. was bound, bound to happen. I knew I was going to do that before this day was out. A lot of team shuffling for 1990 as uh, many of uh, the drivers, in fact, the uh, ten drivers of uh, lead cars or good cars change teams, change uniforms, and change sponsors. Well, that's, you know, when, when uh, we were talking about Jack Roush expanding in the sponsorship, there's so many teams that want to come in, and then there's all the shuffling, and it's hard because a sponsor develops an identity with a driver and a team, and if they can keep that, boy, the momentum I think they get is so strong, but when there's so much switching going on, it's really hard sometimes for the sponsor, I think, to get the full benefit uh, when they switch teams, but uh, we make mistakes, sometimes the fans make mistakes, but at least we got a lot of sponsors wanting to get into the NASCAR race. A pit road observer that uh, I think should probably re uh, remain nameless was talking to me uh, this weekend about Dale Earnhardt's deal. Not that there would be any reason in the world why Earnhardt would want to change. He's got uh, what must be the best deal in stock car racing. But he was pointing out that even if Earnhardt did want to change and go drive, for example, for Junior Johnson, it would be very difficult because of all the GM and Goodwrench public relations uh, uh, horsepower that's behind that team. It would just take a long time for them to gear up for a new driver. Meanwhile, as we uh, mark the progress of number 26, Brett Bodine around this racetrack, his jump into a new car has certainly paid off in a hurry. Likewise, look at number 21. Neil Bonnet started the season in that car, had a hard crash and a head injury that uh, relegated him to the role of a television commentator a time or two this year. He's talking about whether he'll come back next year and race, but Dale Jarrett has been an exemplary example of a guy who could jump in and do the job in a car. He is currently second and holding off Rusty Wallace. Another guy who was out of luck at the start of the season, didn't have a good ride, a ride open up and he's trying to do the best he can with it and that of course is critically important so you got to be in the right place at the right time you got to get the good car and then when you get the good car you got to do something with it in a hurry absolutely and dale has done a heck of a job in that car but uh there's a good battle for second rusty wallace uh, sizing up dale and easing by him on the inside uh, as they approach the tunnel turn wallace got a stout race car here they were not real happy with it early they did some fiddling they did some adjusting and lo and behold they've gotten it all sorted out now and he is the second place machine that will drop jarrett to third fourth is Irvin. fifth is kawicki who's been consistent here today let's go to uh, dick bergman in the rusty wallace pit well, thanks, Dave Despain. Jack Sappenfield, Viacom Cable, Redmond, Washington, wants to know how is tire stagger measured? Is there something better than a stagger master or a tape measure? I want to let an expert handle this. This is Jimmy Maycar. He knows the tires for Rusty Wallace. How do you do it? Well, we need to use stagger masters, but we don't wait for that. We need tape measure now. It really depends on what you get used to, actually. Uh, one's as good as the other. As far as speed is concerned, if you're used to a tape measure, it's just as fast as Stagger Master also. Uh, as far as one being better than the other, one's not any better than the other. It's just what you get used to. But I've noticed you can't fit a Stagger Master in your pocket. No, it's real hard to carry one of those around unless you've got real big pockets. Stagger Master, for those of you who don't know what it's like, it's like a giant little slider thing, and it fits over the top of the tire here, and it's like a caliper. It measures the top to the bottom of the tire, as opposed to wrapping a tape around the tire. Stagger is very critical for determining how the chassis will operate, how the race car will run. Several ways to measure it. This guy likes a tape measure sometimes and a Stagger Master sometimes. All right, thank you, Dick. Here's the race for third as Alan Kowicki darts to the inside and tries to take the measure of Dale Jarrett. Right behind them comes fifth and sixth, and that is Derek Cope moving around this race's pole center, Ernie Irvin. Good competition up ahead of the field. You get a glimpse.
Let's set a second yellow car. Also headed for the front once again. Number 18, Greg Sachs, who was very salty early, but now seems to be a, a middle of the top 10 car. That pack right there uh, embraces basically fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth positions. And as you can see, there's not a whole lot of difference in them. A good move there by Sachs as he, or check that. Yeah, it was Sachs who moved around Irvine and comes up to challenge Jarrett. And Jarrett is in danger of retreating here. The yellow helped him get to where he is. And the question now is how long he can hang on to that position. I think that was a situation where Dale got either zero tires or two tires. And where the rest of the cars he's racing against probably got four. So that's, that's why Dale is retreating somewhat. All right, we've got, I believe, caution coming again. Yeah, indeed, the yellow flag flying once again at Pocono. And this, uh, what would be a long afternoon anyway, is even longer today by a flurry of yellow. The problem apparently over in the short straightaway between two and three. And once again, the yellow flag has flown here on lap 96, and I believe that's the sixth caution flag of the day. It looked like it was Richard Petty. I hate to say that, but as I looked out over the uh, field there, it looked like it might have been Richard Petty. Frustrating day for the man who has run his 10,000th mile on this racetrack today. That's 10,000 Winston Cup miles. Figures he also must have run about 1,000 USAC miles on this race. He won a USAC race here way back uh, when. There is the battered remains of Richard Petty's automobile here this afternoon. Petty has hit the wall in the short straightaway between turns two and three and an incident that undoubtedly was triggered off the tunnel turn. It, uh, all you can see is wall when you go through there, but if you lose it there, it sometimes takes a while to hit that wall. Richard hit it nose first. Mike Waltrip went just past this point and got into oil yesterday and backed his car into the wall and had to go to a backup car. Those have been the two worst crashes of the week. You remember when uh, we were talking to Darrell earlier in the lead of the show, he said if you have a crash at the tunnel turn, you've got a serious crash. And that's what happened. Betty has... Petty has hit the wall pretty hard. The front end is badly damaged, and we will bring you an update on his condition as soon as we have it. Uh, no reason at this point to believe that uh, Richard is in any uh, sort of danger or even hurt, but uh, we'll get an update on that as soon as we have it. The caution's coming in rapid uh, succession here, and that uh, dictating the strategy. In this case, everybody's going to go to pit road. They were just in, and now they'll come again, and here is Brett Bodine to get right side tires. Wallace also going to the right side. Radio's buzzing here. Let's go to Dick Bergrud. Watching Rusty Wallace, his tire change, and Barry Dobson, the crew chief, carrying his man. On the left front is the guy who just explained about tire staggers. He and Jimmy Maycar. They've already got the right side tires on. Left side tires about ready to go. Right stop. Excellent. First one off. Even though it is a big, wide pit road, it gets very, very crowded in there because if you get jammed behind another car and you've got to take that wide line and two other guys are racing down pit road side by side, you can easily run out of room here. It looks like Wallace will lead the parade off pit road. Pocono, Pennsylvania, on what has become a beautiful day for stock car racing. The track was threatened by clouds early. We had some rain here on qualifying day, but it caused no problems as Ernie Irvine went out and dashed to the pole position. Race day itself has been beautiful, and in response, the largest crowd in stock car history at Pocono has jammed this place. Richard Petty's car is about to go up on the hook as the sixth caution flag of the day has waved here. The record for the most cautions in the event is nine, and uh, we're not yet at halfway, so we could break a record we don't want to break here today. As Petty's car is hauled away, we note that on pit road, the uh, number 94 of Sterling Marlin is also up on the hook, or uh, we should say is in getting some service. Petty is up on the hook, and Marlin is in for what looks like it might be a longer than average stop. Richard Petty still looking for victory number 201 in his career. Been a long time since number 200 down at Daytona on the 4th of July. Here is the number 94 car making its exit with some obvious damage. He's hit something, Phil. It, it looks like he probably was involved with Richard Petty. Because through the tunnel turn, you normally don't hit the, hit the wall head on there. You normally lose the car and back him up also. Richard might have, uh, Sterling might have had a problem and, and got together with Richard because the way Sterling's, the back of his car looks, it kind of corresponds to the front of Richard's car. So that may have been indeed what happened. A lot of times you have to do a little reconstruction after the fact to figure out uh, these situations. And indeed, it looks like Mar Marlon has been involved, perhaps one of the most. Let's go to Pat Patterson. All right, we talked uh, with Richard Petty's crew, and uh, the king of stock car racing is okay. They're taking the car to the garage, so the day is going to be over for the king here at Pocono. 
five. We are uh, preparing to go back to green. It'll be a little bit here as they uh, as they clean up here. And so we're going to take that moment to uh, look ahead a little bit because upcoming the decade of the 90s in stock car racing, how will it compare with the 80s? What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Wait a minute. Can this be right? Judging from these pictures, there's something changing in the world of Winston Cup stock car racing. Could the new decade mean a fond farewell to some of the legends of stock car racing? What kind of new heroes are we developing in Winston Cup stock car racing? And what do they think it will take to achieve the status of the 90s? I think a driver of the 90s is somebody that uh, starts out being a well-educated, a well-spoken, um, loyal individual that uh, is, is in a position where he, he understands what it takes both in and out of the race car being able to drive the race car effectively, get out of the race car, and be able to fulfill the obligation for a corporate sponsor. So you have to take a little bit of time and, and take care of yourself, eat right, uh, eat the right foods, and, and uh, just be conscious of, of what you need to do to stay in the best shape because, again, that's what it's going to come down to here uh, with the race cars being as equal as they are is who's going to be in the best shape and, and able to go the hardest at the end. I really think that um, you know to be a true champion that uh, it goes way beyond being able to sit behind the steering wheel and drive a car. You know, there's um, uh, it takes a unique uh, person to be the Winston Cup champion or or any kind of champion. You know, of, of motorsports. You know, uh, there's a whole lot more to the sport than just driving a car. To understand what may happen in the 90s. First, you have to look back at what occurred in the 80s. We saw competition uh, formulating itself to being keener than it's ever been before. Uh, we've got uh, sponsors that uh, make us the envy of all, uh, all sports, I would say. Uh, and uh, the 80s were really wonderful for NASCAR and all the people that participate in NASCAR. With all of the changes, one has to wonder about technology. Probably in the 80s that, that we got a, a sign of something that's going to happen in the future in terms of a uh, uh, philosophical point of view. I think that uh, consistently we're going to see that less is more. And that with the pressure to hold the speeds down and with uh, everybody's effort to make the engines uh, uh, be more efficient in terms of specific output, uh, the burn rates, uh, uh, the things that are being learned uh, with regard to the standards for fuel economy and emissions has created a great deal of new information that will make uh, engines consistently make uh, more power. It takes big bucks to go fast and win in NASCAR Winston Cup stock car racing. More and more companies continue to flock to what now is considered a half a billion dollar industry, but what people speculate as being a billion dollar industry by the year 2000. And as if all these new sponsors parading in and out of the garage area each week weren't enough, Tom Cruise and company convinced Hollywood to make a movie. Well, one thing we know, and that is that the race fans are sure excited about it. Bring on Tom Cruise in Days of Thunder. One thing's for sure, stock car racing has never enjoyed the success that it currently enjoys throughout these United States. Is the price of sponsorship out of control, and will all of our old heroes fade away? These are only questions that the 90s can answer. Well, we might be able to at least solicit opinions, though, from a couple of our experts here. We're back at Pocono, Pennsylvania. I'm Dave Spain with Lynn St. James and Phil Parsons. Any reaction? Any Ab reason to think that the 90s will be anything less than uh, super successful? Absolutely. I mean, not that it's going to be less. It's even going to be, like Jack said, you know, you're going to have to do better, and more is really on the front. Um, as a representative of Ford Motor Company, I know their concerns of really finding drivers that can speak well. I mean, when we were talking to Mark on the radio, he called it the, the Folgers Valvoline uh, Ford Thunderbirds. So it's really going to take professionalism that's never been there before. We are back to racing here at Pocono, and we hit the halfway mark in this Miller 
500, a 500 mile, 200 lap competition reaching its halfway mark with the number 15 car out front. First time today we've seen it, Morgan Shepard chipping away at these guys after an early problem with the tire. Uh, seemingly the story for all the front runners today. Everybody's having all kinds of tire problems. Morgan has survived his and come back to the head of the pack. I started to mention earlier that uh, when, when, we, when we had Morgan on camera uh, making a spit stop that he did indeed stay in the lead lap when the caution came out and, uh, and now here he is leading the race so I don't, I don't have to say that now. Once you, uh, get at, once you get back to the back of the pack and are able to start picking people off, then you benefit not only from your own progress up through the field, the fact you might have a little better race car, but also those subsequent cautions have also helped him. We should further update that Richard Petty story, and for that, let's go to Vic Bergeron. Well, Richard Petty has pulled into the, I shouldn't say pulled in, he's been towed into the garage area with a car that is severely battered. It's up on jack stands right now, the front end's all torn in. The good news, however, is Richard got out of the car under his own power. NASCAR asked him to take the obligatory ride to the infield care center. Richard nodded okay. That's where he's gone. Not a lot of work trying to fix this thing. <laughs> I wouldn't want to try to fix it. I doubt they're going to be able to get it ready in this day. Richard Petty's car torn up. Richard Petty's not. That's okay. The King will take the rest of the afternoon off as we cross the halfway point. 101 laps complete. Morgan Shepard, the leader over Bobby Hillen, who likewise has emerged through this round of cautions as a front runner. Will it be temporary? We'll see. Jeff Bodine solid all day. Perhaps the strongest car here today. Kyle Petty might challenge for that honor. Alan Kowicki is finally having a good day after struggling so much through most of 1990. Second 10 finds Dale Jarrett, Davey Allison, Mr. Excitement, Jimmy Spencer. Darrell Waltrip has climbed back into the top 10, and Rusty Wallace is now 10th. It's going to be interesting to see what becomes of him. Martin, Bodine, Cope, Elliott surviving a tire problem, and Harry Gant are 11th through 15th. As the running continues here, just past the halfway point in a long afternoon's work for these Winston Cup drivers. Gerald Walter made a late pit stop on that caution plaque, so he's almost at the very, very tail end of the pack right now. So he was up in the top ten, but he made a late pit stop. I'm sure more adjusting going on between Jeff Hammond and Darrell Walter. They are trying to scramble back after all sorts of problems with that car today. Shepard is your leader, and with the exception of that one, here is the 17 car trying to make a move, and it's a brother battle there as Darrell moves around Michael. Michael comes right back up and shows him the nose, and that's kind of typical situation. You see that in road racing a lot, Lynn. You dive into the corner, and uh, you, you get the brakes, but then the guy comes back underneath you. You have to, but uh, here you've at least had a wide racetrack. We don't always have that much width. Battle for second as we watch it uh, work its way around the racetrack. We see number 11, Jeff Bodine, strong all day. Getting a look at Bobby Hillen in his mirror for the first time today. Kyle Petty says, I don't want to follow him. He dives inside, and we'll see which way number 7, Alan Kowicki, elects to go, or if indeed he elects to go here. Kowicki may just hang back. Alan Kowicki, interesting story. Strong-minded, uh, some would say hard-headed young driver who came into the sport with his automotive engineering degree and said, I know what I'm doing. I know how to run my own team. Turned down a drive with Junior Johnson last year. Unfortunately, the Cinderella story of the little guy who draw, runs his own team has kind of gone sour this year, as they have not been able to do very well. Hey, there's Ken Schrader right in front of our leader, Morgan Shepard, in the 15 car. If Schrader can stay in front of Morgan Shepard or whoever may be leading when we get another caution flag, he already got one lap back when Richard Petty had his problem, along with Butch Miller. So Schrader is now one lap down and apparently has his brake problems solved because he is really running well. He's really running well. I saw how low he ran through the turn three there, and he just was able to hold that car down. It drifted out beautifully. It looks like he's definitely got a good setup. We are watching the leader, Morgan Shepard, and as has been the pattern here today, cars emerge from the pack and seem, when the green flag falls, to be stronger than anybody else. They dart away and pull away from the continuing battle for second. Second has been a race all day. Bodine is in that race right now with uh, Bobby Hillen, who didn't qualify a lick here today, didn't practice very well, but the key is race day, and he's racing very effectively now in third spot with Kyle Petty on his bumper. About a car length of separation between each of those cars now running second, third, fourth, and here comes Kowicki into the frame in fifth. To finish the Kowicki story, I think Allen is trying to do too many things. Now, he might disagree. In fact, I'm certain he would disagree with that because when the opportunity came to be a hired gun, just go and sit in somebody else's race car, indeed one of the best race cars 
carries in the business. The car at the head of this pack right here. That is Kowicki. And that Budweiser Ford is Junior Johnson's automobile. When the opportunity came to drive for Junior, Kowicki said, no, thank you. I'm going to do it my own way. Unfortunately, in 1990, that team has not gelled. They are 21st in the point standing coming into this race this afternoon. Good to see him having a good run. Kyle Petty carrying a camera car today, being challenged by Kowicki, and Kowicki just shoots by. You'll see him come in from the left-hand side of your screen, take over fourth spot, and kick Petty back to fifth in a continuing battle among second, third, fourth, and fifth place drivers. That's good competition, and uh, I guess the question in my mind, Phil, is when you're in that situation, you know the leader's pulling away. How much pressure do you feel knowing that there's still half the race to go to get to the front of that pack, and how much are you willing to just sit along and ride? I think they're content right now to sit along and ride. I don't think they'll... I mean, if they can catch the leader, fine. Now, if Jeff O'Dyne can run down the leader, fine, he'll try to pass him. But you, you, we know where we have, like, 95 laps to go or 90-some laps to go, and it, it just doesn't make any sense to push your car. You want to keep the tires as fresh as you can because, you know, you never know. It may go green the rest of the way, and you may only be able to put two tires on the caution flag instead of uh, on the green flag instead of four on the caution flag. So you don't want to push things. Just let it settle off. You don't want the leader to get too far away because if it does go green, you don't want him to build up an insurmountable lead. So right now I think they're patient just to sit back and wherever they fall, then let it fall. Updating the Earnhardt situation, he has caught some of the tail end of this pack. Hut Strickland is in his sights, along with Labonte, who now seems to be suffering again. Labonte, we speculated, might be able to run with the leaders if he could get to the leaders. He's not been able to do that. The ailing Earnhardt shows the fender to Hut Strickland. I would suspect Hut will wisely let that black fender move right on by and not try to uh, out-intimidate the intimidator here. See Earnhardt drop the wheel onto the grass. He's using the fast line around this place, which often is not on the racetrack at all, but down on the apron and even on the grass. And he's pulling number 94 along with him, Sterling Marlin, who was involved in the petty crash. From the inside of Rusty Wallace's car, we check that battle up in front of him. Now, Wallace had fallen all the way back to the tail end of the top ten after the caution flag. And by my count, he is now seventh and trying to work his way back up. He's got that five, six car battle in his sights up ahead. The super speedway has not been particularly good to Rusty. And he considers Pocono a critical race because he's got Daytona and Talladega coming up. He knows he doesn't have a strong car at either of those places. He really wants to run well here today. You can see that uh, from inside the car, you've also got the glare coming in from the sun and also the change in the in the actual track surface or the color of the track surface. You go from the really dark asphalt to then some really light concrete. And, it, you know, when you visually are looking for where you're going on the racetrack, even though a lot of this comes from almost habit or, you know, you get into the groove and everything happens automatically, you're still looking for those visual references. You're still looking for where you're going to make a move on the car. You're looking for depth perception of how fast you're coming up on a car, and all those things come into play, and I think that glare of the sun and the, the track changes and all that really make a difference, and even though these guys have got it handled, it's all part of this program of what they're having to um, go through their own mental uh, computer of what's going on out there. Good view of the left foot braking from Rusty Wallace and that characteristic flexing of the left arm and then stomp on that throttle. Hold that thing down just as far as it'll go as he continues to race for position here. Colwicky, seemingly the strongest car in this foursome now, moving up to challenge Bodine. And this is the best that we've seen Colwicky run, not only today, but perhaps all year, Phil. He beat Bodine very, very badly through the tunnel's turn. Uh, you know, Kyle, we heard overheard Kyle say earlier that the car that are the cars that are going fast are making their time in the tunnel turn, and Alan Kowicki definitely made his time up in the tunnel turn that lap. Kowicki calls a lot of the shots on the seat from the cockpit. He will call for chassis settings and adjustments on the crew radio, call him and tell him what he wants done to that car, and uh, apparently he's calling the shots pretty effectively here today because he's got that machine right up there on the rear deck of what day long, I think, has been the strongest car today. A lot of different cars have led this race. I don't think anybody's been consistently stronger than Bodine. It's what's so, it always is so interesting to me to observe the way the flow of, an, of a NASCAR race because it's like you spend most of the race learning about the car, figuring out exactly what the setup is, who you can race well with, who you can run well with, and then I mean, an example is, is Alan Quickly now really showing well. I think Bobby Hillen being up in the front that wasn't, you know, just was sort of not a part of it at all. And finding out where you can run so that at those last 
last 50 laps or the last 50 miles anyway that you know exactly what you want to have under you. Good racing here as Colwicky came inside, took the spot and said, I don't need Junior Johnson's ride. I can beat that Thunderbird. Bodine came right back past him to take the lead. Now they're on the front straightaway and everybody's in it. Kyle got way out of shape. Kyle just got, he really did. He was both just right and left and all over there because he just got squeezed. He absolutely got squeezed in. Yeah, and he may pay a penalty for that, too. He obviously had to get out of the throttle and lost his momentum. That uh, is going to be costly in terms of the battle for position. He lost several spots in the altercation, but perhaps worse, lost all of his momentum going down the straightaway. Another move for position by Kowicki, as Kyle is now playing catch-up. And I think we're going to get another look at that. Phil, maybe you can uh, diagnose what happened here. Kyle is on the inside of Alan Kowicki right now, and the uh, thing is, being on the inside, he doesn't have the whole width of the racetrack to catch his car. You see the car bouncing as he runs off the racetrack. Right now, he, he got a little bit squirrely. He needs the room on the outside to catch his car, but there's a line of three cars there, so he had to hold the car down, get out of the throttle, back off, and straighten the car out. Consequently, he lost six, eight positions. We talk about a nice piece of driving that was one. Had he had room to operate, he probably could have just throttle steered out of that. But if he'd done that, he probably would have put Hill on the fence. That's right. exactly right. Well, you always, you know, you're anticipating the amount of drift that that car is going to have based on the line that you're taking through there. And if you get squeezed out, like we were talking, we want to be on the low side on the inside. But if you get squeezed down there, you've got to get out of the throttle because there's no place for the car to take that drift. Nice piece of work by Petty, an expensive incident in terms of positions on the racetrack. Drivers out of the race, Jerry O'Neill was first to retire. Jimmy Horton, after winning the ARCA race yesterday, out of the event, and Richard Petty, victim of a crash. It was a great day for Horton yesterday. He is undefeated on the super speedways. He beat Tracy Leslie. Uh, along with, let's see, the rest of the running order, there was Greg Trammell, uh, Chris Gerke, and Bob Keselowski, third, fourth, and fifth in the ARCA race. This is today's Winston Cup action. I thought uh, there was a quote yesterday that was worthy, if I could put my fingers on that. Yeah, you hear about drivers in the old story of what if, what if. Well, Tracy Leslie thought he had that. There's, there's Petty loose again. Now I begin to wonder, is this just a consequence of close competition, or might there be something wrong with that race car? I think that might bear looking at. Looking at. We'll see if we can give you another view of that. Second lap in a row, the Petty has come down through there, sawing at that steering wheel and on and off the gas, trying to keep himself out of the fence here at Pocono. He is in the battle with the pole sitter in this race, Ernie Irvan. Ernie could pick up something like $38,000 in Unical bonus money if he could win. Now everybody is blowing by Bodine, whom we repeatedly said might be the strongest car in the race. Bodine is going backwards. All sorts of activity here, and it's happening all at once. Phil, any speculation about Bodine's problem? It, it, I think he may have a flat tire, either flat tire or lost a cylinder or something, but he definitely has a problem. I'm sure he'll be probably headed towards the pits now because uh, just about the whole field is passing. Unless he knows exactly what's wrong with that car and knows that there's no hope for it, he will. He must certainly come to pit road. Another lap like that, and he'll be last out there on the racetrack. So I think we'll see the car that won this race a year ago and the driver who won here a couple of years ago on pit road. Bodine is in trouble as he heads for the Junior Johnson stable to try to address what may be a flat tire problem. We'll see. I think Bodine would hope that that would be the problem because that could be a quick fix and try to get back into it. Anything other than that might uh, might be more substantial in terms of the time that would leave him stuck on pit road. They go to the right side, and it appears they will go to the left. They're going to change all four, taking no chances. And now a caution comes out, and this may be a replay of the Mark Martin episode because that means that Bodine with fresh tires and a full tank of gas is going to zing right out on the racetrack. These guys will race back to the flag, and this is critical, Phil. It sure is. If Ken Schrader can beat Morgan Shepard back to the line, he'll, he'll get back in the lead lap, but it's very close. It looks like Morgan Shepard's going to have him Ooh. just by, a, a, by about a foot, so Ken Schrader will have to wait again for another chance to get his lap back. That's got to be so frustrating because you got to be in exactly the right position to even have that opportunity and then to not be able to pull it off, and it looked like he was in the right spot. I mean, he was down low. How come he couldn't and beat him back. Again, the same thing that happened to Kyle when he got out of shape coming up the corner. He didn't have the whole racetrack to drift up to the wall and, and use the amount of throttle he needed. And Morgan Shepard, they were side by side. He didn't beat Morgan into that corner. They were just side by side. Morgan had the momentum and could go all the way out to the wall. Let's listen in and see if we can learn about Kyle's problem. Okay, we'll get four uh, this time. Gary Nelson calling for four tires, four tires for Kyle Petty.
No response from Kyle. He knows what he needs. If they don't talk about it, we'll check back with them after the tire change and see if we can find out what's going on with that. That was a real break again for Jeff Bodine. We've seen it happen a number of times today, about 10 okay, times yeah, today. He's going to be in the pit, so we're going to have to stop a little longer this time. And then 98 will come in after us, so it's going to be tight getting out. Uh, four tires. Gary Nelson again talking about the Hustle position. Hustle down pit road, Tom. Hustle down pit road is the instruction. The earlier comment about the cars okay, that we're you with you. Spotter letting them know that he's on pit road. All the leaders are in. There's the car on which we've been eavesdropping. He's all the way up to turn one end of the pits. He has to come around Morgan Shepard. Let's go to Nick Burton with Baby Allison. Baby Allison here in car number 28. He worked himself all the way up to third spot. He's only going to take two tires. Reason for that, he wants the track position. Ever so important track position here. Pat Patterson. All right, we're with Tim Brewer, and uh, Tim is watching all the activities on the pit road. All two out. The sun is smiling on you today. Capper on watching the field and, and picking who really got a strong car out there right now. And obviously Jim does. Anybody else that I mean is, is really strong that we haven't seen running up front. Well, whoever gets the best set of tires when they come off pit road for the long run, that's that's just one of those deals to where uh, you're going to have to wait and see. And uh, it's going to be a good race. You're going to race three or four cars for the for the Je win. Jeff, pretty happy with the way it's working in the turns right now. Pretty much so. He got a little excited a while ago. Car went turn down the middle of turn one, and that's the characteristics of a flat right front tire. When you go in, the car just goes straight. But he should be in pretty good shape now. Okay, that's Tim Brewer, and uh, Lady Luck is smiling their way right now. Yeah, I would say so. The uh, seventh caution of the day was a godsend for the driver of the number 11 car. Here's one of the safety crews going up to clear a piece of debris and doing the 50-yard dash back down the hill before the uh, field come by. Bodine will emerge just as Mark Martin did earlier at the head of the field and with the lead here as the caution car brings them off and Jimmy Means heads back to pit road to begin the second round of pit stops for those who will need a second or perhaps did not to come in on the first stop, Bill. Let's listen to... Did get the pits, did he? Bodine will emerge just as Mark Martin did earlier at the head of the field and with the lead here as the caution car brings them off and Jimmy Means heads back to pit road to begin the second round of pit stops for those who will need a second or perhaps did not to come in on the first stop, Bill. Let's listen to... Did get caught in the pits, did he? No, he did the best thing. He pitted while the green was out. The caution came out. He's got four new tires and he's a leader. That's Gary Nelson. Okay, it was the eight car that spun, and he's still out there. I think it didn't Jeff Bodine get only two tires when he when he had that flat tire. I think he got four. Did we'll he, see. If he did get two. Okay, two, two tires. Two tires for uh, for Bodine as he darted back out to the front. They had uh, it appeared to me it started to go to the left side and then elected not to get him back out there to take full advantage of the situation. Now you overheard. Uh, Okay, well, that's what I said. Yeah, now it's been corrected. Now, Phil, that's my turn to be right here today. I know you're the expert, but I want to get at least one today. He did get four. They had just started to go to the left side as the shot changed, but I thought they were going to go ahead and change them all. That was precisely the moment when the caution came out, and that was the information that Gary Nelson was relaying there, I believe, to Kyle Petty to make sure that Kyle was aware of how Bodine got back up there into the middle of that. So, again, the communication is critical. It's important for us to be in the middle of the loop so that we can tell you what's happening, but it's equally important, I guess, for the driver to have that information because he needs to know what the other guy's got in order to measure his own performance. Absolutely. I think it's critical for Kyle to know that Jeff Bodine has four, four fresh tires and, and anybody else around him. So uh, I think it's very critical because then he can gauge that, well, I can beat this guy. I only got two tires. He got four. 
Lynn, how much is that information valuable to the driver, and how much is all that radio talk a distraction? You've got a lot to think about without having chit-chat on the radio. Yeah, but the more facts you have, the more information you have, the better. I mean, obviously, the chit-chat's not much under green. It's mostly under yellow, and you're able to file that away and, and not have it distract you. I mean, there's not any idle chit-chat. It's all important information. Update on Richard Petty. He has been released from the hospital. That was purely a precautionary check as required by NASCAR. He has been released and has driven away in the van. Now we go back under the green flag here. We have restarted here in Pocono, and I believe we're working lap 117. Yes, indeed, there is the confirmation as we get back to it. And jumping out front, Derek Koch, your Daytona 500 winner, gets around Jeff Rodine, takes the lead. Winner at Dover, winner at Daytona, and a challenger here at Pocono, and a guy that obviously is determined you'll hear his name a great deal more in the future. Rusty Wallace's view of the dirt and dust being kicked up as they hustle through turn one of this triangular racetrack nestled in the beautiful Pocono Mountains of eastern Pennsylvania. Dave, I think actually what happened was Derek Cope must have got to the, to the line across pit road before Jeff Odai did, even though he was on the racetrack. So that Derek Cope was really in the lead on the restart. Let's go to Dick Bergen in the pits. Well, Phil, Phil, Derek Cope has been in the lead a lot this year. Daytona in particular, and Dover as well, and what a difference a year makes. A little over a year ago, this team did, in fact, disband. All the help was told on a Monday. That was it. They couldn't keep going. On a Wednesday, Cope showed up with Purolator sponsorship. From there, he went on, won the Daytona 500 in a few weeks ago, Dover. Now, that sponsorship agreement expires very soon, literally a few weeks from now. Cope is a very valuable property as a proven winner. As a result, Curlator certainly is interested in re-upping, but so are three additional sponsors. What a difference a couple of wins can make. I bet the price is going up, too. I bet, I bet yeah, I bet it is, too, David. <laughs> <laughs> you win the Daytona 500, uh, value increases dramatically, and you're right, Phil. Indeed, uh, Coke did manage to emerge as the leader on that pit stop shuffle, and Bodine is the second-place car. But again, to re-emphasize, Bodine was the lucky guy in that because had the yellow not come out when it did, he would have been well downfield. Here he's challenging for the lead, and coming right with him is Kenny Schrader, who was the unlucky guy and did not get his lap back in that earlier exchange. Behind them comes the third-running car of the pole sitter, Ernie Irvin. He's been back as far as 10th and up as high as the lead today now settles into that third spot. Davey Allison is fourth. Rusty Wallace fifth as they pound up the front straightaway. And Sh Schrader continues to try to work to get his lap back. It appears to be up around the uh, now second place man, Cope. Basically uh, pushed Cope to the outside to get out of my way. i got to get up there if that caution comes out again. We've had seven of them. The record is nine. We're just a little past halfway. We will likely break a record here today at Pocono. Question from Mike Taylor in Nashville, Tennessee. Why does Pocono not require restrictor plate? The restrictors are limited at this point to Daytona and Talladega, the two racetracks where they approach 200 miles an hour. Because of the tight nature of the corners here at Pocono, you have long straightaways, but terminal velocity on the front chute is what, Bill? 180, as Darrell Walter said? Yeah, about 180 miles an hour. Really don't need the restrictor to keep the cars from flying at 180. Further back in the pack, we see the continuing battle. The look at Bill Elliott down on the inside of the racetrack. Thunderbird race as Elliott goes side by side with Davey Allison racing for position there. That is the uh, eighth and ninth place battle. And here we'll get the glimpse, I believe, of uh, Earnhardt, who has been back as far as 17th, kicks up a little dust as he edges closer and closer to the top 10. Cat is always determined. He will never, ever give up and never give you an inch on the racetrack. He slips past the number 28 of Allison and brings Mark Martin with him as Earnhardt continues his march. That, I believe, would put him in ninth spot and drop Mark Martin to 10th. Martin was obviously a precinct observer as he commented on the racer radio earlier today. They didn't think he had a car that could win this race. Here is the view of Rusty Wallace looking at the tail end of the pole sitting car of Ernie Irvine. Tim Neuer wonders if... Uh, Rusty Wallace and the rest of the drivers are superstitious about the in-car camera. Lynn St. James, Phil Parsons, do you or other drivers carry a superstition about that in-car? I don't, and I've talked to a lot of other drivers that have had them, and I've not heard anybody that feels that it's uh, superstitious, good or bad. Phil? Not at all, really. Uh, it's, it's really an honor to be, to be asked. 
I think at, the, at a point in time, I think there was some problems with that. Spin on pit road, it is Troy Beebe who has spun and hit the wall on pit road, and he tore up Brett Bodine's sponsor banner, and they'll be unhappy about that. No damage done. He makes the left-hand turn into what is turn four here at Pocono. That's when you go behind the wall. Caution will fly, and Schrader is in front of Bodine as they come back towards start finish. There is the car out of harm's way. They will wave that caution, and that means that when they come back to the wire, Schrader may have the opportunity to get that lap back. This time, I don't think Bodine will be able to repass him, so Schrader will accomplish what he missed out on a lap to go, and uh, can we confirm, Phil, this will put him back on the lead lap. He got that earlier, earlier with back on the penny. Yes, it will. I'll tell you, this could be a real pivotal point in the race, too, because Schrader, you notice, has been trying to get his lap back, so he's been running towards the front ever since they got their brake problem solved, so, so now he's going to go all the way back around, catch up to the tail end of the field, and if he has time to work his way back to the front, he really may be a force to be reckoned with. Schrader always runs well at this racetrack. It'll be fun to watch him in victory lane. That's a beat-up race car. If he can bring that puppy home, it'll be a comment on how difficult it is to win in Winston Cup competition. Let's go to Dick Berggren with a familiar face. Well, Richard, we have we have an 800 number, and your fans have clogged it up, wanting to make sure you're all right. Tell them you're okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, you know, we just come off the second corner there. There was three or four boys in front of me. And I got off. I come off there really good, had a good hope, and uh, they come off, and then they quit. I don't know where they, what happened in front of them, but anyhow, some of them slammed on brakes or something, and I just knocked the fool out of somebody and uh, then wound up in the wall. But, Pull the car up, but it didn't bother me any. So, uh, come back again inside, I guess. Well, that's the important thing. Nobody called asking about the car. They all wanted to know about you. I'm doing fine. I'll be, I'll be ready for Michigan next week. There you go. Richard Petty, the king. Richard may not like me bringing this up, but I'm going to do it anyway. They have put an exercise bicycle on the truck now. They haul the bicycle to the races. Richard has cut back a little on his personal appearance schedule, and just like the rest of us ought to be, Richard's going to start taking a little better care of himself and uh, working on the bicycle to keep himself in, uh, in good shape to continue to race well into the 50s. Let's go to uh, into his 50s, we should say, and into the decade of the 90s. Let's go to Pat Patterson. Well, we just wanted to let everybody know, Dave, that... Uh there's only one lap to go, and a few cars are going to come in and, uh, and get some fuel. Most of them got tires on the last stop, so uh, basically for the only reason to come in, unless you've got another tire problem with the last set you got, is going to be just to duck on quickly, get fuel. The leader's uh, pit, Jeff Bodine, uh, has gas can poised, but when the one-to-go sign came out, they said, well, never mind, we'll just go with what we got. Walter does make a late stop. We have an 800 number you can call today with your questions. That number is 1-800-522-RACE, R-A-C-E. Tim Starlipper wants to be a superstar of stock car racing someday. He's from Charlotte. That's a good place to be from if you want to get in the racing business. Billy wants to know how many asphalt hours he needs to get onto the NASCAR circuit. He's starting his racing career next season. How many asphalt hours do I need for NASCAR? I'm really not sure in hours, Dave, but you can he has to be able to, you know, to run well on the track he's starting on, then go up to another division. If he starts in hobby, go to the next division, then the next division, and get where he runs well in the division he's running in. And then he can think about maybe going to Bush Grand National or something like that. Is there a danger in trying to go too quickly? And, and how do you kind of rein in? How do you keep from being impatient and want to jump right into the next division too soon? Well, I think there definitely is a danger of going too quickly because, uh, you, you know, you can only do so much. And uh, for him to try to come out run, run uh, one, one year of hobby cars around North Carolina at Hickory or Concord, something like that, and to try to come and run with these guys, it would be impossible. And he would just, uh, if he had somebody behind him paying the money, and then, then they wouldn't be there long because they knew it, you know, they wouldn't be getting anything out of it. So he just needs to take his time and do, uh, you know, do well at where he's racing and what division he's racing and then just try to gradually move up quickly Lynn St. James yes um, I've talked to Jack Roush about that a lot too talking about our new teams and expanding teams and and I would concur with this that we, he feels that you need at least 3,000 miles on each racetrack before you really know and can be a contender at a racetrack that's a lot of miles on each track yes, indeed. Tim I hope we get a chance to call get you ready, get, ready, get, ready. get ready get ready get ready get ready go go that was the spotter signal. Go, go. The command to Kyle. The spotter high overhead has a better view of the overall situation than does the driver and actually gives the driver the command to start. So Kyle gets a good jump here as Bodine continues to lead this race. He was on the point for the restart and has none of the leaders pitted. 
good action here at Pocono all day long, in part because of the flurry of yellows. Nobody likes a yellow cluttered race. We've had seven today. The record is nine. But one thing it has done is kept those leaders in tight formation up front all afternoon long. The most consistent car in the pack has been Bodine, and he's back at the head of the field once again. This is Jeff Bodine. Brett Bodine has led the race on one occasion, but... Uh, Jeff has been the strongest and most consistent driver all day. We should update that Detroit BB was uninjured in that crash that brought out the last yellow. Let's confirm uh, that information. And now Cope coming up from second spot. Third is Ernie Irvine. Fourth, I believe, is still Rusty Wallace as the field worked their way down towards start finish. And looky here. The old dominator, Dale Earnhardt, is up to sixth place. Think how well he'd be doing if he was healthy, Phil. <laughs> Knowing Eric. Knowing Earnhardt, probably not any better at all. Uh, Bill Elliott's <laughs> on schedule pit stop. Is that another flat tire? That will be absolutely unbelievable. He is on pit road. There's a better view of it. The, as you can see, the crash truck is still right in front of him, tending to Troy Beebe. Must be. There's no reason to be changing tires right now unless one of them's flat. After everything he's gone through, he worked his way up to sixth place on this uh, particular restart, and I can't believe he's got to have bad luck again. What a, what a shame for the Elliots. They really need to build some momentum back and to show that they are championship caliber team. They've had a terrible, terrible season, and really the whole essence of that bad luck has been flat tires. They've just had them over and over and over again. Timely question from Jim Harris of uh, Hillsville, Virginia, watching on telescripts today. Uh, now that Bill Elliott has a new crew chief, what has happened to Ernie Elliott? Well, the question is, Ernie basically has more time to work in the shop, work on the engine, and prepare that race car. Mike Beam is the new uh, crew chief in question. And some people speculate that Beam was brought on board because that is a family operation and a team that has been together for so many years. The speculation was that perhaps they needed somebody to come in from the outside and play the bad guy, that it, uh, they needed to make some changes, and that Beam was the guy to do it. It's working pretty well. Yellow will fly again, the eighth caution of the day. We'll see what it's about as we see Dale Jarrett slowing out there. The eighth caution of the day has flown with Jeff Bodine leading this race. We approach a record for race cautions here at Pocono in what is going to be a long afternoon on this two-and-a-half-mile oval. Check that. That is the ninth caution. Let's confirm that because if so, that ties the record. It is debris on the racetrack. Perhaps a chunk of Bill Elliott's tire could be. Elliott had to make the stop for the tire change. I believe that is his eighth flat tire in the last three races. That could also be Dale Jarrett's because we saw Dale Jarrett going slow, so that could have been what, why he was going slow. Another break for Bill Elliott, though. He came in and had a, a, a real tough break, but boom, the caution comes right out, and he gets back. Now he can catch up with the field again and, and try to work his way towards the front. Let's confirm that. It is nine cautions today. That ties the record that was set in the 1984 running of this race and, uh, in fact, has been equaled on four subsequent occasions. So nine is not an uncommon number in this event. We've got 75 laps to go as they watch the action from NASCAR Race Control. It's, uh... We're inside NASCAR Control right now. These are the people that run the race. These are these people that tell this flagman to throw the caution flag. They tell the pace car when to move when to come in and tell the flag man when to throw the green flag. Didn't do anything terribly interesting or revealing there, but this is indeed the nerve center of the competition here. And uh, the debris on the racetrack was spotted undoubtedly by one of their safety personnel, quickly radioed in, yellow flag flies. Now I think perhaps they're trying to direct the crew to where it is. Let's listen. And on the right is Dick Beatty. On the left, the coach, Les Richter, former football star, now NASCAR competition organizer. Here come all the leaders. They realize this caution will extend another lap. All the leaders are going to come on pit road. Here is the leader in the race. Bodine slides her into the Junior Johnson pit. Junior goes in for the chassis adjustment on the left rear. Looks like they're going to right side tires. Let's go to Pat Patterson. Watch the jack man. Pump the jack five times to get the car up in the air. All right, now the wheels are going on. The jack comes down. The car is gone. Now, the reason I wanted to show you the jack man is because technology in Winston Cup Racing has now 
have gotten us to a jack that you only have to jack one time to get the car up in the air. We'll try to find one of those to a little bit later on this afternoon. But uh, technology, again, giving a lot of help in the pits. And now let's go up, let's go up to my partner, Dick Berger. Well, Pat, this is the tire that came off the left front of Dale Jarrett's car. We've had several tires that have looked just like this. I want to point out this is not the fault of the tire manufacturer at Goodyear. What happens when you run over a rock or a piece of debris at 150 miles an hour, that's like putting a knife right in the thing. And once it slices, that's it. She's history. She blows up. Uh, we've had several of these. Nothing wrong with the tires, but, boy, they're sure hard to drive when they get flat like that, I'll tell you. Well, look who has emerged as the new leader of the race here. Robbie Moroso, who brought out one of the record-tying nine cautions today with an earlier spin after a tangle with another driver, hangs in there. You said, Lynn, doesn't matter what goes wrong. Keep thinking you'll get back to the front. Robbie proves you know what you're talking about. It takes that kind of attitude, and it's even more demonstrated it so much more in NASCAR racing than any other form of racing I've ever seen. And it's just, it's amazing. I mean, Mark's attitude, you know, we're just going to stick and scrape and, and dig down there and get everything we can get, and it ain't over till it's over. And boy, is this, this is just, it's, it's just continued to be demonstrated. We'll see who else is up there with him if uh, the scoreboard is correct. And Daryl Waltrip is second. He would certainly fall into that same category here today. There's Ricky Rudd, who, uh, for a lot of his fans, he is back out. He lost a number of laps, about 80 laps, 60 or 80 laps. So, but he is back up uh, chasing the point. We can confirm it was 84 laps. Is that right, that uh, Ricky Rudd lost? That would be comparable to the number that... Uh, that, uh, Darryl, uh, that Dale Earnhardt and his boys spent in the pits at Dover rebuilding after they broke a camshaft. And those were some great pictures of the two-time Winston Cup champion. They were fixing his own motor because they, you know, had a problem, but they came back and got 12 more points. Mike Weller, watching on Warner Amex Cable in Cincinnati, Ohio, wants to know if Phil Parsons has an opinion of when NASCAR might go to V6 engines like we see in the Grand National Division with 3,500-pound cars. I think that they have to prove the reliability right now of them. Uh, Ford is, does not really have a that, that good a V6 program. Uh, Mark Martin does run some Ford V6 engines, and uh, they, you know, they have a, a tough time lasting for a 300-mile race in a Grand National car. So I think they have to get that ironed up before they can think, really think about going to them in the Winston Cup cars. Taking a look at our lap leaders here. Now, if Lynn St. James' theory is correct, and that were really the case, they would go ahead and make that change and leave the Ford guys behind. But uh, apparently that's not going to happen. Obviously, we joke about all of this Ford versus Chevy business. One of the things is, again, we watch the, the leaders who have led the race thus far today. NASCAR works very hard at maintaining what they call parity. They want as many different brands in their competing and running as possible year in and year out because they know it brings out the fans and it brings in a lot of manufacturer money. They also don't want to make many changes. I mean, I think change, any change in this form of racing is a big change to them, and that would be a really, really big change, particularly reliability. I mean, you're... Uh, even though Phil was saying it's just the Fords don't have a six-cylinder, I don't know that the reliability is even there in the six-cylinders in the, in the GM, and they just don't want to risk anything, and uh, I think that's a big part of it. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah. This is a good show. It's perhaps the best show in all of motorsports, and uh, they don't want to make uh, a mess of it. And I, I didn't want to argue with Lynn earlier when she answered the question, but I've driven a GM <laughs> car all my life, and uh, you know I, I've always thought that they really catered to the Fords, so I think we have a little difference of opinion there. <laughs> Somebody wants to know why they don't go to fuel injection. Paul Walford calling from Cox Cable in Saginaw, Michigan. I'll take a shot at that one. NASCAR wants to hold the price of racing down. Fuel injection goes faster, but is more expensive. So why bother? You don't need it when you've got competition like this. Robbie Moroso leading Daryl Waltrip off into turn number one. Rick Wilson in third. Three cars that have not been at the head of the pack all day. Indeed, have been near the back of the pack. Now, with some fuel injection, they might be able to stay there, but without it, i got a feeling they're going to see some of these guys come storming back up there and uh, run all over their bumpers because there is Bodine challenged by Wallace. Derek Cope running right behind him. This is the scramble to get back to the front. We've got to look at a guy that uh, I'm sure that Lynn has raced with a time or two before. Tommy Riggins is making a Winston Cup start here today. He is number 54. And now we begin to see that the, uh, the vision is not as good as it was early in the day as the oil and grit begin to mess up the windshield. And that low sun starts shining into the eyes of Rusty Wallace as he tries to do something with Derek Cope. This restart has dropped all of these guys a bit deeper into the field, and they've got some uh, catch-up to play here today. Mr. Excitement Jimmy Spencer is under the gun of Rusty Wallace right now. 
deep dives inside and makes the pass. Spencer has not really been a factor in this race thus far today, and it looks like Wallace will make easy work of him on the inside. Waltrip, the veteran, working on number 20, Moroso, and a report that perhaps Kyle Petty has a problem on the racetrack. That would be very unfortunate. He has run so well all day. Here is Kulwicki, the third-place man, and Kulwicki's been stout from the outset. That car has not suffered the plague of problems that, uh, that they've endured early this season. In fact, he's got a notion to go all the way to the lead. Well, they take this three wide. They go two wide as Kulwicki slides inside Waltrip. Waltrip saw the problem come and figured, I better let Moroso in there and make some way here, or we might all end up in the fence. And Alan Kowicki may well come out of this with the lead. For the first time today, he does. As they flash across the start finish, Alan Kowicki determined that a team that he runs himself, he as an owner-operator, can get back on top of the heap. He asserts himself at a track where he came so close to winning his first race of his career a few years back. Dale Earnhardt foxed him on the last lap. He is still the owner of the track record here. So Pocono's a good place for Kowicki, and it's good to see that car back up front the way they've struggled this year. You know, I, it's really tough, as you were saying, for Allen to try to do everything. And I remember back in the early 80s when I was running the Kelly American Challenge Series, I owned and operated my own team, managed the whole thing. And, boy, it, all along, I, like you were saying, I kept saying, oh, I can do all this. I can handle this. And... You think you can, but it really does have a, an impact on you. And, of course, here with a 30-plus race schedule, it's tough. But I think Allen's showing that he can do it. It's just a matter of whether he's been able to get the best out of his driving uh, with the, the, the manner that he's had, style that he's taken. And, of course, the problem is consistency. You can do it once in a while, but if it gets to be too much and then your performances start to fall off, the pressure begins to increase. Sponsor wants to be up front, and that's where they are right now. So Cole Wicke is perhaps responding to that pressure very, very well here today. In fact, he is pulling away from Moroso and Waltrip. He, for the moment, has the fastest car out there, and indeed, these are the second and third place cars. So Waltrip's gotten a whole bunch better from where he was early in the day, and Moroso, who was stuck in the grass down there for a little while, has uh, certainly improved his lot substantially. They flash by the lapped car of Randy LaJoy as we work lap 133 of 200 here. Where does the uh, mid-race slump come, Phil? In a race this long, i got to think at some point that the reflexes start to fade, the heat starts to get to you. Or can you maintain that perfect uh, uh, level of sharpness, that edge, all the way through 200 laps at this place? I really think these drivers are so conditioned to running 500 miles that I don't think you'll see any depreciable amount of... Uh, of give up right at the very end of the race uh, or at any stage in the middle of the race. So right now they're doing all they can do. They're running the car absolutely as hard as it'll go unless they're just trying to take it easy and just stay in position towards the end of the race. But I think, it, but if they had to, I think they could give 100% again uh, at any time. Your viewer questions go to 1-800-522-RACE today. 1-800-522-RACE on our unique commercial free telecast of Winston Cup Racing, and Pat Patterson has a viewer question to deal with. Whoa, trouble on the racetrack. Big spin as Robbie Moroso hits the fence. Second spin of the day, and he's in trouble. Is everybody going to get by? Unbelievable. Let's pray that that continues and everybody can snake through. That car is sitting dead center in the middle of the racetrack, and everybody got by, and Phil, I don't think there is a scarier moment in racing than that right there. Boy, I tell you, that was tough. Uh, it's, that's a very fast part of the racetrack, and as fast as the cars were going, I tell you, that just shows the skill of the drivers that they can they can get by him without without hitting him. He's sitting dead sideways in the middle of the racetrack. Can't and you were talking about a mid-race lull or something. <laughs> I mean, those guys had to be absolutely on top of everything and sharp to be able to anticipate that. And thank God we got a wide racetrack as well. That helps. Good point. Reminiscent of Bobby Allison. Can't help but think of Bobby when something like that happens. And report that Bobby on this Father's Day is doing just fine. Coming back as a Winston Cup car owner. Let's hey, watch the radio back over there. We'll just listen in a minute here and see what we can pick up. We're getting reports that the 75 car of Rick Wilson was also in it. Uh, I'm looking over towards the accident site, and, and he he has pulled away. So he will remain in the same life, but he was involved. He may, he may have spun after he got by, after the evasive move to get by Robbie, then he may have been out of shape and spun. Real good point. Let's go to Dick Bergren and Moroso's pit. 
This car is really beat up. The back end is damaged. The left side is damaged. The hood is virtually off. About the only thing holding it on are the hood pins. Just before this all happened, Robbie had called his crew and suggested coming in, but they said no. On the other hand, the team says the reason for the accident, they think, was that when he tried to get by the 75 Rick Wilson, air got underneath the car, lifted it up, and of course, that'll do you. That'll turn you around in a big way. In the meanwhile, they got a big way type problem just to get this car so it'll run in a straight line. Robbie Moroso, well, he was running so well, he had been running second, but he's not going to have a great finish today, probably. No, but he's learned a valuable lesson here today, perhaps two lessons. We're going to go back and take a look at this, uh, see the replay. Phil, put your eyeball on this and see if you can figure out what happened. He looked just fine, and then... Uh... I think he's going right through the tunnel turn. They look just fine. And the, you can see the back end start to slip out. He was looks like he may have been a little bit high. Yeah, I he think may he have was got definitely the, high. He may have got the right rear tire up in the loose stuff, and that, that just sent him around and into the wall. Like Daryl said earlier, there's no if you spin out in the tunnel turn, you're going to hit the wall. And there's you've got to be down low. You can see that everybody has always been down low. Daryl was just, you know, maybe a half a car length, but that half a car length is uh, a lot. Uh, a lot. It makes a big difference of where you get traction. The frightening aftermath as everybody slithered by without contact and Apparently, the Rick Wilson spin was indeed a post Moroso spin in starting to the bottom of the racetrack to get by. Wilson then lost the car. I don't think Wilson hit anything. And incidentally, that is the same mistake that Robbie Moroso made when he qualified. He ran several feet outside the good groove and then admitted that that cost him a good qualifying run. He made the same mistake in racing conditions. And here you see the damage. He hit that wall a ton and has badly beat up that race car. So the lessons to be learned today for this youngster are substantial, but he's a quick study, and from all indications, he is going to be one of the stars of stock car racing to come. We right. talked about that paint, you know, he was supposed to be down there by that paint that we talked about earlier, and, and sometimes I think um, if you've just run Speedway stuff, and I don't know if Robbie's run any road racing stuff, or how, how many times he's run here, but you forget that, you know, you might want to take a, more of a traditional Speedway line, and uh, as opposed to really paying attention and being exactly where you need to be on this racetrack. Let's look at a replay from Rusty Wallace's in-car camera of what happened to Robbie Moroso. This ought to be interesting as we see you it see, the way Rusty saw it. You see the smoke from uh, Robbie Moroso's car. Now now everyone's trying to take evasive action to get by. You can't. The sun is so bad. Rusty won't see a lot. There you see Robbie out of the Robbie side window. Fence. Here we go. Here we are. Back to green. Alan Kowicki leading. Keep in mind... What you can't see, Rusty can't see either. Rusty can't see any better than the camera can. They only clean the windshield right in front of the driver. We're back under green flag, and we have Alan Kowicki in the lead with Rusty Wallace about to challenge him. Wallace stuck the nose inside and said, I've got to be a little more patient. I'm not going to do that right now. Let's listen to the radio. Last call is to the left, Rusty Pitt, this time. That sounded like a call to pit. That, uh, are they going to caution this again? We'll see what's happening here. Wallace. He's getting black flag for jumping the restart. Ah, ah, okay. Wallace yeah. has indeed jumped the restart, tried to pass before. Let's check with Phil, make sure we got the rule right. Why the black flag? What did he do wrong? You're supposed to stay in, in line or pass to the outside until you get to the start finish line. I looked down and Rusty had a incredible jump. He okay. passed about four cars, and that's why he got the black flag. Listen to the racer radio. Stop and go penalty. Go. He's mad, I guarantee you. Look at that tightness in his mouth. Wallace had just challenged for the lead and we're going to take another look at it and see what it was that sent Rusty Wallace to the back of the field. Look at that going off. Pass to the right to get to the stripe. See, we hadn't got to the start finish line left. You just overheard the conversation that, uh, that the, you passed on the left before you got to the stripe and obviously Rusty did. I attended my first NASCAR driver's meeting this morning, and that was one of the things that Dick Betty brought out, that if you pass on the left, um, that you are then going to be black flagged and penalized to uh, stop and go. And it doesn't even matter if you're the Winston Cup champion. He is, and he did, and he's penalized. 
And now the pole sitting car has gone on pit road. There is Ernie Irvine sliding into the Morgan McClure pit for a right side tire change. And it seems that after every one of these caution flags, somebody goes out and immediately cuts the tire. It seems like nobody's exempt, Dave. It seems like almost every car in the field has had a flat tire today. There is the exit by Irvine. We have broken the record for cautions. We are now 10 cautions into this race. Nine was the record. That is not the record you want to set at any racetrack. What we have today, it has made it an eventful and exciting Miller Genuine Draft 500 here today. And the biggest excitement is yet to come when we come down to the shootout at the end of this race. Let's just hope that that final yellow doesn't come and affect the outcome. Let's hope they get to race home today. We will have roughly 60 laps to go as we complete this one right here. Paul Wicke coming by. Look at the old rivals. Derek Carol Waltrip and Dale Earnhardt. Have those two raced a time or two for championship points or not? They're at it again for third and fourth. Check that for fourth and fifth here this afternoon. Earnhardt battling the bug, also trying to do some business on Waltrip, and perhaps Earnhardt sticking to the bottom just a little bit better here. Looks like he might have a better handling car. Daryl wasn't on the inside throwing rocks at Dale like he said he was going to in the course description. <laughs> throw him on Dale. Throw him on Rusty. Get off my tail. That was a great one. Let's Walter. see if he does it now. Let's see he's going into the tunnel turn. While that happens, we got this same battle going on here. We'll get back to it, Lynn. Uh, this is the battle between Greg Sachs, who has suddenly reemerged as a factor here, and the number 11 of Jeff Bodine. And this is the race for second place. Sachs has been up and down the ladder today, a little like Ernie Irvin. Lynn? Well, I was just watching Sachs' car, and he's definitely got some oversteer there. I mean, he had to crank some extra turn, or push, I'm sorry, he had to push in there because he had to crank some extra turn in just to get around there and be right on the line. So he's. Uh, He's maybe not handling as well as he was earlier, but certainly not a surprise that he's back up to the front. Big move by Earnhardt. Dives her into the inside. Makes the pass on Waltrip up the front straightaway. Says, Daryl, I'm out of here. And heads off to turn one. And now as we see, we go back up and check the progress on that second place battle. We see the interval grow a little bit. Sachs pulling away by two or three car lengths from Bodine. Pretty good racing all around this racetrack. Earnhardt has moved up to fourth. He had been all the way at the tail end of the lead lap at one point and then at the back of the field. So pretty impressive indeed that Earnhardt has been able to battle back here considering the fact that he's not a well man today. Colwicky is your leader. Sachs is second. Jeff Bodine is third. Earnhardt passing Waltrip to take over fourth and fifth spot. So that's your top five. Dick Trickle has finally reemerged in the top ten. Trickle's got a beat-up race car, but he is sixth. Cope is seventh. Davey Allison is eighth. Kyle Petty has fallen to ninth. Morgan Shepard is now tenth. He has been in the top ten in every race this year except one. He is in the top ten just barely at this moment. And look at this. Colwicky, the leader, has fallen into the clutches of number 18, a day-long frontrunner, Greg Sachs, and his partner for the moment, Number 11, the day-long frontrunner of this race, if you will. The man who's run up front more than anybody else, Jeff Bodine. Three good cars ready to slug it out here with 39 laps to go. Check that, 59 laps to go. And see who's got the best stuff as we start setting up for the run to the finish. Sachs had a notion, wanted to challenge in turn three, elected not to do that. And gives Colwicky the good line as they come up the front straight away. Let's see if he'll hook up with Bodine and Dart to the inside. Down they come. Now I think Colwicky's got him covered this time. But Earnhardt taking advantage of that shuffle closes in from fourth. And now we hear that Dick Trickle will be on pit road. Indeed, the fifth place car, check that sixth place car, goes to the pit. So Trickle, just as he seemed in position to challenge, stops on pit road. Let's go to Dick Bergren. Well, Dave Despain, just about as you said, Dick Trickle had worked his way back into the top ten, an unscheduled pit stop, apparently another cut tire. This is, again, the result of guys running through the infield. They throw the rocks out, and uh, when the rocks get on the racetrack, tires get cut. Trickle's the latest victim. He's doing a four-tire change under green. It will cost him dearly. Let's talk a little bit more about that situation. You have an unusual racetrack here, Phil, in that... Here, the only super speedway where it happens, you actually stick the tires in the dirt. That, that kicks the rocks up. But I guess the question is, what could they do about that? I mean, is there any solution to that problem? The only thing they can do is the same thing they did over in the tunnel turn, is put ripple strips down there where you, where you cannot get in the dirt. And I know that a lot of drivers have asked them to do that. 
uh, in the past, and for uh, for some reason they have not done it. So the drivers would just as soon not be down there dirt track. Today. I think so. I mean, I, you know, you, you, we've seen how many cars have had a flat tire today. Uh, I'm sure every guy that had a flat tire today w <laughs> wishes there was a ripple strip on the inside. Yeah, let's certainly go for that. Well, don't they have the option of just not not doing that, not driving down there? No, it's a fast way to go. So you're going to run the fast way to go if you have to put all four tires on the grass. If that was a fast way to go, that's what you're going to do. Here's what a lot of caution flags will do for you. 29 cars are on the lead lap. If you had a 150 lap green flag run like we've seen here at Pocono on at least one occasion in the past, a lot of those cars would fall off the lead lap. But the leaders are not able to run under green for a long run, and thus they can't put those guys away. And as a result, every time we bunch them up, we've got 29 people thinking they're a potential winner here. 29 cars on the lead lap, 143 laps into this competition, and that's a pretty impressive number. Kawicki, the leader, trying to fend off the number 18 of Greg Sachs. Bo Nine, eager to mount a challenge, and perhaps this will be the time when Dale Earnhardt will go to the front. Bill Elliott is back on pit road. They are changing tires yet again. What does this make? Three for him this race? Three today. Yeah, three today. He came into this race with a, a seven flat tire, a record of seven flat tires in the last three races. He's now up to ten flat in four races. They are going all the way around this time. No, they didn't either. They went to the right side. And so Bill Elliott returns to the fray. The man has won here more than any other driver. We should mention, Dave, that it's not the tire's fault that he's having all these flat tires. I mean, this racetrack it's because of the rocks being thrown up in turns one and three. It's, so it's not the tire's fault. These tires are only about four or five, 30 percent of an inch thick, and it doesn't take much to, to puncture a tire that thin. And the reason that Bill Elliott uh, it comes in here on such a string of uh, flat tires is that we've just come from Sears Point, which is a road race track, and we know these stock car guys just they talk about the precision of road racing. When they race those stock cars at Sears Point, they kind of use the road as a general guideline of where to go. And you'll see a lot of dirt flying when these guys go up. Uh, Just a reasonable fact, so simile of the racetrack. Yeah. So there was a lot of rocks to run over there, too, and that's precisely what happens. We'll take you a little further back in the field on our next run down here, which will be coming up in just a moment. We're completing lap 145, so stand by for that. These are the three front runners at the moment. Kowicki is leading over Sachs and Bodine content for the moment to run there. I thought maybe this is when we were going to see uh, Dale Earnhardt come up and do some business. Bodine's got the best car of these three right now. I've been watching these, and um, in both Alan Kowicki and second place car are having, I'm sorry, Greg Sachs, are having a really, they're working the cars a lot harder. They've got push. They're, they're not able to be right on the racetrack as easily, I think, as Jeff Bodine. He may be content only in the track position, but he's got the best car of the three right now. Good point, Len. Kyle Petty is struggling a little bit now, trying to get back into fifth position around Davey Allison. He has been up and down the ladder as much as anybody else here today, but it's been that kind of a race. I think Bodine, now perhaps we would add Kowicki to the list. The only two guys who've been able to consistently stay up front. There is the Bodine move. He was listening, Lynn. Uh, diving to the inside, Bodine makes his move on Sachs and puts the Ford ahead of the Chevrolet in the race for second place. Right over the tunnel turn, scariest place on the racetrack to make that move. So it's two Fords up front. Look at that black car on the right side of your picture. There's Dale Earnhardt. This is the best he has run all day. He's within a car length and a half of Greg Sachs, who's running third. Climbing his way back to the top, Earnhardt putting the uh, discomfort of that virus behind him and says, hey, I'm the toughest guy out here. I believe it, and it's important to me that the rest of these guys believe it. And so that just reinforces the legend by going out here and turning into the kind of drive that he has turned into today. For Earnhardt, the key is to avoid the bad luck that has plagued them over the last three events. They really need a turnaround race here at Pocono, having run... Uh, in their last three races back in the 30s and below due to crashes and mechanical problems. And Bodine quickly reeling in Colwicky. Is this going to be a charge right to the front lane? Is that car good enough to go around Colwicky's forward as well and take the lead? I think so. He's, he's pushing Allen. I said I think Allen's having to drive harder, to work harder, to get the car to do what it needs to do to stay where it's at. So I think that, uh, that Jeff's going to just chip away and be right up there. Bodine good at this racetrack. He's been coming here since 1969. Now think about that. This is 1990. He's got 21 years of experience on this racetrack, going back to the modified days, and uh, that's an awful lot of racing here. He knows his way around. The yellow car that he just moved by is Ernie Irvan. That's Rick Wilson in the 75. That is Rick Wilson, yeah, and, and the damage that he's... That
that he has there is from his spin when he was involved in that Moroso uh, episode. I think one update that we might want to work on, and we'll, we'll uh, give our pit reporters this assignment, we probably ought to find out more about what happened to Irvin as he made that uh, unscheduled stop. Kawicki back up front holding on to the position that uh, he has managed to maintain here through most of the, uh, what, from about 125, 130 on. He's been the strong cat. Challengers are abundant, though, today, and I think that you can you can bet that uh, we'll have another leader before this is over. There is the four car of Ernie Irvine. He came into this season having signed on with Junie Dunleavy. They had a big sponsorship uh, program for the team out of uh, Richmond, Virginia. Junie, perhaps the best loved car owner in the business. I don't think there's anybody on pit road who doesn't like Junie Dunleavy. Here are the last four finishes for Ernie Irvine. Look at that consistency. Fourth, fifth, seventh, and seventh. Actually cracked the top ten in the point standings. Didn't get in the car until the fourth race of the season. Basically, in the case of the Dunleavy deal, the check bounced. The sponsorship disappeared. Irvine suddenly found himself with nothing to drive. These guys came along and said, drive our car. Put him in a five-year deal. And so, as we mentioned at the top of the show. It was from the poorhouse to the penthouse for Ernie Irvine, and he has responded very effectively. They had a problem with that car uh, just a few laps ago, and I suspect it was the same one that we've seen so often today. I think it was the flat tire problem that got Earnhardt as well, uh, that got to Irvine as well. We are inside Rusty Wallace's car as he does battle here with the lap, Dave Marcus. He's running 21st right now. Um, I think he started 24th. I feel like he started back where he started after all that work of getting up to the front. But I think he's showing that he can run right back up there and he's got to pass some lap uh, car or some cars, though, to get by. That is the consequence of a penalty, a stop-and-go penalty for jumping the restart. He puts Marcus away as they head into turn three. And Wallace, uh, again, considers this a very critical race not only to continue their recent turnaround, he's won two of the last three races, but also because of the two super speedway races looming ahead, Daytona and Talladega, where he figures he won't run real well. Top three, still all in the single frame at Pocono as we get a little longer run of green here. Here's Ernie Irvan. Do I understand that Dick Bergman might have the answer to our questions about him? Dick? Well, actually, Dave Despain, you had the answer to the question. The entire problem with Irvin, according to his crew chief, is simply that he had to come in and change that tire. Other than that, they say the car is fine. Not so with Mark Martin, whose car is overheating. They're out there. They're just going to try to hang in. But if it gets a whole lot worse, Mark Martin's day will be over. They have engine problems. Very unlikely for these guys. Well, indeed, and very unfortunate, too. The timing couldn't be worse for Mark Martin, who came in here as the point leader with tremendous momentum and suddenly finds that he doesn't have a car that will run all day. A very unusual situation for uh, that team to find itself in. But I promised you a little deeper run down into the field. Let me give you that now. At, uh, at lap 150, Kawicki was your leader. There he is, pressured by the second-place man, Bodine. Third place was Greg Sachs. Fourth, Dale Earnhardt. Fifth. Davy Allison, and now we'll follow it along on the screen here. I'm sure we join Davy in wishing Happy Father's Day to Bobby Allison. Kyle Petty was sixth, Daryl Waltrip seventh, Cope eighth, Shepard ninth, Harry Gant rounding out the top ten after 150 of 200 laps. Marlin uh, Bodine next in line as we continue to run down through 15th, and here's the pass for the lead. As Bodine, just the way Lynn called it, proceeds right under Alan Kowicki. T-Bird versus T-Bird. I don't see any discrimination against those Fords today. Well, right into the lead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm glad you're on my side anyway, Dave. Now, wait a minute. I'm not on anybody's side in that one. <laughs> 11th is Sterling Marlin. 12th again is Brett Bodine. 13th, Mark Martin, but in trouble. 14th, interestingly enough, Rick Wilson, despite the spin. 15th, the number 12 of Hutt Strickland. Good racing up front. A three-car battle. We talked about the fact that the cautions had kept it close. This is one of the longer runs of green flag racing that we've seen all day. And this is great racing. As that Chevy driver says, I'm going to get up there and get in the middle of this. And all of a sudden, Bodine falls back about four or five car lengths. Whatever you say about it, whichever side of the battle you, you uh, whichever side of the fence you choose to take, Chevy versus Ford is probably the quintessential rivalry in American motorsports. NASCAR knows it. They do everything they can to feed the flames, and right now we got the best of it. As, uh, we make a Ford sandwich out of Greg Sachs, a part-time campaigner this year, but I suspect that team will come along with the involvement of 
of Paul Newman and Rick Hendrick and turn into a force to be reckoned with for the decade of the 90s. Here's the shot as they come down that front straightaway, and there's the move to the inside by the Chevy. Trying to do something with Kowicki, who suddenly looks like the strongest guy out there. Couldn't do anything with that Ford engine, could he, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have that 800 number ring here. You keep that up. 1-800-522-RACE. Please, questions only. No death threats for either Phil Parsons or Lee St. James. 1-800-522-RACE. Give us a call. Whatever kind of car you like to drive, whoever you favor in terms of manufacturers. Let's go down to one of those Ford pits of Pat Patterson. Well, Dave, as we've talked about, Alan's the car owner and the manager of the team and uh, the man most responsible. But back here in the pits, Paul Andrews calls a lot of the shots. And Paul, so he's just hearing something from his driver. So we'll hold on here just a second. Let's call what he's talking about. Paul, the car seems to be working awfully well up there right now. Yeah, the car has been working real good all day. The Xerix 4 Thunderbird is a little bit loose right now, but uh, we're going to try to tighten it up. And uh, on the next pit stop, which shouldn't be no problem. We already, I don't know how long, how much longer we're holding two guys off, but uh, we always talk about Alan making the call. Is he making calls right now as far as when he wants to pit and what he wants to do? Well, right now, you know, the, like I said, our car's getting loose, and, and the next caution will probably will pit. And as far as gas stops, you know, we make the calls there. We've got all the figures here, but we let him know what's going on. He won't know what's going on. You know, with the joint effort. You watch this guy. I mean, can he get it done today? As long as we can get him out up front, I don't think there'll be any problem. I think I think he can get it done. You know, it just depends on how the how the tires react when we put them on and, and how, how good the other guys run right when they first come out. Well, guys, I remember Alan Kowicki when he ran the last lap here against Dale Earnhardt. Earnhardt got the back best of him on the back stretch, and Earnhardt ended up winning that day. I'm sure Kowicki would want to have that same matchup again this afternoon. Right now, Alan Kowicki is benefiting from an incredible battle for second. Kowicki gets away a little bit as this dog fight takes the spotlight. Bodine trying to hold off the repeated thrusts of the number 18 of Greg Sachs. And as he does so, Earnhardt says, I'm going to stick my nose up into that. And Davey Allison says, me too. And Kyle Petty said, why not make it five? And we've got a tremendous battle for second spot. The move by Kyle Petty to the inside on Davey Allison. That is Pontiac versus Ford. Ahead of them, the black Chevy of Dale Earnhardt. And just a lap ago, those guys were running over the top of each other at the tunnel turn. What triggers that, Phil? Why is it that all at once a whole bunch of guys all seem to get the Man, here, here's the move now to the inside. This is the race for second spot. What's going on here? This right here is what creates it. When you get side by side, neither car can run quite as fast as if they were single file. And you notice here, Dale Earnhardt, now Kyle pulling right back up on him. That's what creates it. When you get the cars running side by side, they can't run their own groove. So it slows them down once the cars behind catch up. Sachs may have gotten a little bit of a love tap from Earnhardt right Maybe there. Maybe may have gotten a little <laughs> bit of a love tap. Man, that was a tap if I see the tap. Uh, Dale, Dale gets mad if I say he hit people, so I can't do that here. He may have gotten a little love tap. And Patty just about drove off the racetrack right at the edge of your screen there. Petty went way wide, gathered it back up before he hit the fence. Kowicki, again, benefiting from all this excitement. There is Kyle. Suddenly, he's all by himself. A moment ago, he was on the outside and got her loose and sideways. And uh, we've got his radio open just in case uh, he calls in to Gary Nelson to report on that incident. I think he just ran out of traction, and he was lucky he didn't run out of racetrack. So it's great racing for second spot. We talked about Kowicki as one of the drivers who prepares his own car. Barb Comer of Pompano Beach wonders if there are others. Phil says uh, he counts about eight. Who are some of the notables in that group? Uh, well, Phil? actually, we have Alan Kowicki. We have uh, uh, really you know, Dave Marcus. Jimmy Horton, Jack Pennington, uh, Chad Little prepares his own car, Jerry O'Neill, Jimmy Means, J.D. McDuffie, and really Richard Petty prepares his own car. He may not do the hands-on work, but it's done. He's actually the car owner, or his wife Linda is, right. and the car is done uh, at their shop at Petty Enterprises right near Richard Cone. And what you'll note about that, of course, is that uh, most of the guys who do their own work on their own cars or own or prepare their own cars are in the back of the field. They're the guys who don't have the opportunity to drive a frontline car. They haven't been hired as a gun for some other team. They want to go racing, so they're willing to do it themselves. 
What makes this guy, Alan Kowicki, unique is that in his years of owning and preparing his own car, he's been able to pretty consistently stay up near the front of the field. He used to do it on just a couple of three cars. Now he's got a, a full stable and some more sponsor support. I tell you, we would be very remiss if we didn't mention Bill Elliott in that flight, too, because uh, Bill may not do as much hands-on work as he used to, but the car is maintained by the Elliott family along with the addition of Mike Bean, but I think Bill still has a, an awful lot of hands-on with that race car. Tremendous input into the handling, the setup on the car. That's always been one of Bill Elliott's specialties, and it was one of the reasons that that team was able to totally dominate the super speedways back in 1985. We're going to uh, update attrition on this race. I'm also going to take you a little deeper into the field because I know some of you who have been calling said, hey, let me know how some of these other guys are running. O'Neill, Horton, and Petty are still the only three cars out of the race. Further back in the field, we have Dale Jarrett running 16th. Terry Labonte, oh, check that. We've got B.B. Moroso, I'm sorry, and Wilson. Uh, three more cars have retired since that initial three. Now, B.B. spun on pit road. Moroso hit the fence just off the tunnel. And Rick Wilson, who also spun in that episode, has now retired. He had come back from that and actually run pretty strong, but has now retired the car. We have in 17th spot Terry Labonte, who's had an up-and-down day. He got a lap down early with a tire problem, got that lap back, raced the leaders for a while, has now fallen back to 17th spot. 18th is Michael Waltrip. 19th is Jimmy Spencer. In 20th spot at lap 150 was Rusty Wallace. He has since improved on that. 21st position belonged to Chad Little. 22nd to Jack Pennington. 28th was the 38 of Jim Sauter. 29th car 25 Kenny Schrader who looked like he was going to be better than that today but that hasn't panned out for him as we said Wilson had now retired and he retired from 25th position so that'll give you a further rundown on lap 150 as we watch the continuing battle for the lead last time by I sort of counted the cars and Rusty Wallace has already moved up to 15th position so I tell you from him having a stop in the pits for a stop and go penalty and to get back and he went from 20th to 15th his car is really running well, but what he desperately needs now is a caution flag. Without a caution flag, there's no way Rusty Wallace can make up that much ground and win this race, so he has to have a caution flag. Not enough time for Wallace unless, as we see, yet another caution to come, and don't be at all surprised if that happens. We have 40 laps to go. Let's go to Dick Bergeron. Well, another viewer question, Dave. Gary Curl, Warner Cable in Houston, Texas, wants to know how many men are allowed over the wall during a pit stop. It's kind of a tough question to answer because there are a lot of ways you can go partly over a wall. You know, if you, you hook your foot in the wall and you sort of lean over, you don't count. You're not over the wall. And some days they allow an extra guy over the wall to service the driver to get the driver a drink and wipe him down, throw ice down in front and so forth. Today they're allowing an extra man over the wall to carry the right rear tire. They're increasingly conscious about tires laying on pit road. But the real answer is, in the rule book, seven men over pit wall. All right, thank you, Dick. All right, Pat Walsh from Fort Myers, Florida, wants to know how long of a distance, physical distance, there are in the pits. Well, let's find out, Pat. Let's go. Uh, that was three steps, one jump. <laughs> About 24 feet and one jump. <laughs> All right, guys, whatever it takes to get the truth for the folks out there in television land. Jed Flynn, King Video in Stillwater, Minnesota, is wondering about the percentages of money. Wait a minute. Let's listen to the radio here just a minute. 42 car, Kyle Petty's radio. He's racing with Harry Gant. Let's listen in. They've been talking. And I think they may have finished. I heard Gary Nelson tell Kyle to watch the fuel pressure. So, uh, undoubtedly, they're going to... That Kyle watched the fuel pressure. If it starts fluctuating, then he'll come on in the pits because we're getting close to green flag pit stops. Well, it's 40 laps left in the race. So. Right. They need an old flat tire. That'll, that may bring the yellow. That is uh, Dale Jarrett with a flat tire. Let's see if he can keep it in line and let's see if the yellow will fly. And if it does, the timing couldn't be perfect for these guys. Here's the race down to the wire. Diving inside. I don't see a sign of a yellow yet. This is a green flag race for the lead. Kowicki on the outside. Bodine on the inside. Looks like a photo finish to me. I wouldn't attempt to call that one. Let's see who will lead it as they go to turn number one. Davey Allison darts onto pit road. Allison will get right 
outside tires, and looky there. Diving under both the Fords goes the Chevy of number 18. The new leader of the race is Greg Sachs. Incredible competition. No yellow for Dale Jarrett, who will limp back around to the pit. And he's got a long way to go there with a flat tire. We would speculate that it might have been a tire woe as well for Davey Allison, who had worked his way all the way up to fifth. And Jarrett comes limping on pit road. Blown tires, cut tires. Cut tires have been the story here at Pocono today. That's and the second one for Dale Jarrett, too. And this is going to be a terrible break because it must have cut down down the front straightaway because he just got to the pits. And here the leaders now are going to come off turn three. So this one will definitely put Dale a lap down. A tough break. It run well. He was inside the top ten in uh, our most recent rundown, as you heard. And now we've got uh, Alan Kowicki coming on pit road. The lead car on pit road for scheduled service. Actually, Allison's stop probably was scheduled. It was a right side tire stop that would have been scheduled as they're now inside that window. Let's go to Pat Patterson. Well, it's showtime in Pocono for the number seven Z-Rex crew. And Paul Andrews and the boys will go around to the right side of the car. Now, just notice that Paul stuck the uh, bridge in the right rear or left rear of the car to put a little bit of wedge down on that left side. Quickie's waiting for the jack to fall and that gas, that little bit of gas to get in. Quickie's down and away. And if he's going to win this one, that pit stop may make the difference. Kawicki with a 17-second stop under green, heads back out. Will the caution fly again right away? That's got to be a big question in everybody's mind. We've got so many of them today, Phil. So you may look at that and say, that wasn't a very good pit stop, 17 seconds. But see, since it's so close to the end of the race, there's less than a full pit stop to go. We're right at a full pit stop. They had to wait for all the gas to get in the car, and that took a much more time than to change the tires. So you won't see the 10 or 11-second pit stops for any of the cars coming in uh, right away. And Kyle Petty right now is in the pits. Betty flashes down pit road to get what he hopes will be the final service of the race. We'll eavesdrop on the radio in case there's crosstalk. At least I'm sure we'll hear the report to go. This is inside Kyle's car. They're going with two tires, right side tires. Uh, overheard Gary Nelson. Hey, second hand, they need to tell when they're done. Don't go yet, Kyle. I'm going to wait until Richard nods his head. Go, go, go. You heard him cautioning him to wait for the gas, exactly what you talked about, Phil. The gas takes longer than the tires when you go to two cans, and now they've got to have all of both cans of fuel to get to the finish line. And then go, go, go. That's the command to get off that jack and get out of the pits. So this is all under green flag. No caution here. We thought there might be for Dale Jarrett's blown tire. There was not. As he cut, the, cut a tire, and now we'll follow the... Other two contending cars on the pit road. When Colwicky stopped, they became the leaders. Now they're on pit road together. Sachs used up a lot of racetrack. Slowed Bodine. Let's go to Dick Bergren. Uh, here, here's Greg Sachs. This crew has less practice than anybody else on pit road. They've only done a little bit of practice in the garage in a couple of races, and that's about all they've done. This has to be the best pit stop of their day. This should be the end of it. Greg Sachs still in the pit. He says, come on, let's go, let's go. He wants to go. The fuel's not all in it. There, just how badly Bodine's crew beat Sachs' crew on pit road. As they came down pit road, Sachs wisely, I guess, used all of the road. He had to slow down earlier than Bodine, but he stayed out in the middle of pit road, and that forced Bodine to slow down as well. So Jeff actually had to accelerate on down to the end of the road, but then Sachs' crew took longer with the stop, and Bodine was able to put a healthy chunk of uh, racetrack between himself and Sachs. Here is the leader. Harry Gant has not yet stopped. And now the yellow will fly. Yellow flag will fly. Harry Gant, the leader of the race, as they charge back down. Trouble point is on the backstretch as the yellow flag flies for a record 11th time here today at Pocono. Gant will make his stop under yellow. The rest of the leaders have all stopped at this point and should have what they need to go the distance. So this will be an interesting situation. Whoa, wait a minute. It is Alan Kowicki who has crashed off the tunnel turn. Kowicki, a frustrating afternoon, has smacked the wall between turn two and turn three after what was perhaps his strongest run of the 1990 season. Kowicki's car is reduced to junk, and let's take a look at it from the inside of Kyle Petty's car. He was right behind him. 
heading toward the tunnel turn right here. Phil, if you see any indication of what caused this, chime right in. Lone tire. Lone tire. You saw the you saw the rubber. Left rear, it looked like. Boy, boy, what a what a break for Kyle and he. Uh, how he missed him, I don't have any idea. Like running through shrapnel, you can bet that stuff was smacking that windshield, making an awful lot of noise, and Petty's thinking, whoa, am I going with him? Let's listen to Kyle's radio. Be ready to beat the front of the right front fender forward or, or bend it around. Uh, he's coming in. That sounds like. Okay, did he run the sign there? Yeah, he got what? hit. I think we ran the fifth sign anyway. Let's let's go ahead and uh, fix this thing, you guys. Get some hammers on it. Kyle Petty's crew. Oh, yeah. Get some hammers, guys. We're under yellow. They'll have time to work on it. Hang on a minute. Crew cam. It's okay up there. Camera on Gary Nelson, the crew chief. Directly okay, put a look on it. Did I finish too soon? Yeah, we finished too soon. My fault, man, my fault. That's okay, we gotta, we gotta go. Hurry up, you guys. Here goes the pace car. Let's go. Got to get out ahead of the pace car to stay on the lead lap. They will probably stop again. Now we know we got to start dead last. My fault, man. Okay, get us some speed and see if anything smokes. Petty says it was my fault. It was my fault. He, his fault pitting too soon. That, that's what that's what Kyle's fault was. Not he could he had nothing to do. Uh, no way he could have missed Kowicki when it spun, spin on the front of him. He just came into pits really a lap too soon. So what what that means is he came into pits before the rate the pit road was open. So he will probably have to start no matter how many more pit stops he makes or where he is. He will probably have to start this race from the very tail end of the lead lap by rule. By rule. By he, he violated a rule because the pits weren't open yet at the time he came in. Let's go to the 11 pit, Pat Patterson. Well, Jeff Bodine just brought his machine in one more time. Now he had just come in under green, got two right side tires. Junior Johnson has replenished the number 11, the car that won this race a year ago with a different driver, Terry Labonte at the keyboard. Here is the new leader of the Miller Genuine Draft, 500 at Pocono, Pennsylvania. It took 163 laps for him to find his way to the front. This is why they call him a tough guy, Dale Earnhardt. Not a typical Dale Earnhardt race. You would expect to see him making the parry and thrust and charge to the front on about lap two, not lap 170. Took a while today because he's not a healthy cat. Nonetheless, he is the man to beat right now. So he really, he just shows what, what true grit and determination he has. But I tell you, you know, when Alan Kowicki crashed over there, we didn't, Harry Gant was the leader. We didn't really give him a call. We hadn't talked about Harry much all day, but he's been steady, been been running well. And, uh, he, you know, yes, he, he got the lead because the other cars pitted, but he was right up in fourth and fifth position, right in the hunt, really right in that lead pack when uh, when they did start pitting. So Harry Gant could very well be a strong car before the race is over. Keith Cracked of Levittown, Pennsylvania, wants to know when the next race will be at Pocono. The answer is July the 22nd, July 22nd. These two races run closer together than any other uh, two runs on any one racetrack. They go to most of the Winston Cup tracks twice. Dale Earnhardt gets a huge cheer from the crowd as he comes by the start-finish line. They know he's ill. They know he's not feeling well today, and they're pleased and proud to see that he's come to the front. A question from Jed Flint, watching on King Video in Stillwater, Minnesota, wondering about the breakdown of the prize money, the percentage deals, how much goes to the driver, how much goes to the owner. Might be an interesting opportunity to compare series, too, with uh, Winston Cup driver Phil Parsons and Trans Am driver Lynn St. James. Phil, any rule of thumb in this series is how the split works? Not not really a rule of thumb. Uh, normally, it's the driver gets, uh, obviously, a percentage of the winnings. Uh, that could be as much as 50 and probably as little as, as 35 or 40. Now, they also have some, some plans, which is why you look in a newspaper when you see the rundown. The guy that finishes ninth may make more than the guy that finishes eighth or seventh or even higher up. That's because the cars that run all the races are on car owner plans, and they pay them appearance money to, to make sure that they're going to be at each and every race. So that's, and, and a lot of times the drivers will get a percentage of that money also. Sometimes they won't. So there's really, there's probably about 20 different ways that a driver is paid uh, as far as percentage and things. Let's listen to Kyle Petty and Gary Nelson.
probably stuck with one stop here. I don't know if they'll be talking anymore or not. We'll see if the pace car pulls off. Let's talk to Kyle Petty, Dave. See what see what he has to say. Kyle Petty, Dave, is main in the television booth. Kyle, you hear us? Yeah, I hear you loud and clear, man. You got a long way to go to the front. What happened? I don't know. You know, we'd run along there about fifth or sixth, and uh, Kowicki, we all made pit stops, and Alan Blow, left rear tire, just came apart on him. By the time we got to the tunnel, and he spun up in front of me, and there wasn't no place to go. We ended up getting into him, and we had to pit an extra time, so that put us back here at the back again. How do you approach it from here, given where you are and what you've got left to work with? You just run as hard as you can? Hey, when you're this far back and there's only this many laps left, you just run as hard as you can go and get whatever you can get. You've given us a great run so far today. Good luck in what's left here. Thanks, sir. That is Kyle Petty, and he has given that in-car camera a ride here today. One to go, Kyle. One to go. He gets the command one to go, one to go. I think maybe the man we should check in with would be Rusty Wallace. Let's see if he can hear us as we get Okay, Kyle. Go. They never come and say anything to us, but just, you know, do what you got to do here. Do what you got to do is the word for Kyle Petty. I think we've got a moment here. We're going to get one more look at this replay, and then we, we may try to check in with Rusty hey, if there's time. Wallace is now second on the racetrack. Here, you heard Kyle describe it. Left rear tire blows, and there's nowhere to go. Oh, sure wasn't. It. You saw the debris. There's more debris. Kyle just, I mean, Allen just turns right in front of him. Kyle just bumps him gradually. Just uh, nicked him, really. Just nicked him. So oh. I, don't think it, I don't think it'll do any damage to Kyle's car. Hit him hard enough to damage the car a little and force the pit stop. But that's what put him to the back. Let's go to Dick Berggren. Well, here's the story of what's going on in this race, Dave Despain. Under the green flag, virtually everybody up and down pit road took two tires. Richard Childress, much to the consternation of his crew, decided they were going to take four. It was his decision that if they took four, maybe they'd get lucky. Maybe there'd be a yellow flag shortly after that. They got lucky. They got their yellow flag after that. They stayed out. That's how come the three is in the lead. Guess who else did the same thing? The guys in the 27 pit, Rusty Wallace, they're parked right next door. They saw what happened. Both teams say they got enough fuel to go all the way. They got four fresh tires. They're running one, two. Hang on. This is going to be a great finish. <laughs> How about Rusty Wallace? Now, on the last restart, he jumped the start, was brought to pit road, and had to start last. And now he is the second place race car and a tough cat. I'll bet you he doesn't jump the start this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 57. Kyle might, Kyle might jump out there. He's got nothing to lose. He's already at the back. We're going to find out real soon because here they come. They're off turn three. Those are the lap cars moving to the bottom. Dick Trickle gets down there along with Jim Sauter. Here is okay, the view ready, from inside Kyle's car. Get ready, get ready. Get ready. Green flag. Go, go. Go, go, go. That was Kyle's spotter. Similar commands were being given to Earnhardt and to Wallace as they restart this race with Earnhardt up front and his old friend and frequent rival Rusty Wallace runs his rear deck and we've got ourselves a shootout here. 29 laps remain at Pocono. It's going to be spectacular. I can't help but hope that it'll go green all the way. Look at the move by Wallace. Just drove by around it. Dale Earnhardt may have another problem. He may have another flat tire. He's backing up. I'll tell you what. There goes Trickle by along with Gant. Now he seems to stabilize right there. I remember Gant was leading the race when this thing went to yellow just a moment ago and has been consistent all day. Finally managed to claw his way up to the front. But a huge jump for the number 27 of Rusty Wallace. Here is the man who started this race on the pole. Those are the people behind Wallace as we watch him string down that short shoot and into turn number three. Wallace, definitely the man to be. That was Kyle Petty's in-car camera, because uh, we know that, uh, that Harry Gant's right behind Rusty Wallace, so that was Kyle Petty's in-car camera. Kyle has already passed a couple of people, and Earnhardt will pit. Earnhardt is on pit road. There is clearly a problem with that car. Let's go to Dick Bergren. Earnhardt's crew thinks he's got a flat tire. When it happened, they just all shook their heads. They couldn't believe it. They just watched this race potentially go down the drain. There's still time. It's only a caution flag. Caught it on the speedway while Earnhardt's in the pits, and he goes back out again after taking two. Big pile up, turn one. Randy LaJoy's number 13 is involved. Likewise, the 21 of Dale Jarrett, who smacked the wall a ton up there. A third car involved. Looks a like Jimmy Spencer. Tangle, and I think it is Mr. Excitement, as the three of them collided and jammed the concrete. That is a new barrier outside turn one and two. It was here a year ago that we saw Jeff Bodine actually knock down the old boilerplate fence that used to surround this place. 
and still does down in the slower turn three. They have replaced it with a concrete wall, and these guys hit it a ton. The tail end of the impact there shows Spencer and Jarrett both smack at the wall. Here comes LaJoy, who bounces off both cars but did not hit the wall. It was a combination shot for LaJoy, and this one will take a while to clean up. And what does that do to Dale Earnhardt's situation now, Phil? Oh, we've got one more angle of this. Let's take a look at it from the bumper cam. That's Jimmy Spencer right there. And there is Jarrett taking off behind him and taking Spencer into the wall. Looked like Dale Jarrett just had a flat right front tire because he got in the corner and the car, it just went absolutely straight. Jimmy Spencer had nowhere to go. Yeah, it looked like he saw it happening and you saw the car start sliding right to left. He was trying to, which way do I go? Which way do I go? Tough break. We would suspect that that is the third cut tire of the day if indeed that was the trigger. If it was a cut right front as it appeared on the 21 of Dale Jarrett, that would be his third cut tire of the day. But it's far more very serious. Unfortunate story. Far more serious this one. Yeah, definitely. And now uh, the, the crew's tending here to, uh, to Jimmy Spencer and we'll keep you updated on any uh, medical reports as we have them. I'll tell you, that's a real tough part of the racetrack because, you know, we yeah, talked to you go 180 hard, miles an hour, Dave, at the end of the straightaway. Now, if you can stop your car in a straight line, you know, you can get stopped pretty quick and get slowed down for the corner, make the corner and go on. But when something happens like that, well, you cannot, you cannot stop in a straight line. You're not scrubbing off the speed like you were if you are going forward. So you hit the wall a ton there. Uh, to reiterate, we broke the record for cautions with the 10th one, and now we're up to 11 today. So never has there been more yellow at Pocono than today. Here is Rusty Wallace, who leads the race and no longer has Earnhardt to contend with. Okay, rub it up here, Tom, or two. Listen to the radios. Okay, might be the transmission or something. That's Dodson, I believe, talking to Russell. You didn't run through any hole down there. It might have kicked up on the headers or anything, did you? I don't know. We'll see what happens, guys. It sounds like it's missing now. Wallace concerned that he, too, might have a problem. Let's go to Dick Berger. Dick, you got more on this? I can't, I can't tell you a whole lot, Dave Despain. There's definitely a problem down here with the 27, but they don't know precisely what it is. Uh, they may have just overfilled the car a little bit. Could be a transmission problem. Uh, Harold Elliott says he doesn't know what it is. I don't think anybody knows what it is. It's not a lot of smoke, so they're hoping, too, when the green flag drops, it goes away. Krusty keeps clutching it and then revving the motor to see if he can hear if it's missing. Yeah, we heard him say that he thought the car was missing, so sure did. <laughs> Wallace here trying to be it a little bit of an onboard. The carburetor does it, Rusty. Oh, I don't know. I just put it in second gear, wrapped it up and took off, and it seemed okay. I don't know. Well, that's what Harold Elliott says. He says it's okay. Well, we can take the diagnostic. Well, I can tell you, you went right by where that car left, that uh, might have kicked some oil up over the headers or something, because uh, right there where it's caused the wreck, where it did it. They're hoping that the oil... I think that's the voice of Barry Dotson hoping that perhaps the smell, the oil that uh, Wallace thinks he's smelling is actually oil from this wreck. As we look at the leaderboard, Wallace at the top of the heat, Gant second, Hut Strickland up to third, Jeff Bodine fourth, Darrell Waltrip fifth. Cleanup operations will be extensive. Brett Bodine is sixth, Greg Sachs seventh, Derek Cope eighth, Sterling Marlin ninth, Mike Waltrip rounding out the top ten. The crash involving Jimmy Spencer, Dale Jarrett and Randy LaJoy coming with 25 laps to go. It'll be no problem to get it back underway in the uh, laps that remain here because it takes a long time to run a caution lap. But as you can see, it's quite a cleanup project. And again, we will uh, update you with any medical reports as soon as they're available. Perhaps uh, equally uh, having an equal impact on the outcome of the race is the potential problem for Rusty Wallace that has emerged under this, the record 11th caution of the day. Here's Wallace coming by the start-finish line. The rest of the field trailing along under the caution that has been pretty commonplace here this afternoon. We've seen an awful lot of it. And we've overheard a transmission that Rusty wants his spotter to move further away from uh, 
Harry Gant's spotter. Here's where the spotters are. They're actually directly over our head. We're underneath their feet in this uh, spot towering high above Pocono Raceway. And Wallace has asked his spotter to put some distance between himself and Harry Gant because they don't want Gant's people to know what they're doing. How much eavesdropping goes on? I mean, we're eavesdropping on Rusty Wallace here today. How much do the teams eavesdrop on each other? Oh, a lot of them. Just like we have radio communication and we can talk to four drivers on one radio, every team has uh, a, a scanner that they monitor the cars. Like right now, they'll be monitoring Rusty Wallace and Harry again. All the cars running up front. Uh, they'll be mine. We just saw Dale Jarrett step into the ambulance, so that's good news for Dale. There's Jimmy Spencer getting ready to step in. So uh, the only driver that was in the record we haven't seen yet is Randy LaJoy, and he may very well already be in the ambulance. He took the uh, carom shot at the end there, the uh, double bounce off both cars, but those two drivers looked like they were eager to get into the ambulance. Once you realize that your car's too beat up to go out and race anymore, the next thing that clicks into your mind is, you know that ambulance is air-conditioned. I think maybe I'll go climb inside there and let me look me over. Plus, it's a long walk back from turn one to the pits. <laughs> We're going to take another look at the tail end of this uh, episode. Here you see it. Apparently triggered by a Jarrett cut tire, he forced Jimmy Spencer into the wall, totally inadvertently, of course. Jarrett cut the wheel, but there was no place to go. And here is LaJoy smacking in, and not really that hard a hit. I would speculate that, uh, that LaJoy, too, is okay. Uh, he didn't hit anything that hard. He hit a glancing blow off both cars. But Winston Cup cars, as we've heard repeatedly, are the safest race cars anywhere around. That's one of the reasons a lot of guys come to this series. The likes of a Kenny Schrader raced those little open wheelers for years and years and years and finally said, wait a minute, career decision. I need to go get in something that wraps me up in a cushion of steel and makes me safe. And, uh, Phil, I don't think there's any question that these are the safest race cars in the world. Oh, I really think so. And, you know, the thing is, Randy LeJoy was probably better off that he bounced off Jimmy Spencer and then Dale Jarrett instead of hitting the wall. If he'd have hit the wall in between them, he would have had a hard, lot harder lick than he would have. But, you know, the thing is, Jimmy Spencer's car will give a little bit. Dale Jarrett's car will give a little bit when he hits him. But that concrete wall is not going to give any. And one other note that uh, occurred to me in response is that uh, we were interrupted here by a yellow when you were answering Jed Flynn's question about, uh, about prize money. That is the value of souvenir sales to these drivers. There's a whole area here at this racetrack now that's reserved for souvenir t-shirts and hats and every other item for everybody else. We understand that, uh, that Dale Earnhardt actually makes more money off souvenir sales than he makes off driving the race car, which is pretty remarkable. Let's go to Pat Patterson. Well, we all know that the sport of NASCAR Winston Cup stock car racing, it can boil down to not necessarily the fastest car can win the race. Andy, you haven't been the fastest car all day, Andy Petrie off the Skull Crew, but uh, nevertheless, you're in a position where you could win the race. Yeah, we've had a lot of trouble. We've had uh, the duck work on the, the front of the radiator has been dragging. It came loose. I think we may have run off the track or something, knocked it loose, and the car ran hot. And... Uh, We've just had a lot of problems getting it fixed and getting the car cooled back down. We used a lot of those earlier cautions to get it cooled down. And now we're trying to concentrate on getting our track position back and getting, you know, being positioned to win. Well, you've got uh, another lap or so, I think, before they put them back under green. It's, as far as the handle on the car, has Harry been happy with that portion of it? Yeah, well, our car is handled real good all day. We just had so many problems. And right now, you know, we got four fresh tires with that uh, brake we got on that caution. And uh, some of these other guys don't have quite as fresh a tire, so maybe, you know, maybe we'll have an advantage. Well, an old buddy of yours is up in the booth, Phil Parsons. He wanted to ask you a question. So, Phil, what is the question? Uh, ask Andy if he if he wins the race, will he get a new pair of sunglasses instead of the pair he's got tie wrapped together there? Phil is making real serious fun of those sunglasses yours. He wants to know if you win the race, are you going to get a new pair? Yeah, these broke. I've got a tie wrap holding them right there in the center. I guess they can see that. Well, uh, he's going to have his eyes glued through those glasses to see what Mr. Gant's got for the last uh, few laps here, and uh, we'll go back upstairs. You sharp eyed devil. I thought those were supposed to be that way. We confirm that all three drivers are okay after the crash at turn one. This will require some additional cleanup. They dropped an awful lot of oil and water on the racetrack up there, so it'll be a little while before we're able to finish cleanup work on this uh, turn one situation. And I guess that'll bring up the question then, Phil, of, again, the, the yellow, the uh, the pit stop strategy under the long yellow. Do you look at the Army here trying to get this uh, racetrack scrubbed up? Two questions, really. One, 
one, will you pit? And two, the first time you run off into the aftermath of this, what's going through your mind? Number one, none of the leaders are going to pit because they have enough fuel to go the rest of the way. Track position is so critical that they're, they are not going to give that up. Now, the cars on the tail end right now, the cars that are still in the lead lap, but on the tail end now, they have nothing to lose. They may come in and get four fresh tires. So they have about you know, 10, 15 laps less on their tires than the leaders because they have nothing to lose. But they would rather be up in a situation that the leaders are in and stay out on the old tires because track position is so critical. Now that army moved down to the infield to let the field stream through. You see it from Rusty Wallace's car. His car is still very suspect here. And they've been running under yellow long enough now and have had a chance to talk back and forth to one another that perhaps we wouldn't be interrupting if we jumped in on the racer radio. Rusty Wallace, if you can hear us, have you been able to, any, to uh, further diagnose the potential problem with your car? What's wrong out there? I didn't know I had a problem. Well, we've been eavesdropping on you, Rusty. This is Dave Despain. We heard you talking with your crew about possibility it might be missing and possibility that it might be leaking oil. Anything to either one of those? Well, I don't know, Dave. Uh, I ran past the car down there, and uh, one of went past that car, I see a bunch of smoke come up. So we might have run over something and caused it to smoke. I don't know, but right now it seems fine. There's no problem. That's good news. You ready for the sprint here? It's going to be a whale of a race. <laughs> see how strong hair he is. He looks pretty strong. All right, buddy, go get him. I think Rusty doesn't uh, want to acknowledge anything might be wrong with that car. We mentioned the eavesdropping that's been going on. Rusty would just as soon have had us believe that there was absolutely nothing wrong, and that communication was not so much for us as for Harry Gant's crew. Uh, they don't want to let on that they've got any problem. They may, in fact, not have a problem. I don't think they know for sure. I really don't. At this point, I don't think they think they have a problem anymore. Uh, they, Rusty did think so originally, and like he said, uh, he, he ran by a car and, and some smoke came up, so he thought it might have been smoking, but uh, apparently not, and he said he put it in second gear, Nail the throttle and the thing felt all right, so apparently it's not missing either. So I think he'll be in good shape. Story of the day, record number of cautions, most of them induced by cut tires. An argument here for ripple strips at the inside of turn one and turn three. In the opinion of our expert, Phil Parsons, I don't think anybody would disagree with that because uh, the debris thrown up on the racetrack has certainly taken its toll here today. Rusty Wallace has emerged as the front runner. Kyle Petty is back at the tail end of the field after giving us a great show here today. Lynn St. James. I just have a tidbit of information I'd like to share with everybody out there because I did attend the, um, the driver's meeting, as I mentioned. The pace car is now going 65 miles an hour around the racetrack, so you can see how slow it all looks, but that's the, uh, the pace that they said they'll, they'll be taking the car around the racetrack. That's why these laps take so long under yellow, but that is to our advantage. That means we'll have that many more green flag laps when we do come back. And uh, that will be, I would think, at least one more lap. Uh, we'll double check and see if the lights have gone out on the pace car. But there are still a lot of safety people up there. I think this is going to be a little while. Let's check in with Kyle Petty on the Racer Radio. Kyle, Dave, the Spain calling. You made a couple of pretty good moves. You put some people behind you there. Will you pit and try to freshen up that car for the dash to the finish, or will you stay out there? No, we're pretty much going to stay out here. There's Everybody in front of us is in the lead lap, and there's three or four behind us that are in the lead lap. Can't afford to lose much track position right now. Give it a run for its money out there, friend, and uh, happy Father's Day to you. That is Kyle Thanks, Petty. Sir. Had a tough day today. I mean, it was a big disappointment for him, and he conceded that he made the mistake that cost him there. He got uh, into the back of Colwicky when Colwicky spun and crashed and brought out the previous caution, not this one, but the one before. But uh, for Kyle, I guess the big problem was that he violated the closed pit rule and that came to the back. Oh, in reality, I guess the duration of that pit stop, wouldn't he have ended up in about the same position, Phil, or could they really have uh, made any difference in their situation if he had stayed out for a while? I'm not sure that, uh, I, I think he might have been a little bit, he probably would have been better off if he would have stayed out, but uh, the fact that he did pit too early, they probably didn't have enough time to get all the work done, so he had to come in, but if he would have waited and came in with the rest of the field, then he would have had a chance at beating people out of the pits and, and may have been a lot farther up, but i tell you, Kyle thought he just a few cars behind him were in the lead lap. There's actually eight cars behind him in the lead lap. There's 23 cars right now in the lead lap, and Kyle's 15, so he's ahead of eight cars. Kyle's done a heck of a job today. When you add it all up, and uh, he's still going to have a little bit of time to operate here, he's got a comparatively fresh race car, even if it's a little bit beat up in the front. Here are some of the record crowd that have jammed Pocono International Raceway today. They sold out the grandstand yesterday. First time in stock car history here that that has happened. They packed them into the infield today. And now this uh, huge crowd, this record crowd, will see a spectacular finish as we have one lap to go. One lap to green. 
I want to thank all of you who have called in today. We probably won't get to your questions if you call us now because we're pretty close to the end of the broadcast. We'll try to get in a couple of more before we uh, wrap up here today. But to each and every one of you who have called today, to each and every one of you who watched today, we certainly appreciate it, and we certainly hope that you've enjoyed this telecast. The best is yet to come as we get down to a finish. Question from Craig Staggs, Arlington Telecable, Arlington, Texas. Average horsepower on these cars, Phil? About, about, how much about 650, both for the Fords and the GM cars. We were speculating over dinner last night about the difference in horsepower on the dyno from the best car to, say, the 10th place car. We concluded, Pat Patterson and I, that probably there's much more difference in handling than there is in horsepower. I think so. That? I think between the top 10 cars, you probably wouldn't find 5 or 10 horsepower. Steve Walk and Burke's Cable, uh, watching on Burke's Cable in Reading, Pennsylvania, wants to know how a driver gets started with sponsors and how do you sign up for a race. Sounds like a guy who wants to be a race driver someday. What's your, how do you start? What do you do? Well, to, to get hooked up with a sponsor, you just, you know, as we talked earlier about how to break into racing, uh, you have to go to your local track and, and do a good job and then get, get somewhere. And, and the thing is, it takes so much money to do that, but you have to get somewhere where a sponsor can see you and say, hey, you have the right image for our product. You know, we're going to sponsor you and we're going to go Winston Cup racing or whatever kind of racing that you may choose. And, uh, and that's how you get hooked up with them. Sometimes like, when the drivers switch around, like at the end of this year and the end of last year, uh, one driver will change from another team to the other. The sponsor will already be at the team and the driver will just change. So there's a multitude of ways to do it, but how to initially get a sponsor is really to be in the right place at the right time. I'll give you 10 seconds, Lynn. You're one of the best in the business at taking care of sponsors. What's the key? What's the most important single thing you do to take care of your sponsor? Never thought you'd ask, babe. You just got to knock on a lot of doors is what I've had to do. Just, just knock on doors, talk to people, um, get them enthused, and, and really try to get them aligned with you. 20 laps remain as we come down for a restart at Pocono. 20 of 200, a mere 10% of the race to decide it all. Does Rusty Wallace have a problem or does he not? He doesn't want Harry Gant to know if he has a problem. Gant is right behind him, ready for a shootout. Wallace slowed down and then jumped on the gas and gets a nice restart as he rockets 10, 15 car lengths in front of Harry Gant coming down the front straightaway. Now they all dart out of line, but Wallace played that like a master big move way down to the inside that i believe is the number 18 of the man greg Sachs, who has run so much at the front of the field here today the unobstructed view of rusty wallace and a problem for number eight bobby hillen he will pull to a stop just past the exit of the pits and i'm not sure whether he's out of harm's way or not that'll be an official's call that may very well be a yellow flag if Bill? he stays there it'll definitely be a uh, be a caution flag because he is he's too close to the racing surface but uh yeah they're getting as a matter of fact they're throwing the yellow flag right now so they're going to race to the flag they'll bring it right back out Kyle Petty's crew radioing to him. There is a car stalled on the front stretch, letting him know where the problem is. The race in a row, I'll bet you. He, uh, he gave away his uh, gave away his game plan here, and then lo and behold, another yellow. So Harry will be all ready for that one. We'll see if Harry can retaliate. This should be quick, although no help has arrived at uh, at Hillen as yet. So uh, the field, yeah, here comes the wrecker on its way up the front straightaway. The field, meanwhile, should be uh, just approaching the tunnel turn at a much more comfortable speed than they've made around that corner for most of the laps here today. There is the pace car, and once again. A momentary pause here. I would think that uh, you start getting a little antsy somewhere about now. You want to get this thing going again, make the run down to the finish here. Let's let's get it on, right? That was one of the things I think that when Rusty was hearing things, you know, sometimes you start to hear things, feel things when you're towards the end of the race and you don't you don't want to think anything's wrong with the car, but you know, you get a little nervous, you get a little edgy when you got time. And if you were running flat out now, if you're running under green, you don't hear or think anything. You're just going with it. But when you're under under yellow, you start thinking about things. <laughs> They've had a lot of time to think about it today. 13 yellows breaking the record, shattering the record of nine. Let's go to Pat Patterson. I just want to make a comment, Dave, and that is that uh, a lot of times when it gets down to the, to the very end of a race like this and you see some last-minute caution flags, a lot of people say, well, boy, well, why did that have to happen, you know? But I want to comment that the NASCAR officials did everything he could. All of them down on this end of the pit road were trying to wave at Hill and hope that, hoping that he would look in his rearview mirror 
to, to pull the car out of harm's way so they wouldn't have to stop the race, but uh, it didn't work out that way, and uh, it's a tough way for the day to end for Bobby Hillen, who uh, certainly uh, would have liked to have finished this one. I noticed that the lights on the pace car are out, which means there's going to be about another half a circuit around the speedway to get the green flag, so I'll let you have it back. I presume the fact that he's going up on the hook indicates that Hillen couldn't do much of anything with that car. He was obviously uh, stopped and stalled, and now he's... Uh, simply supervising the recovery operation here as they pull the number eight back to the uh, garage area and out of the way. That's too bad. Hillen had uh, run top three in this race for a while at, at mid-race and is coming off his best finish of the year, fifth last weekend at Sears Point. The long-awaited uh, final restart perhaps coming up next here as they are less than a lap away. Let's go to Dick Bergren. With Barry Dotson, these caution flags are helping you guys. Excuse me, Dick. Okay, he's going to talk to Rusty Wallace now. They are getting ready for the green. We'll see if we can get to talk to him. The cautions are helping you, Barry. So far they are. You know, I'd like to see about uh, 15 more of them. They got another shot at us. That's the bottom line. And uh, we just need to go make a green run here, no problems, and try to pull the thing off. Harry Gant's awful strong, and so is Bodine. What's your guess on the car? Is it okay? Seems to be fine. They were speculating that possibly it was just some oil that they had run through because there was another car that was also smoking, same symptoms. Well, I'm going to tell you, these guys have their fingers crossed that everything's okay in this race car. We're going to know pretty quickly. They are afraid, I think, of Harry Gann and of Jeff Bodine, eh, Phil? I think so. Uh, they know Jeff Bodine's been really, the, like, as you've mentioned a number of times, the most consistent car all day. Right now he's back in fourth position. So what Rusty wants to do is get an incredibly good start, put enough distance between himself and if Harry can't make a, can't stand an assault, then, then maybe Bodine won't have enough time to get by both Harry Gant and uh, Hutch Turkland to, to, and, and be able to chase down Rusty Wallace. Well, we're all going to get we're we're all going to get all of the answers very quickly here, assuming we can stay green this time. Rusty Wallace will lead him down for the restart with Harry Gant right on his heels. Hutch Strickland had a great run today. He's got that thing up in third spot. I think there's a lot of question whether he can keep Jeff Bodine behind him. Hutt's car has not been that strong all day, but it, what counts is the last run to the checkered flag. Bodine is fourth. Darrell Waltrip is fifth. And those five guys will be charging down to the green flag right now. And again, Wallace got a great break. He virtually repeated the move that he made on Harry Gant earlier. That is exactly what Wallace needed at this juncture. Keep in mind that a lot of those cars in the middle of that pack are lap cars, and that will help Wallace as well because as they close up, the more buffer he can put between himself and the second-place machine of Harry Gant, the better off he's going to be. One of those cars is Dick Trickle in the 66, who started outside row one. Hutch Strickland was, Harry got such a bad start, Hutch Strickland was able to pass him down to the end of the straight away, so now Hutch Strickland is running in second position. How about that? Happy Father's Day, Bobby Allison, car owner on that car. Wallace takes her deep into the tunnel turn and pulls Dick Trickle through there. Trickle the lap car. Wallace looking in his mirror. Where are they? I know they're coming. He's got to be real pleased with the way that restart worked out. And now he hunkers down and heads for the finish line here as the laps begin to wind down at Pocono. Wallace looking for his third win in four starts. And what an incredible recovery in the Winston Cup championship battle. He wants that second title in the worst way. Hot Strickland is now the second place man as he pulls Harry Gant along. We're getting down to showtime. We talked about how good... Uh, Jeff Bodine was. Well, his brother Brett Bodine has passed him, and now Brett Bodine is up to fourth position with Jeff back to fifth. Position swapping back there behind Wallace. All of those guys trying to quickly jockey themselves into position to become contenders. Hutch Strickland's caught on the outside. He, uh, Harry Gant got by him. Brett Bodine got by him. Now Jeff Bodine's trying to get by him. He tried to make a move to get by Trickle and must not have, uh, must not have been able to make it. It really cost him a lot of time. Here goes Derek Cope, right right through the grass, it looked like, try to get by Hutt Strickland. i got to get myself a piece of the action. I'll stick the nose down in the grass, says Cope. It costs him spots. Behind him comes the gang war. Everybody wants a piece of the action with 15 laps to go. 15 more circuits of Pocono International Raceway, and we'll see if Wallace can pull off his third victory in four starts and make another big hike up the Winston Cup point ladder. This is classic Rusty Wallace on his restarts. I've watched him for so long, and every time he always just times those restarts so well. I mean, just classic. 
He knows when he needs it, too, because uh, earlier we saw a not-so-classic restart, a penalty that sent him all the way to the back when he, he didn't actually jump the restart. He violated the rule by cutting to the inside and passing on the left before they got to the starting line. And so Wallace, by virtue, Wallace got the opportunity to make this restart at the head of the field by passing everybody out there, which is a remarkably strong performance. The question now is whether he can make it stick for what is now 14 and a half laps of competition still remaining. Let's run them down. Here's the prize money for today. Over a half million dollars on the line at Pocono. This is big, big business. Harry, Harry Gant was able to get by the lap car of Dick Trickle. So now there's nobody in between him and Rusty Wallace. So uh, Harry desperately needs to get by Dick Trickle. Now we'll see if, if Harry has the strength to run Rusty down. Reminiscent, if I recall correctly, of a year ago when it was Terry Labonte up on the point and Gant playing the spoilers role. The third place car, the number 26 of Brett Bodine, Strickland falls to fourth. Fifth is the number 11 of Jeff Bodine. That's the man that we expected might emerge here as a contender, has not yet been able to do that. Sixth is Cope. Seventh is Waltrip. Eighth is, uh, Ch uh, check that, eighth is Greg Sack. Ninth is Sterling Marlin. Tenth, Davey Allison. Eleventh is the 15 car of Morgan Shepard. And twelfth is the number six of Mark Martin. So there are two of your point contenders in 11th and 12th spots. And here is a three-car battle as Sachs moves to the inside of Morgan Shepard. Ooh, and into the grass again goes Cope. And that time, he almost looped the car. Martin saw it coming dark to the outside and passed Morgan Shepard. Tremendous shuffle of positions here. And this is back at the tail end of the top ten as they do battle for those Winston Cup points that are all important, particularly to Martin, number six, and Shepard, number 15. Dave, as of two laps ago, Derek Cope was running... Uh, six. Now he's all the way back to about 12th position. He made a move to try to get by some cars, and it didn't work, and he really has cost him. He's, he really has dropped a bunch of spots. He's diving down on that tunnel turn and actually getting inside the ripple strip and getting into the dirt, trying desperately to find a good line through there, and it's backed him up uh, twice in a row. I would think he'll not try that again. Shepard starting to get away a little bit, and uh, Martin and Cope fall into a side-by-side -side battle. Now here they come down into that same area of the racetrack, and Gant is reeling in Rusty Wallace. Wallace's worst fears are coming true, and that is that Harry Gant might have a car capable of running him down from behind and winning this race. They'll complete 188 this time by. 12 laps remain. Plenty of time, I would think, for Harry Gant. I think so. Uh, now, you know, catching Rusty is one thing. Passing him is another. Uh, Jeff O'Dine was eight. Uh, there goes the pass for lead. Harry on the inside. He's got the position on the low side of the racetrack. Let's see if Wallace can retaliate. No, I don't think so. He'll tuck right in behind Gant. And suddenly, Harry Gant, number 33, emerges as the front runner. And through the blurry windshield of Rusty Wallace, leader on the restart, you now see the tail end of that number 33 car. Gant, strong run here today slowly chipping his way toward the front of this field, has finally found the front and wants very much to stick right there for the 11 laps that remain, hold off Rusty Wallace and claim his first victory of the year, but I don't think this is a two-man story, is it? Jeff O'Dine came from a long way back. He was able to get by his brother, Brett, and by Dick Trickle, and now he's really caught this duo, so uh, Jeff O'Dine again is strong as he has been all day. We had expected this. I had expected this immediately after the restart. I thought Bodine would come after him. Crowd acknowledging Gant. They like seeing Harry out front. Ever popular Harry Gant. He has certainly been a crowd favorite, a fan favorite for many, many years. Started this race in 16th place today. Has taken his time getting to the front. Wallace, the victim of the past. Now Bodine, the challenger. Bodine in the car. Who won the race a year ago. The Junior Johnson Thunderbird with Terry Labonte at the controls. Victorious here a year ago today. He'll try to make it two in a row as we watch from Rusty Wallace's viewpoint the fleeing Harry Gant. I don't think there's a retaliatory move coming there. Perhaps that would be premature speculation on my part, but I think with ten and a half to go that Gant has the superior car. The ease with which he passed Rusty Wallace makes it seem unlikely that Wallace can come right back with retaliation. The question perhaps is Bodine, who should be coming into your picture. There he is right there, the third place car maybe has something for both of the front runners. I guess a Harry Gant victory wouldn't make you feel too bad, would it? No, not at all. Harry's a good friend. Uh, has helped me a lot in my career. and I've, I've driven for Leo Jackson, who owns that car, and Andy Petrie for a, for a number of years, and uh, I'd be tickled definitely to win this race. Well, Andy could buy some new sunglasses and 
Perry could go another step toward getting rid of that runner-up reputation that uh, that he's had for so many years. They're inside of 10 laps to go. We're coming down to the shootout. Question is Bodine. Can he come up there, mix it up with Rusty, climb another notch perhaps from that fifth in the point standings that uh, he occupied coming into this race? And what of Harry Gant? Will he be able to hang on for now a little more than nine laps and win his second race here at Pocono. He was last victorious on this racetrack way back in 1984 in a Chevrolet. Here today, he's got a hold off the Pontiac of Rusty Wallace and perhaps the Ford of Harry Gant if he's going to claim win number two on this racetrack. We'll be listening for Radio Crosstalk as they go down into turn number one. Big scramble for position. Here's the inside move by Bodine, and he's got Wallace. I don't know if there's anything wrong with Wallace's car, but it is not as strong as Bodine. Back comes Wallace. Gant trying to open up the lead just a little bit. Here is a good view of just how close the competition is. Wallace coming right back under Jeff Bodine. He's not going to give away that spot easily. Now they're going into the tunnel turn. Somebody's going to have to lift, and it is Bodine. He says, I'm not going to run into this corner on the outside of Rusty Wallace. And that was just good heads-up racing. I wouldn't have made that move either. It really was, and I've been watching Rusty. The best he is is through the tunnel turn. That's his That's his best part of the racetrack right now. So Jeff Bodine needs to make a move somewhere, try to get him somewhere else. But I don't think he can do anything with Rusty in the tunnel turn. So, Lynn, we saw that he started making that move down the front straightaway. Bodine ducked to the inside at the end of the front straightaway, and it took him all the way to the tunnel turn to get halfway through the pass. Can he make that pass, do you think? <laughs> I know, you're on the spot. Don't look at me like that. Take a shot at it. I don't know. I mean, it, you lo once you lose 50 RPM on, the, on these cars, it's so hard to gain it back in the momentum. And so it's, uh, I mean, I'm not, I don't know. We're going to watch it for the next ten, nine laps, and we're going to know. But look what look what gap it gave Harry again. Just that, that really two-thirds of a lap running side by side between Rusty Wallace and Jeff Bodine. It gave Harry about a about a 20 car length lead. So that was the best thing could happen for Harry again. But what does that tell Jeff Bodine now? He knows he's got to get around Wallace or he's stuck with third. He knows that every time he makes a move at Wallace, he cuts his own chance of winning the race because it lets Gant get farther away. What does he do? He's got to get by him because he cannot he cannot beat Harry if he's if he's got a car in between him. So he's got to get by him and try to do it when he when he can just get past him, clear him, get up in line in front of him. He, he can't race him because that just lets Harry Gant drive away. Eight laps to go. I thought Bodine was going to pull off that pass. I thought he was around Wallace. Rusty made a strong retaliation. I don't think that, uh, again, to perhaps for once put the uh, once and for all put the speculation about Rusty's car to rest. I don't think there's anything wrong with that car. It's not as strong as Harry's car. It's apparently about as good as Jeff's car at this moment and this may end, end up being a battle for second place. Gant for the moment, seven laps to go comfortably in front and unless so uh, Wallace and Bodine can hook up in a draft and run him down he may be able to hang on to that all the way but again we've had an abundance of caution flags here today and I wouldn't guarantee we won't see another one in that frame there you can see all three positions it's a pretty healthy separation from first to second and now Bodine seems content to sit there all three cars are healthy obviously uh, it is, one may be running just a little better than the other but you can guarantee that all three guys are trying to get everything they can out of the car I don't think there's any laying back, but at the same time, nobody's going to risk anything. I mean, they're not running right now nose defender, and it's like they they can't risk anything. I mean, there's too much on the line, the points, everything else that, that goes into place. Nobody's just going to throw it all away just to try to make a pass. Well, you could bet that uh, when they went off into the tunnel turn that Jeff Bodine and Rusty Wallace were both thinking about that million bucks that's waiting at the end of the season. This is one afternoon of 29 that will decide the championship. That was one position of 40 out here today, and the smart move was to lift. And Bodine that was lifted. one corner. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> it may cost him a spot today. There's an off the outside chance he might have been able to pull off that pass, but a greater chance, I think, that he might have got into the wall, and perhaps uh, Wallace would have gone with him, so you know, wisdom, the better part of valor right there. And Gant and meanwhile, Harry Gant just keeps cruising. I mean, he just, yeah, exactly. And he with no top five finishes this year, it's a great opportunity for him to, uh, to finally get things together for this team. Five laps to go as we head down for the checkered flag. The battle will be for second, it appears. There's no challenge being mounted to Harry Gant here. And so handsome Harry 
may very well put that not only that first top five finish of the year, but his first victory of the 1990 campaign up there on the wall. Guy's been uh, racing stock cars a long, long time. Hard-working guy, carpenter by trade. Uh, I don't know, very many guys that can jump up and uh, grab the rafters in the garage and do pull-ups, you know, hanging off the rafters like he can. Uh, Phil using that upper body strength that's a great tool for a race car driver. He's just one tough cat on and off the race track. He really is, and it's hard to believe. Harry Gann is 50 years old, and, I, and I'll guarantee you, you know, we saw some video of Mark Martin lifting weights, but there are very few, if any, drivers that are in as good a shape as Harry Gann, and he's 50 years old. Pretty interesting to think back to the fact that uh, 10 years ago, this man, Harry Gant, finished fifth in this race. He's one of the guys who's been around this game a while, and uh, lo and behold, 10 years later, he looks like he's going to win this thing. Rusty Wallace, now he wasn't part of the story in 1980 when they came to Pocono. Today, he appears destined to finish no better than second, but perhaps no worse than second either, and that would be a victory of sorts, because with the momentum that he has, two wins in the last three races, a runner-up finish today, knowing that he's coming to a couple of racetracks he doesn't particularly like, Daytona and Talladega, they'll be real happy with this outcome today. They're thinking championship, they're thinking point. Here is Gant heading down through the short chute toward turn three, should have four to go this time by, Gant just slowly counting them down. A couple other interesting notes and when we, uh, we bring up that race 10 years ago and look back to it. The guys who were in that race, also racing today, are Dale Earnhardt, Harry Gant, Terry Labonte, Kyle Petty. Been around 10 years now, hasn't he? Dave Marcus, Ricky Rudd, Jimmy Means, Darrell Waltrip, Richard Petty, and J.D. McDuffie. Only 10 drivers who started the 1980 Pocono race are back to race today. Among those not... Uh, currently in the field. Big names from the past are Neil Bonnet, Buddy Baker, Cale Yarborough, the late Tim Richmond, Benny Parsons, Lake Speed, and Bobby Allison. Race for fifth out there is still pretty good, Phil. It really is. That's really the only race right now on the racetrack. Uh, Hutch Strickland was running fifth. Dave Allison got by him. You got uh, Greg Sachs right behind them running seventh. That's the only race on the racetrack. Dave Allison appears to be real strong. He chased Hutch Strickland down and was able to pass him, so uh, he seems to be opening up a little daylight. Now we'll see if Greg Sachs can do the same thing. Sachs is probably disappointed to be uh, where he is. Seventh position with a car that early in the race was very strong. It was fastest in the final practice yesterday. I think that team is still looking for consistency. They know they've got fast cars. They don't have yet fast pit stops. And until they run a few more races, I don't think they'll find the consistency that will make them a winner. That's very true. When pit stops do come into play, like here, track position is so critical, then they're going to be a little bit weak in that area. But they'll get it together. They've got a good bunch of guys. They'll get it together. It's a great team or potentially a great team. And we've got just two laps to go for Harry Gantt he flashes past the start-finish line. Wheels that Oldsmobile off into turn one, thinking about time I won one of these things. Gant inside of two laps to go as he hurdles down the long pond straight away at Pocono. This will be a popular victory here today. Harry got a big cheer. Let's don't jinx him yet, Dave. He's still got a lap and a half to go. Don't jinx him yet. It's That's not a over. Good point. Let's don't talk about the no-hitter until the last pitch is hurled. Here is Rusty Wallace. He is second. He stood the gap. He withstood the pressure from Bodine. Jeff threw his best shot at him, and Rusty threw it right back and said, no, thank you, friend. I'm going to hang on to this spot. And Rusty is in second spot as they turn for the white flag, which awaits at the end of a long and grueling afternoon here, three and a half hours after things get started. The checkered flag will fall a long day. Four and a half hours. My, my apologies for that. The long caution as Andy Petrie with the broken sunglasses looks on, obviously anxious. This is a helpless time for the crew chief. What can he do? He, he's done all he can do. All he can do is just sit back there and watch. And the problem is, like right now, he cannot see Harry Gant anymore. So he'll be looking towards turn three. And when he sees that green and white car, that skull car come off turn three, then he'll be a happy man. And he'll probably get a new pair of sunglasses. <laughs> white flag for Harry Gant and probably the longest lap limb that he'll run all day. Yeah, for sure, because he's not had the best season. He's, you know, he's got that reputation, I think, for being a bridesmaid all the time, and not the bride, and he certainly got it here. And that sigh of relief that the pits are going to have when they see that green and white car, as Phil mentioned, coming off of turn three. Well, it won't be long. He's hustling for home. Harry Gant in the Oldsmobile, having it all his way in the late laps here today. If you're going to get good, get good for the last 15 laps, and that's exactly what Gant did. Bided his time early, came to life when he needed to. Fans on their feet. Harry Gant has won the Miller Genuine Draft 500 at Pocono. Rusty Wallace will finish second. Jeff Bodine is third. Brett Bodine is 
fourth, Davey Allison fifth, Hutt Strickland sixth, finishing seventh will be the number 18 of Greg Saxon. We've got a last lap crash. Number 66, Dick Trickle, has apparently crashed while turning four the checkered flag. It appears to be turn three, so he did not get to the checker. Trickle, who started on the outside pole, has had a terrible afternoon. The checker and yellow will fall together, and Harry Gant will come back around to take the wave of congratulations from Rusty Wallace, a happy man, a well-deserved victory, and I guess the best race you can run at Pocono. you got to take your time. We're going to go to Pat Patterson in the Harry Gant pits. Well, well, needless to say, it is jubilation in the Harry Gant pit. And Andy Petrie, a great afternoon. I guess if Nolan Ryland can throw a throw a no-hitter, you guys sure had it going this afternoon. Yeah, it looked like Harry threw a few strikes today, too, didn't he? He did. He did throw a few strikes. You know, it's, it's frustrating to come out and not get the wins, and you haven't had them in a long while. It's been a long time in coming. Yeah. And for a bunch of guys that really work hard to make it happen. Yeah, we have a lot of guys back at the shop that don't get to come to races. You know, I'd like to say to them, it's, uh, you know, Mark and Dean and Joe and Phil and all the guys in the motor shop, you know, Jerry and Jimmy and Kent and George and Sean. Yeah, I can't just keep going on and on. It's all these guys did a great job. Well, it, yeah, I'm really proud of I, I noticed that you've gotten rid of those old, old sunglasses, so I guess Bill Parsons is right. You go get a new pair, right? <laughs> I hope so. Maybe I can afford something there. Have fun at Victory Lane. That's Andy Petrie, the crew chief on the winning car today, and we're going back upstairs to Davis Bank. All right. Party about to get underway for the Gantt crowd as they roll her into Victory Lane. Harry notches his 11th career Winston Cup victory, and... Uh, Lo and behold, he has finally uh, managed to leave behind that uh, that runner-up jinx. So we're going to get uh, one more look at what happened on the uh, on the last lap here as Gant prepares to climb out. Winner at Pocono, getting all the uh, memorabilia into position here, getting everything staged. Look at the grin on Rusty Wallace's face. This is on the last lap now. They've actually That's taken cool the checkered flag. flag. They've taken the checkered flag. It is their last lap of the day, if you will. The race is over. He looks over at Harry, and he gives him a big thumbs up. And that is the kind of sportsmanship that I think marks this series. You race your brains out against the guy, and then when it's all over, you look over and say congratulations. Oh, that's very, that's very true. You know, the thing is, we're, we're together for, for 30, 30, over 30 weeks a year, so it's, you know, a lot of it's like family. I mean, Rusty, if he could have beat him, he would have. But, but if he didn't, and, he, you know, he had a smile on his face and gave Harry the thumbs up, you know, that's what makes this whole sport special. Special. That tight jaw look that he had just a few laps before under that yellow and how that how it changed. And like you say, it's like you've given it all you've had. If somebody was better that day, at that when it, when it counted at the end, you've got to deal with it. And I think you know you learn as a human being what you can do and to do your best. And when you do that, man, there's you can't look back. Let's go to Dick Bergeron with a man who was best today. Dick, let's really go with Harry Gant. Let's ask you, did that car get stronger at the tail end, or were you just hanging on and saving it? Well, we were, uh, you know, we were not all that quick, but we were consistent, and we were consistent in, in our practice, so we were consistent in the race. And uh, the last big run before the cautions came out there, you know, about a, you know, 100 laps to go, I could see that my car would just keep on picking off cars and gaining up, and we had a lot of problems over the car was running real hot, the transmission seized up in high gear, and, you know, I had a lot of problems, but the school band Oldsmobile and the crew just done a a super job all day, and uh, we, we got up front. That made a difference. Track position, man, everything. How'd you get up front, Harry? What was the strategy of the pits? Well, we, uh, you know, we we really was leading the race. We took the lead, stayed out a few laps longer, then come in the pits, and uh, we got in first and got out first. And, uh, of course, I didn't beat Rusty. Rusty didn't pit the last time, so I just made one car to run again, and that made it a whole lot easier other than a couple lap cars. Well, you sure had a, had a mirror full of Jeff Bodine and Rusty Wallace at about lap 190, though. Yeah, I saw him, uh, you know, racing back there, but uh, I could have run a lot harder. I just really wanted to stay ahead and be smooth because I knew I could beat him because I had beat him earlier. If we run 20 straight laps, I can beat him. And uh, I'd like to say hello to this for a good present uh, Father's Day and uh, uh, dedicate this to uh, my father. Harry Gant had lost his father just a few weeks ago, winning this afternoon at the Pocono International Raceway. Strong run for Harry Gant. That one's for you, Dad, and a good one it was as Harry Gant wins it at Pocono and wins it comfortably. You heard him say he thought he could have run harder today. How did it turn out? Let's sum it up for you. Gant wins it. 
over Rusty Wallace, who continues his assault on the Winston Cup ladder, headed for the top. Jeff Bodine will improve on his point total with a third-place run today. He came in ranked fifth. He led his brother across the stripe as Brett continues to enjoy a good season, having won his first Winston Cup race earlier this year. Davey Allison was fifth today, and no doubt dedicating his top five run to his dad as well. Hot Strickland sixth. Greg Sachs, kind of an up-and-down day. Looked like he might have the strongest car out there for a while. Finished seventh. Darrell Waltrip persevered from early problems to come home eighth. Sterling Marlin ninth. Kyle Petty. Good run. Remember, he was all the way at the back after his uh, near crash over there with Kyle Pet or with uh, with uh, number seven Alan Kowicki, and he ended up in tenth spot here this afternoon. So it was a comeback for Kyle. Dick Trickle is okay after a last lap spin in turn number three. The fans. Ah, they're still enjoying the sunshine here and listening to the interviews and in no hurry to uh, try to get out of the infield and wrap up their day. The winner, Harry Gant, led 15 of 200 laps, the last 15. Average speed only 120 miles an hour in a race that saw a record number of caution flags here today. 13 for 44 laps. The old record was 9. 16 leaders and 26 lead changes. That kept 22 cars on the lead lap, 29 finishers here today, 11 retirees in a race that did not have a remarkable amount of uh, attrition. Let's go to Rusty Wallace now. Pat Patterson is with the runner-up. Well, first of all, I want to first of all I want to thank you for letting us talk to you all day long on the on the radio. Unfortunately, one shot uh, less than you'd like to have been today, but nevertheless, a good run for you guys. It was a great run for us, and uh, I'd like to congratulate Harry Gant. He did a wonderful job, and boy, if anybody needs to win a race, it was Harry, and I'm I'm proud for him. If I couldn't win, the Middle Daniel Draft Car run good today. I had a I made one gigantic mistake. I couldn't believe I made, uh, and uh, I got lucky today, really, because uh, that race could have went green. I could have finished 29th and 30th, and uh, I just made a bad move. I really messed up. Well, Lynn St. James and, and Phil Parsons both were making very positive comments about just how well you could time those restarts. And I know that that is a team effort with Barry, with the spotter, with everybody, but you really did. You really were quick when you had the restarts. Well, I was just thinking so much about restarts, getting going, because I didn't want anybody to hold me up. This long time straight away is so long, you got to make a move when you can, and I just absolutely forgot the rule. I have been so accustomed to doing it the other way that uh, what happened, I got thinking out there, and I talked myself into that that was okay. And uh, and I was real proud of myself when I took off because I, I waited until the green flag fell and I watched it. And heck, I was almost leading the race going to turn one. I said, boy, I really got him there. And when Barry hit the radio, I went, oh, man. Come in, stop, and go. And I was hot, too, until I realized what happened. Rusty, this team appears to have really taken a charge pill over the last four or five weeks. And I know that makes you proud, and I know it makes all these guys that are defending this championship proud. They're, they're not doing, taking any charge pills. They're just doing what they do normal, and that's, that's working hard and, and doing a good job and doing their job, and I'm doing my job, and we gel together real well doing that. Good run for you this afternoon. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That is Rusty Wallace, obviously not uh, too unhappy with the runner-up finish here today. And, uh, again, it's a long, long way to the end of the season, and they're thinking championship. This was not the only race today up at uh, Detroit. The IndyCar race, Michael Andretti wins in the streets of Motor City over Bobby Rahal, Eddie Cheever. Rick Mears was fourth. Indy 500 winner, Ari Leyendyke, came home fifth. That in the Detroit Grand Prix for the Cart Indy cars, which no longer race here at Pocono. But, indeed, the stock cars put on a great show here this afternoon. And Harry Gant emerged from that show victorious with uh, his first victory of the 1990 campaign. An impressive uh, victory it was, too. Getting better all day and being there when they had to be, which is right at the end of the race. I thought that interesting that uh, the Winston Cup champion uh, would make the kind of mistake that Wallace did on that restart. That's not so, the sort of thing you expect of a champion, but what you do expect of a champion, indeed a championship team, is the kind of perseverance that they showed in coming back from that to a runner-up finish, because really the battle for this million-dollar championship at this point, Phil, just continues to tighten up. The leader, Mark Martin, had a bad day today. Morgan Shepard, who was the leader a week ago, wasn't spectacular today, so we're going to condense those top five, and uh, I think it's tougher this year, perhaps, to pick a favorite than it's been in a year or two. I think it really is. Uh, you know, uh, Jeff Bodine had a good day, so he was only 20 points behind Earnhardt. He may very well have passed Dale Earnhardt. And, uh, you know, Rusty Wallace was in third position, so he's going to move up. He's going to gain points on uh, Mark Martin. So uh, I'll tell you, this is a heck of a point battle. And, and unlike in years, but a lot of times we've had two cars, maybe three, that were, that were really in the hunt for the point championship. But right now, there are at least five cars with a, with a real good chance of winning the point championship. 
Now, Lynn, uh, based on the strength of your resume, how long do you think it'll be before Jack calls you up and says, okay, Lynn, I'm going to put you in that second car? And uh, we note that it was 10 years ago that Janet Guthrie was racing here at Pocono. I know a lot of the fans would like to see you in one of these things. Well, I'd love to do it, and, and Jack and I have talked, but Dorsey Schrader's here watching. He wants to do it. We, we mentioned Robbie Gordon will probably be in the second seat. So there's a lot of Roush drivers who, uh, who want to be there, as well as, as other drivers in the, that are experienced in Winston Cup racing. And I know Jack, in trying to expand his team, wants to really go for an experience driver for that second seat so i'll be talking to him for sure uh if it's in the cards if, if the sponsorship's there if the commitment is there jack mentioned it takes three thousand miles of driving to really on each track to be able to have the experience to be a front runner that's a lot of miles that i'd have to get caught up on doing uh on, on doing winston cup tracks uh i'd be w willing to make that commitment it's a matter whether everybody else is so. We'd sure miss you here in the broadcast booth if that worked out that way, but I know that you'd love to get a shot at doing it. I want to take a look at that top five in the point standings. Here how the, here's how they stand. It's still Martin and Shepard, your leaders, but Wallace has closed it right up. He's just ten behind Shepard, as you can see. And Jeff Bodine, in fact, drops Earnhardt another position. It was just five races ago that Earnhardt led this thing, and now he is fifth. Bodine has moved up to fourth. Those are the new numbers, and you see how tight it is in the race for that million-dollar championship, first through fifth. No change in faces there, but a couple of changes in position as Bodine and Earnhardt flip-flop, and Wallace moves closer to Morgan Shepard. Well, that's pretty much the story here. Any final observations? Phil Parsons on this 1990 running at Pocono. I'm just tickled death for Harry Gant. Uh, you know, as we mentioned, Harry lost his father a couple months ago, and uh, I know this means an awful lot to him because I'm sure he's thinking about his dad, and he was thinking about his dad the last few laps and they were very close and I'm just tickled up for Harry for him and his father and I'd just like to wish my father happy Father's Day. To all of you for watching today, for calling today, we very much appreciate it. For Dick Bergman and Pat Patterson in the pits, Lynn St. James and Phil Parsons topside, I'm Dave Despain. We hope you've enjoyed our telecast of this Miller Genuine Draft 500. So long from Pocono, Pennsylvania.